Okay. We are being caught on the microphone. No, no, she didn't take the microphone. Select the microphone. Okay. Good morning. Am I audible and visible? Is it okay? Yes, yes, okay. Okay. Hello, Hello, hello. Can I ask you something? Ah, ha, ha, ha. Ramit, uh, 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 Thank 
Ito ko ito ito. Tapos. Ito ko ito ito. Ito ko ito ito. Ito ko ito ito. Hello? So, welcome everybody. Sir, am I audible to you? All of you? Yeah, you are audible. Hello? Yes, yes. Yes. yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, yes. Rami is audible. Rami, start the program. So, welcome again. Yes. The second day of the International Conference on Quantum Information and Foundation. So, today's first session here is uh, a well known Indian scientist in, in the field of quantum information and uh, quantum computation, uh, Professor uh, Onirvan Pathok. So, I welcome Professor Pathok and hand over to you. Thank you. And it's time to start the technical proceeding of the meeting. And today's past speaker is Professor Prashant Panigrahi. So, Professor Panigrahi is well known in the domain of quantum information, but he works in various other domains. He started from particle physics, he worked on quantum optics, even in biophysics. But, and we, we collaborate since long, means maybe 20 years. And he collaborates with many of the Indian quantum information community. So today we'll listen from him about multi-party entanglement. And there may be some people who are new, them, for them I would like to tell that Professor Panigrahi is presently at ISR Kolkata. Prior to that, he was in physical research lab. And even before that, he was in Hyderabad University. So for long, he is contributing to Indian science. And over to Professor Panigrahi. Thank you. Thank you, Anirban. See, first of all, I would like to thank my friends from Kota and Kota Kolkata for this opportunity, you know, whom I consider as family. It was so nice to see yesterday, you know, um, Professor Parasar, Professor you know, Guru Prasadkar, and on Archon, and, uh, you know, all these people together in the room. It's a lot, a long, long time. Hope this situation improves and all of us meet physically. So before I uh, start, uh, you know, this uh, talk, I would like to you know, thank our chair, Professor Nirvan Patel, because honestly speaking, many of my things started because of his students. You know, Manu Gupta, who came uh, from you know, his institute through his mentoring to PRL, led me to this question of entanglement. And together we wandered and led to collaboration one after another. You know, most of the time I have found that, for example, I got into this experimental IBM quantum computation thanks to Anivan stock in ISI, ISR Kolkata. And of course, uh, you know, uh, to students who are from outside, there have been, you know, significant, uh, you know, contribution from our uh, Kolkata family. And, uh, you know, ISI has played a very key role in mentoring many of these people. So today, for example, I will be talking about, a little bit about hypergeometric state, and it originated from ISI Kolkata. So I will be, you know, uh, basically a, you know, I sort of, you know, took a joke and wondered about entanglement when I was in PRA, when this division of quantum information and quantum optics started there by Professor Giris overall. All of us were new. And, uh, you know, so we were basically wondering about all sorts of things. And you ask questions. These youngsters who have taken it forward and we learn through them. So today I'll be giving a geometric perspective uh, with the work, uh, you know, sort of started from Aishwar Pokata through a student, Vinit Vaskara to NIUS program and, and he you know, took some, some like two, three years through which we understood as is expected that very elementary concepts of vectors like vectors in parallel and perpendicular, those you know, can be used to quantify entanglement. In hindsight, you know, I mean, uh, entanglement is non-separability, right? So superposition uh, plays a very key role because that leads to non-separability. And therefore it is not very surprising that, you know, the parallel nature of vectors and the area between them would play a key role in quantifying it. But when it emerged, I learned quite a bit of mathematics and particularly this geometric algebra, the so-called waste product, to which we were led because you know it was a natural way of understanding this entanglement. And one uh, surprise for me was that you know we, when he wrote this paper, there was a mathematician from uh, you know MIT who pointed out that the so-called Lagrange identity, which we used, which essentially you will see it like the Schwarz inequality, 
uh, he pointed out that it was actually originally done by Brahmagupta, whom I have cited. So it was quite nice that you know one learns uh, as one progresses to understand entanglement. And you, many of you are there yesterday. And uh, you know uh, when Professor Werner and then Professor Gune talked about in two qubit also there are lots of things to understand. And hope this geometric perspective will uh, help in doing that. So okay, so. I'll start with what is quantum entanglement, just for the beginners, some of you might be there. Then I'll talk about quantification and this entanglement measure, uh, you know, basically give a general definition of what it should satisfy. And I'll show you that the geometric measure which we are talking about is partly rooted in experimental observation, namely the you know observation leads to collapse of state. What states? They are the state in which we are measuring, for example, 0 and 1. Or plus minus in case of uh, two qubit, and general kind of things, you know, computational basis, other kind of basis like W, G, Z, which we were introduced yesterday. So then I pointed out particularly highlight this four qubit problem where there was a bit of problem in terms of defining. Uh, can I this. make it full screen? Uh, how do I make it uh, okay? I, but I will go like this. Is that okay? Uh, okay, okay, means but okay. Then the size okay. can be increased if you go full screen. Thank you. So the, uh, you know, then I'll talk about you know this uh, starting from this four qubit problem, then it's uh, genuine n-way entanglement. Hopefully, it may find verification, experimental verification. Then I talk about recent progress, thanks to you know this COVID period, you know being in lockdown with many of these students who could not go anywhere, so we could make some progress, particularly in continuous variable states, which has been done with uh, my student and of course Vinay Bhaskara. And uh, so what is, what is entanglement? All of you know it, you know, even if, you know, it's sort of uh, quite straightforward to appreciate what is entanglement, namely non-separability of states. We have encountered, you know, this singlet, triplet, they are classic examples, you know, of, you know, the, this kind of states in spin systems. The spin and space degree of freedom being entangled, we, all of us have taken courses, for example, look at hydrogen molecule, look at helium, we have, radial part of the wave function, we have spin part of the wave function, the whole wave function has to be anti-symmetric, okay, exchange of two electrons. So if the space is symmetric, the spin part would be anti-symmetric. So there is this, uh, you know, so-called hyper-entanglement between spin and radial, you know, space degree of freedom, we have encountered it. For example, if you check, you know, Corson Wang's book, look at, for example, protons wave function, which has color degree of freedom, flavor degree of freedom, spin, isospin, it's a highly entangled state and it has physical implication in terms of you know, its magnetic moment. And you will see, particularly I'll highlight this, uh, that the concurrence, in fact, uh, is physically measurable in terms of uh, susceptibility of magnetization, which came out through the work of my colleague, Chirangi Mitra. You know, when we joined Aishwakarpata, we learned implication of uh, concurrence in terms of specific heat and magnetization. So you will see in many of ways, it has really manifested in physical problems. So, uh, although it looks like abstract. So then I'll talk, talk about quantification, this uh, four qubit problem as I go along. So I cannot but I cannot help but point out to this uh, to the giants, Einstein and uh, Schrodinger, and uh, you know that famous EPR paper which talks, which uses you know these continuous variable states, which are not normalizable, a bit difficult to handle, essentially pointing out that uh, you know this measurement has some funny problem, collapse of state. So, you know, and all of you are familiar that 1935 paper, but this beautiful word of entanglement is due to Schrodinger and also steering. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, he was so clear in his thought when you look at you know, some of these papers, when you read those papers, and it was just amazing, actually, you know, how deep these understandings were. But as uh, you know, that, you know, it is this, uh, you know, dream of uh, and wandering of physicists, which has not made it very popular. It was this, uh, you know, two quantum key distribution, quantum teleportation, which used this non-local correlation. That has made it popular, that has made it applicable, that has led to quantum technology. Please keep that in mind. That uh, one thing is that, you know, this, uh, always I would like to highlight, there have been, you know, when I, when I, I learned it, you know, when I was in PRL, people talked about, you know, this uh, action at a distance and this uh, beautiful experiment from Princeton, which pointed out, which sort of led people to believe that information can travel faster than light. So it was Professor Overwall and uh, this, uh, his student Tarak Overwall, Tarak uh, Nade, who is now in IIT Ohati, in a different context in optics domain, 
pointed out that information experimentally with numerical simulation that it cannot travel faster than light. So this kind of thing are experimental verifiable. So this spooky action at a distance, although it's uh, ex experimental observation of collapse is instantaneous, but the information cannot go faster than light. And you will find out it has physical implication in this conference that we many talks about that. But I have seen it in optics concept when I was in PRL, when this experiment came, there was actually what is information was defined and then it was tracked both experimentally and numerically. And it was in fact shown in the beautiful paper by Ograwal and Tarak in PRL around 2005 that information does not go faster than light. Okay, anyway, so therefore, now pure state and mixed state, for example, we generally prefer to go to density matrix, although in our standard quantum mechanics course, we were not really introduced to density matrix because I don't remember taking a course where density matrix was introduced. But it is in a sense convenient because you see psi has this ambiguity of a phase exponentialized chi times psi or psi itself is uh, are equivalent. But if you take psi psi, this kind of thing, then you know density operator uh, thing, this is independent. So therefore, people like von Neumann have preferred to do it. And it also gives a unified description. For example, if you look, find, look at Feynman's statistical mechanics book, you know, where statistical mechanics and you know uh, quantum mechanics quote unquote has been unified so this is a pure statement there's only one term if there are more than one term then of course it will be mixed and it, again you know this kind of thing we learned from optics for example you know uh, if you look at hecht or ghatak you will find out partially polarized light completely non-polarized light or polarized light they are actually the description is in terms of matrices so quite a bit of those things actually we learned from it optics and uh, that uh, spirit should not be lost. Now, okay, now but a quantum system, if there are number of terms like this, more than one term, then it is mixed. So here also one has to make sure that quote unquote classical, for example, if there's a thermal mixture, then this weight factor will be in the form of exponential minus EI by KT. EI is the eigen energy. Many terms we know in statistical mechanics, this PI will be there, but note, that each of them is positive. There is an ordering there, they add up to one. Classic example is thermal ensemble. So that kind of thing is classical because you can actually create them. So, uh, all right, so now on the concurrence is a measure which differentiates between this and the true object, the true quantumness. So for example, you know, pure state. Now, when we say the states are, you know, so the two particle state, it, so this looks like a ferromagnetic state. Both the spins are all uh, in the same direction. But you know, this definite has still some quantum in it, in it. Why do I say that? Because if you look at you know statistical mechanics, you know that ferro, you know there is no magnetism without quantum. You can actually, you know, so therefore, even if it's pointing in the same direction, it is separable, quote unquote, there's still some quantum in it. But what comes out of the resource is the one where you have in you know entangled state. Ferromagnetism is of course quantum. It sort of starts, works like a memory, there's a phase transition, all those things are there, but that separable uh, T uh, is uh, not very useful for quantum technology. So we are looking at these kind of things, non-separable. So of course, uh, you know, so if you look at density matrix, although, for example, look at this term, there are four of them, but it's still separable because if you look at, uh, you know, it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Can be written as only one term. So one term, if you write, then it is Smith, it is pure. If more than one term, then it is mixed. For example, look at this fellow. This is a mixed state because off diagonal terms are missing. Off diagonal terms are coherence, and that is missing. So it's a classical mixture. You see, positive half and half. Each one is positive, add them up, it gives you one. So therefore, if the coherence is mixing, now when you go to, you know, uh, you will see that there are other things, for example, the, the difference between the densities of the up and down state, then coherence, and uh, there is another parameter which will come in, I'll show you, you know, which are measurable quantities. So there'll be some very nice relationship between them involving, for example, coherence. It involves two particles, because if there's no two particles, then how do you know what is coherence? So those things that be a very beautiful relation, which will emerge through this kind of an analysis, single particle property and Two particle property, there will be some connection, you will see. So, main point is that some of the states which have 
positive weight. So they are actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, more like thermal state. They are still classical, whereas similar kind of claims could be quantum. Therefore, to differentiate it, you know, the physical concurrence, <coughs> uh, you know, which was given, was very well thought out. So therefore, one has to be very clear when you define entanglement, what is it? So, okay, so when there is two particular entanglement, you know, we, first of all, we, you have heard many talks yesterday, it's the bipartite quantum entanglement people talk about. So you define these two parties, and if there is a separable, then you have, uh, you know, no entanglement. So each bipartisan, when you go to multi-particle scenario, each bipartisan you have to take individually. All right. So now, how do you quantify it? So what are the measures, these things you have heard? That if they're separable, it has to be zero. So I'm just writing it down, uh, just for the sake of you know local unit transformation. So now change it. So and uh, so LOCC should be invariant. Now, for example, two qubit case, you all know that if you take a partial trace, and then you know look at the after taking the one of the Hilbert spaces like Alice above, so there would be one e bit of entanglement, and e rho is a convex function. So those things you know just for the sake of completeness. So concurrence is one such measure. So you take the two particle state, take the star operation and apply this sigma i sigma i. The pe people who wonder the physical implication of that, this looks, you know, like, for example, taking particle to antiparticle. Just think about it. You know, these kind of things which in particle physics, you know, we sort of take particle to antiparticle because I also wondered for quite some time, what is the physical meaning of this? So when you were looking at, for example, magnetism with Prochotino Geometra, where the concurrence led to susceptibility quantification and specific quantification. That time you see this kind of interpretation going or you know time reversal, you know, changing the direction of time. What is antiparticle? Charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal. Those kind of discrete things, you know, have physical things. For example, if you look at Professor Simon's paper, you know, in the PRL paper, you will find out the operation of uh, you know X goes to in the phase space. Uh, you know, uh, there are these two particles in the continuous variable states, coordinate x and y, px and py are the momentum. If you see his PPT operation was x, px remain intact, py goes to minus py. So it wonder for a minute, what does that physically mean? So that would be like either parity or time reversal. So those kind of physical interpretation in terms of discrete operations like charge conjugation, parity and time clarifies the physical meaning of this. But in this case, for example, I started my life with this trying to physically understand that has led to this geometric interpretation. So it comes out in terms of this trace rho, rho a square trace of that. So finally, when you have a matrix, trace, determinant, those are the kind of things which you can construct in variance. So question is that, you know, which makes physical sense in terms of all the you know, properties you should satisfy and some kind of physical meaning should come out so that one should be able to measure it experimentally. Okay, and concurrence is definitely one such quantity. Okay, and uh, so I'll not get into this partial tracing thing that you all know. Now, okay, so now let me directly go into this thing what I am, I am supposed to talk about here. So consider these two particle state. So general state with coefficient ABCD, which could be complex without, uh, you know, so, and now what we do is this, take a look at this thing. First, you choose your basis. You want to call it a measurement based approach. So fine, I go to the space of Bob, choose the basis. This is the computational basis, zero and one bit. Rest of the fellows, you keep, you know, uh, whatever you get here, you keep them like that. Now you can very clearly see, you know, that uh, Alice system is now, if this Bob is zero, Alice is, this object. And uh, Bob is one, Alice is this. So it's very, very clear that the state is separable, size is separable if these two are parallel, as simple as that. So this led us, you know, this. So now if they are perpendicular, then there will be maximal entanglement. How perpendicular means, you know, it would be like an area. So that is where we got into this thinking about vectors on a plane because it's two dimensional and parallel and perpendicular. And perpendicular means area. How do you quantify the area where the waste product came in? That was the thinking that goes into this paper. We started from there. Now you see that's what I'm going to do. And I will just point out that in that context, the right hand side you see is like area. 
for the n particle case. And so we have found that this Lagrange Brahmagupta, that the area identity, which you can see here, if you could be complex numbers, it's like Schwarz inequality. So n is equal to one, or k is equal to one to m, mod square times mod square, and subtraction of this cross kind of thing that leads to the area. This was the identity which we used. Then while, you know, after this uh, mathematician pointed out to us, we got back to this book, Mark Cross and Means, Introduction to Linear Algebra, this good old lower publication, which actually pointed out how Brahmagupta came into uh, this kind of identity later. And in the process, I learned actually, I had heard about this, but I learned this geometric algebra, because wave product and geometric algebra, the very beautiful thing. There are some nice American journal of these articles, which you will see, it provides a very unified description of, you know, for example, Maxwell equation, Dirac equation, and uh, scalars. And that's what we really made use of, waste product. So you see this thing is the waste product. Waste product is related to corn A cross B, which is epsilon I, J, K, A, J, B, K. But note that epsilon I, J, K needs a third dimension. Here you don't need third dimension. You see A, I, B, J minus J, B, I, you can define on the plane itself. So naturally, you know, area, those kind of things, it related to core. Core needs hydro dimension, but there is a very natural mathematical uh, object called waste product which is available through geometric algebra. That led us to this kind of rotation and measure of the concurrence as a object, you know, post measurement kind of thing through this. So it's the waste product of this, you take the basis phi i phi j, this could be zero or one. Post measurement, whatever you get, we got there these two vectors, take the waste product, it's very natural. If they are parallel, the waste product will be zero. And then use this above identity to simplify it, and you get precisely the thing what you are given, square, you know, trace one minus trace rho a whole square is the quantity which you get. So now, okay, now you can see them, you know, convince yourself that if they are parallel, this kind of thing, a by b is equal to c by d should come out. Then the overall factor of p will come out and they will be parallel. So that is what leads to this thing. So now is it, you know, uh, more geometrically and that will be very useful, for example. So you can, uh, you know, go to a geometric variation that makes a more um, physical sense when you, for example, try to see more than two particles, like three particles, G, J, W state, monogamy, and those things you can actually uh, you know, understand a bit more clearly when you go to this kind of picture. Why is that? Because all these vectors after post measurement, they would only lie on a plane. Therefore, monogamy relation can be translated into a relationship between areas on a plane. Okay, so that was, you know, that was the thing which was very handy for us. Okay, so now, <clears throat> okay, so now this is the entanglement measure through this uh, Lagrange Brahmagupta identity allows us to convert this, uh, you know, uh, modular squares and the cross terms into an area. So that is the main thing to do. Now this naturally extends to multi-particle state. How does it expand? So, for example, uh, I'm just uh, okay. Before that, I would like to point out to you that, uh, you know, Professor Tabis Kures will talk more about it because we were actually collaborated with him. There's a paper which I highlight. Thanks to him and his student, uh, we have been able to see that this has uh, a very beautiful connection, you know, this entanglement and through this geometric approach and this, uh, you know, this quote-unquote relative population between the first level and second level, which is the predictability, you know, language for that is predictability. The people who are from the physics background, you know, the first level and second level, for example, a two-level system, what is the population difference is the predictability. It has, you know, beautiful uh, interpretation in the, uh, you know, the sustained works from Professor Puresh's group, you know, which uh, has interferometric interpretation. We learned it from him. And uh, my students, uh, Nivedita and uh, Abhinas and uh, Nitis, they actually carried out the whole thing during this COVID period. And then there is this beautiful identity which comes out. You see this two body property, which is entanglement, then there is concurrence and coherence. So these things get related. And uh, <clears throat> This actually generalizes to higher dimension also. Okay. Now, other thing is monogamy. As I told you, you know, that uh, um, it relates, for example, uh, you know, that 
uh, you know, for example, if you have a three body system, if two of the particles are maximally entangled, the third party cannot get entangled. So for example, look at uh, three particle systems. So it's a distributed entanglement. And uh, in many people have talked about it. So best example is that, you know, this, uh, you take a, you know, singlet state, you try to, you know, put another spin there, you find out that spin can never go in because the other two fellows are maximum entangled. So getting a physical understanding of this could be useful because particularly in case of uh, quantum chemistry, I am being a part of, uh, I, saw, because I have heard many talks where bond formation uh, takes place in a very similar way. You know, for example, if there would be one particle war the system, you find out another particle goes out. So, you know, I'm, one who should try to see the physical implication of uh, this kind of uh, interesting object what one finds, because finally, you know, it actually is a multi-particle system and the chemical molecules provide the best example of multi-party systems. So keeping that in mind, we looked at this monogamy. So, and uh, you are uh, familiar, you take, for example, start with three particle state, you will find out W and GAZ state very nicely gets differentiated. So it's a distributive property. So uh, how, for example, you first look at measurement basis, suppose at least Bob and Charlie, if Charlie is zero or one, then you find out the concurrence between them, then you take two particle measurements, you know, for example, uh, okay, so you do it in uh, using all the parties, A, B, A, C, and find, uh, compute C, A, B, and C, A, C. Similarly, for example, taking a two particle measurement basis, you find over the state of A and you compare them. So it's a distributive entanglement. So the, you see the measurement basis is two particle. So everything here is relates to a vector on the play, on the plane, because A is actually there are two states as I showed you earlier. Similarly, when you look at CAB, you are also two states. So everything is on the plane. Therefore, this monogamy thing can be interpreted as how the areas overlap on a plane. So that was what you know, made us uh, quite happy. And uh, so you can actually you know, formally quantify entanglement and maximize it, looking at you know, these vectors and putting these two conditions, that maximum confidence occurs when these states are orthogonal, which amounts to the first equation and equality, both the vectors. Equality here is fine because you know normalization comes in, quantum states are naturally normalized, but geometrically when you put those things, you can check that what you get, start with the two particle case, and you get you know the nothing but Bell states, which is a basically you know with modulo local operations. So as I told you earlier, so once you employ the local integral operations, you would get the Bell state. Now, why you know why is it not a very it's although it's not a big deal, but this will help when you go to three particle, four particle case. For, for example, three particle case, you do see the difference between GSJ and W class. Four particle state becomes complicated, but still it gives you insight. So whole goal is to gain more insight. As you saw yesterday, that this two particle system, particularly for the mixed case, still has a lot to offer, a lot to offer in understanding of you know, physical meaning of these kind of correlations. <clears throat> okay, so now, the, what was this fourth qubit problem? So there, for example, there was this entangle defined in this way. Don't, uh, you know, get too much into it. So, so it was, uh, you know, basically this uh, waste product and different kind of basis. So there's a formal uh, definition, which people who are interested, we can, I can refer to you to the paper of share. And then, but there was a problem that, you know, uh, so let me point out to the problem. The problem was that it was pointed out by this gentleman, Lee and uh, Lee, that the three triangle can have to, uh, the physical interpretation of uh, the residual entanglement in a system, it, it represents a three-way entanglement, that uh, this entangle, which uh, was supposedly an extension of three triangle, does not represent the residual entanglement present in a system. That sort of you know, made us think what is going on. So it also was pointed out, it does not represent the n party entanglement present in a system. So therefore the generalization of form 3 to n, there is something somewhere is wrong. So that was uh, you know, very nicely worked out by Freya, which has come out as a published paper that trying to understand in the simplest example of four particle system, one actually, First, you try to write it in a proper, you know, area kind of thing, which is given as to for here, and it generalizes. So the whole thing also 
can be explained as a directed area vector. So some of you, if you are interested, I am giving you Shreya's reference. So therefore, you know, you have a geometric understanding of what went wrong and how it can be cured. Okay, so now we get into a hypergraph state. And why is that? Because this is a state, for example, which made me naturally curious because I heard that the state originated from I. S. Kolkata through uh, Professor Rao's work with Pillev. I saw a nice book somewhere. And uh, these are essentially in the language of uh, quantum operations. You would apply, you take multiparticle states, apply control leg not, control control not, those kind of operations. And uh, they are very useful, locally, maximally entangled. You can have to not put more entanglement as compared to high graph state. So this work, for example, which uh, for the use this method to quantify and find out the geometry of multiparticle entanglement. This was uh, uh, you know, the first one. And then uh, later on with uh, uh, other students, it has been worked out and analyzed also. So you know, I will not uh, try to you in more detail, but you can point out all these things can be thought of as areas on a plane. So therefore, this you know, some theorems from the plane can be very naturally be useful here. Now, recently, for example, we have generalized this thing to continuous variables, and as you all know, this continuous variable beyond Gaussian, not much is known in quantum optics, particularly a lot of states which are non-Gaussian, squeezed state, pair coherent state. If you people work out, you know, for example, in the works of Professor Chaturvedi, Professor Ogarwal, Professor Mukunda, Professor Simon, you know, and Professor Puri, you will find out in India that there has been significant contribution to understanding of uh, these kind of continuous variable states. But the moment you go there, beyond Gaussian, not much is known. So there have been attempts from various quarters to understand them. So we naturally tried to see if this measure goes through. So this work fortunately just got completed. You know, the, uh, hopefully it will see the light of the day. But uh, the formalism sort of naturally ex extends because uh, the states which we are constru constructing, we are using are, you know, sort of normalizable states because there's a Gaussian measure. Therefore, still you don't face the problem of plane waves or those kind of things. So you can actually separate out naturally or tonality and define a waste product there. And then you can actually show that indeed, you know, you have this entanglement measure precisely like, you know, the measure which we had for the uh, bit cases. So, okay, so now uh, specific examples we do that and it indeed gives the answer which, for example, for the Gaussian state, which Simon has got, you know, very well known result. And then, you know, there are uh, for pair coherent state and uh, squeeze state and many different kind of states we have actually computed. It is, you know, this Vinith who started it, who is now in Toronto, and my student Nivedita, they have computed it currently under uh, consideration for publication in the legal way. The first for the report has come and uh, hopefully should see the light of the day. Okay, now you go to, so the, of course the referee asked to show us that, uh, to show the explicit case for mixed state. So this has been just recently worked out. We used a construction due to this uh, gentleman, Vedral, the new Ripley and Knight, some time back. And so that you can use that and uh, construct this thing as a convex hall. Okay, so mixed state also, but mixed state still, a lot of things remains to be understood. Let us see how it proceeds. Okay, so now, uh, uh, <clears throat> okay, these are specific examples. The paper is there in the archive, modified version. If some of you are interested, I can. Okay, so now, uh, basically, you know, you, although the same thing goes through the interpretation of, uh, you know, entanglement, this many body correlation, how they physically manifest, all those things remains to be understood. So I'll just highlight some of uh, these works, which, uh, for example, this work, where is that? It's moving a little faster. So this is the first paper, the this paper, where, where we started, generalized concurrence measure for faithful quantification of multipartite state entanglement using relevance identity and waste product. That is where we launched this mathematics. And it was quite satisfying that when he was doing his BSc and the final year of MSc, started in the second year of BSc through the NIUS program of Punjab Center for Science Education, for which I'm thankful to Professor Vijay Singh. And then it ended in the year when he was finishing his uh, master's. 
now he is uh, finishing or uh, i hope i think he is finishing his phd or uh, some other higher studies in university of toronto that is where the continuous variable state is getting over so now uh, this is the work of uh, to mix state where we found out we computed the minimum distance of the boundary of the set of ppt states from the maximum mixed state using geometry of the position of the cone the geometry is fairly complicated started with aryaman again a btech student um, from nit surat kal and shreya finished her phd she is now in canada doing a postdoc so uh, but the mixed state is quite complicated geometry is not very easy to understand lot remains to be understood this is the work by which i was mentioning to you geometric quantification of multiparty entanglement through orthogonality of vectors this is the effect of covid and all of us are uh, for example avinash is going to this australian uh, sydney cluster for quantum computation and uh, nivedita is uh, here finishing her phd which is also is getting ready to pack up very difficult to retain students so now <clears throat> This is the one geometry of distributed multiparty entanglement in four qubit hypergraph state, where, for example, uh, this monogamy, other things we have understood. Careful geometry also is fairly interesting, particularly for the hypergraph state. Now, uh, Ramita is already a PhD student who is almost through, and this is the continuum. Uh, this is what which uh, I'm pretty sure Professor Puresh will highlight. I learned quite a bit about you know the interferometric measurement meaning of uh, you know this concurrence, predictability, path predictability, coherence. I've been fascinated by Professor Puresh's uh, talks all the time, but this is the first time when we collaborated. I understood physically how these things manifest in simple coherence in interferometric observations. So this has been communicated. Let us uh, see what is the kind of thing. But it was very satisfying to see. You know that uh, these things are beautiful interpretation in terms of uh, interference effect and vanishing of the same. So here is a work on generalized entanglement measure for continuous variable systems, where the you know we have just completed the mixed state case. Hopefully, uh, let us see how it goes through. So I think I will stop here and uh, now leave room for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Panigrahi, for finishing it on time for a while i was thinking that i'll i'll tell you that five minutes or four minutes but i was looking at the number in the top that it's already approaching the last slide uh, so anyway it's time for questions any question means yeah any question from the participants can i ask a quick question yeah sure yeah so professor panik you can go yeah. to Slide eighteen, eighteen, eighteen number slide. W which one? Eighteen. One eight. One eight. Okay. Okay. Let me just go back. One six. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. You keep asking, asking that one. Let me. Yeah. I'm just. So, so there means uh, some this determinant kind of quantity A B minus B C something determinant. He said mm -hmm. it's full entanglement quant quantifier. In what sense this is faithful? That's I'm trying to just understand. Yeah, just one second. Uh, which one? Where is that? This uh, figure, this regular uh -huh. that slide. Uh, it's all. Ah, this, this one, this one, this one, this one. Okay. Yeah. So A B minus B C. This one. Yeah, yeah. Is a faithful measure of entanglement for two qubit state. It's mm -hmm. for only two qubit state or only for pure state? It's only for pure state. Okay. Okay. Only for pure state, but you know, mixed state. We uh, as I showed. With Rhea and uh, uh, Patel, we have done this thing for the mixed state, which matches with the conference. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Panigrahi, thank you for your uh, nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, uh, in your case of this measure of entanglement, if you consider top, I, I, I. I I consider only three qubit state. So mm. consider G A J state and W S. Mm. Uh, which one would be of greater uh, entanglement? G A J. G A J and W. If you compare them, which one is? Uh -huh. which G A J. And this, uh, you know, this modified uh, W, which is potty overall kind of thing. There, the G A J came out to be more. According to your measure of entanglement. 
Yeah, yeah, GHZ, you know, between GHZ and this modified W Patyagar, you know, that with this factor root N, that the GHZ came out to be more. Oh, well, I am curious because uh, when you consider uh, W state, mm -hmm. then if you, con if you trace out one of them, then it, uh, there remains a big, big amount of entanglement. But mm -hmm. if you trace out any party, then it becomes separable. That's why I was asking the question. I, I, will, I will look at it more carefully. I will look at it more carefully. Thanks for pointing out. Yeah. So I, I have a simple query. Means yeah. This before before the MIT professor draw your attention that this is from this is Brahmagupta hmm. contribution. So was it known as Lagrange Brahmagupta identity, or after that you wanted to write? After that I knew, but you know I didn't know that. In fact, I asked. You know, no, but was have... was somebody called it Lagrange Brahmaputra Brahmagupta identity, or after that you started calling it like Lagrange I actually Brahma. called it after that in the book which is mentioned as Brahmagupta identity. Uh, okay, but now that you are asking me, I am becoming more curious. Yeah, well, two, 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 two historical thing was very interesting for me. One is that the origin of this hypergraph state from ISI and yes, yes, uh, this yes. Brahmagupta connection. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Professor Panikrahi. And uh, now, from multipartite entanglement, we'll move to multipartite separable states. And it's it's a it's the next talk by Dr. Amit Mukherjee from Shatendra Bosch National Center for Basic Sciences. So, over to Amit, please. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are audible. Okay, okay. Thank you. Let me just check other things. Hello. Ah, okay. So, my slides are visible now. Slides are visible, but if possible, you make it full screen means like go to slideshow mode. Ah, yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay, let me first thank the organizers and um, the chairperson, Dr. Anupam Pathok. So, um, my topic is basically multi-party orthogonal product states with minimal genuine non-locality. And the plan is like that. So I will first briefly discuss the a, a, uh, one of the most um, curious one of the most curious features of quantum information theory. It is quantum non-locality without entanglement. And then I will move to the multipartite scenario or multipartite versions of these uh, phenomena, which is basically um, developed very recently. And then uh, the entanglement assisted distinguishability uh, of these kind of resources. Uh, the main work will come later. Uh, this is uh, the basic uh, focus area of our uh, today's talk. So this is minimal genuine non-locality without entanglement and an application which uh, comes from that. So, so today's talk is a particular paper uh, article published in PRA uh, recently, and the authors are uh, Manik Bonik, Sharna Thaldar, Anandu Maiti, and Smith Rao. Some of them will give also talk here. Manik, Manik Bonik's talk is today, I think. <clears throat> okay, so I will specifically focus on this particular uh, article. So let me start with the quantum non-locality without entanglement thing. So the, so the uh, topic is here basically, let us consider that Alice and Bob are two specially separated players. And a set of orthogonal set of nine product states uh, is considered, like here, like a B0, B1, uh, this, 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 okay, this nine states. So any of uh, these states will be provided to Alice and Bob. The question is, whether they can distinguish that state or identify that state. So if Alice and Bob are allowed to perform global joint measurements, then they can just perform a, a simple uh, basis measurement in this three cross three uh, system, and they can just uh, identify the state. But the problem is whenever Alice and Bob are specially separated uh, players, uh, if their measurement, uh, settings are uh, restricted in a sense that they can only perform local operations and classical communication, this state will become locally indistinguishable. But as these states are product states, this can be prepared locally. So, because 
one kind of non locality is coming here but not the well non locality uh, and uh, it is coming without entanglement pictorial uh, uh, representation of these nine states are is this and this is a, a celebrated paper by uh, charles bennett so okay this kind of local indistinguishability has also application various important applications in quantum secret sharing data hiding etc that's why these kind of resources are interesting to uh, study <clears throat> so what we till now know that uh, these set of states these nine states are locally indistinguishable but let me ask one another question whether these states are uh, this orthogonal set is locally reducible what does that mean locally irreducible means impossibility to eliminate one or more states from the set by orthogonality preserving local measurements actually local uh, irreducibility is basically a stronger non local property than the local indistinguishability just by its definition because it is considering only uh, elimination of one or more states not distinguishing all the other states all, all, all of the states so the question is uh, is it locally reducible and the answer is curiously it is uh, locally irreducible you cannot eliminate any of the states obviously this set this set actually shows a higher degree of non locality in that sense so let me move to multi partite scenario so let us take this uh, uh, um, complete product basis in 3 cross 3 cross 3 system you can see 27 states here now the question is whether these sets are uh, these states are uh, locally distinguishable alder et al in their prl paper introduced this set actually first time and they have shown that this set is actually locally indistinguishable. But more interesting fact is that if any two of the parties collaborate like this, that is they are allowed to perform joint measurement, will they be able to distinguish the set? It is also impossible. Uh, how the it will show, show that in their paper. So that's why this kind of uh, non-locality without entanglement uh, set are called genuinely non-local product basis. That genuine term comes from the bipartisan team. But not only that, if any two of the parties collaborate, they will not be able to eliminate any state. This is actually locally irreducible in bipartisan. That set is locally irreducible in bipartisan. That's why this is a uh, this tripartite set, that multipartite non-locality without entanglement shows a higher degree of non-locality, which is strongly non-local product basis. It means that set is, that's why called strongly non-local product basis. These, all, all these things has been discussed in uh, Haldarita's PRL paper. But these GNPPs has this number of uh, branches. Uh, so let me just briefly show all those things. So just a minute. So these uh, GNPB means what, what is GNPB? Locally indistinguishable, even if any two uh, parties collaborate. So on the question of reducibility, these GNPB uh, sets can be branched into classes, type one and type two. What is type one? So GNPB sets, we are considering GNPB sets only. They are reducible when no of the uh, pairs collaborate. So this is called type one. And if uh, when no one collaborates, the state remain state because state is uh, locally irreducible, then we will call that that GNPB is type two GN. Type two GNPB can again be uh, branched into classes on the question of a bipartition. So uh, if the uh, set is orthogonal, set is initially locally irreducible when all the parties are separated but becomes reducible when any two parties collaborate, then we will call that this set is. Uh, GNPB of type 2A and the strongest case is GNPB of type 2B. It means uh, the set is locally irreducible even when any two parties collaborate. So all these things have been discussed in our earlier uh, paper with the same set of authors. So I will just show some examples of those types. So this is an example of type 1 in 4 cross 4 cross 4 uh, dimension. It's type 2. It's type 2A. I'll not briefly discuss due to, the, due to the time constraint. And this is the strongest case that I have shown initially. So these are the examples of all these types. I have 
put the figures there. So let me now move to the question of state distinguishability with the, with the help of entanglement. So the question is, this set, NX uh, non-locality without entanglement set, this set is basically locally indistinguishable. So the question is whether with the help of uh, entanglement, can they can Alice and Bob be able to uh, distinguish that uh, set? The answer is yes. The trivial case is, uh, see, the dimension is three plus three. So if Alice and Bob uh, share a log three of it, they can easily perform a uh, perfect teleportation. And then uh, the final party will perform a global measurement on this basis. And as a result, they can easily distinguish between these two sets. So in this uh, trivial case, uh, entanglement helps. Uh, but the natural question here is, is it possible to distinguish the states by using less than the required amount of entanglement for teleportation? And the answer is yes. It's a, actually a celebrated work uh, by Scott Cohen. Uh, so there uh, it is shown that uh, one bit uh, is enough to locally distinguish that set. If Alice and Bob share a one bit, uh, like a maximally entangled state in two bit case, uh, they can perfectly distinguish the set. So I, I will not uh, discuss Cohen's protocol here, but uh, I have just put two pictures, which shows that it is uh, some kind of different one than the teleportation. So we are interested in this talk is uh, on uh, specifically in this particular question. Is this resource minimal? Dimension wise, yes, it is minimal resource because that system, um, that resource actually resides in a two qubit system, two plus two system. But some other protocol may require lesser amount of entanglement to, the, to do this, like A00 plus B11 when it is not a, a maximally entangled state. But that is a open question till now. Uh, Cohen's protocol will not help in this way. So, uh, therefore, since dimension wise it requires minimal resource for distinction, the non local strength of this set can be considered to be minimal. Means this, it has, we will say that it has minimal non local strength. So, the natural question here is now what about different classes of GNPPs? means generally non-local product basis. So the trivial case is again teleportation. Let's say that Alice, Bob and Charlie are three parties. So each of them have, um, each of them has uh, CD uh, Q -DIT, uh, as the, uh, those product states, uh, those GNPBs. Now, if they share like Alice and Bob, if they share uh, log D bit and Bob and Charlie, if they share log D bit, then, uh, two uh, teleportation protocols will just easily you know, distinguish, locally distinguish everything, all those GNPPs. But the important question here is whether lesser resource can do the same task. So we have shown in our earlier PRA paper that yes, lesser resource can do that. So either uh, three bits or one GHN and one EPR can help in this regard. Uh, to locally distinguish those GNPVs. Like here, I have put the resources uh, figures here. So for all the types, uh, the resource and the entanglement will be enough. And these uh, cases has been uh, um, explicitly described in our earlier work. So the question, main question is now here. Are these GNPV sets uh, non-local strengths minimal? The answer is actually, uh, okay. So the answer is actually, uh, the answer is actually no. None of these sets resource has the minimal dimension that is two plus two plus two. Because you can see three PR means four cross four cross four. Uh, one EPR, one GHZ and one EPR means actually four cross two cross four. And this means two cross four cross two. So none of the resources dimension actually two cross two cross two. So the natural question is, is there any GNPP or GNPS set which has minimal non-local strength? 
we have answered affirmatively. What is GNPS? GNPS is actually genuinely non-local product states, uh, an orthogonal set that is not necessarily full basis. And our answer has been uh, put in this work, which is recently published. So, so we come up with a, a set of GNPS states. It is not a full basis. So you can see the 14 states here, and it can be shown that uh, we have shown in our paper that our GHZ, which resides in two cross two cross two, will be enough to distinguish that set. And that set belongs to, uh, for your information, four cross three cross three. As the set, as the resource belongs to two cross two cross two, the minimal resource is this. That's why we can say that this set is, uh, it contains, this set contains minimal genuine non locality without intent. Our construction has another important implication. So, which is what is that? Resource comparison among different entangled states. So, let us consider a JZ uh, state and a biseparable state. So, this JZ, three qubit JZ state, and that biseparable state, this biseparable state actually is some kind of different one. So, psi is a bipartite entanglement of spin rank uh, greater than two. Uh, it can be shown that these two states are local uh, LOCC incomparable. So the natural question is, is there any task which can compare these two states? And we can uh, we have proved that uh, JZ perfectly distinguishes this set, but the general form of that uh, biseparable uh, state fails in that. That's why JZ is a better resource in this. We can compare in this. So this is an impartite generalization where we compare M plus on partite JZ with uh, impartite biseparable one. And this is another feature. Uh, so we compared three pairs and two GHZs, which are actually LOCC incomparable, which has been shown by uh, Charles Bennett in their PRA paper 2000. So these two states are LOCC incomparable, two GHZs and three pairs. You can see the figures. It is actually, in a sense, asymptotically incomparable also, which has been shown by Linda et al. And we have shown that these two states uh, can also be uh, compared in our work, in our tasks. So let us, uh, before uh, just briefly describing the task, let me say that this set's name is S. So let us take two of such states and zeta i will be uh, randomly taken from a uh, first set and the zeta z will be randomly taken from the second set. These two states will be di distributed among Alice, Bob and Charlie. Their task will be to identify i and j. In this task, it can be shown that 2GHZ is helpful perfectly to perfectly distinguish these states, but 3PR cannot do that. So that's all. So in conclusion, I uh, want to say that in summary, what uh, we uh, discussed in that in this talk is that the idea of GNPV, generally non-local product basis, uh, another uh, stronger non-local property, which, which is local reducibility in GNPVs, classification of GNPVs and GNPSs, entanglement assisted distinguishability, which is basically not uh, teleportation, and our uh, topics, minimal genuine non-locality without entanglement and its application in resource companies. Actually, these, these uh, work has some uh, open directions also, like which particular entangled state in that minimum dimension with Hilbert space is optimal resource. This is still open. Another question of interest may be like this, uh, what GNPS set can be perfectly distinguished with three qubit W state? Another interesting question in this uh, uh, direction is resource requirement for implementation of the fully separable measurement corresponding to the complete basis uh, of S. S is not what I have seen. S is not a complete basis, but if we construct the complete uh, basis, uh, then it will be an interesting question. Thank you. That's all. Thank you for a nice talk and completion on time. So there was a question from Ajit Singh, means already written in the chat. So you can ask, means ask directly. And You see, you were taking non-orthogonal product basis. Now I ask if you can give a control on the angles between them. Uh, angles means? Uh, angles you see for orthogonal angle is 90 degrees inner product is zero so you take modulus of inner product okay, that is okay. cosine of the angle between the two so can you keep a control okay. on the number of angles 
and the uh, second thing that I asked was, if you take an uncompletable orthogonal uh, system of vectors, can you complete it by keeping the number of angles minimal? Okay, these things are also interesting to search. Yeah, I'll, I, I'll remember these things, yeah, to search. If, if you want to get an idea, you can look at equiangular lines or uh, rank one for orthogonal projection systems or non-orthogonal right, right. projection systems, you know, right. because uh, you can't have uh, rank one projection systems complete, uh, which are orthogonal, they have to be non-orthogonal. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Right. Is there any other question, comment? Okay, if not, let us thank Amit for a wonderful talk once again. And thank you. Uh, this is a continuity in the lecture. The first talk was on multipartite entanglement, then kind of multipartite product states with the emphasis on teleportation. And the next talk will also once again on teleportation. Now, Orko Prabhu Ghoshal from Bose Institute will talk about characterizing qubit channels in the context of quantum teleportation. Uh, so we welcome Orko Prabhu for. Yes. Please take uh, the talk. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. okay. So, So is the screen is visible? Is my screen? Yes, yes, it's full screen. You can start. Please start. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Orko Prabhu Ghoshal from Bose Institute. And today I will going to talk about characterizing qubit channels in the context of quantum teleportation. So uh, at uh, first of all, I'm thankful to the organizers of ICQIA for giving me this opportunity to present my talk today. So our, this work was published in Physical Review Way in the year of 2020. And my collaborators were Devorshi Dash and Shubhashish Banerjee. So let us start with the basic uh, concept of quantum teleportation. So teleportation is a well-known information processing task which requires shared entanglement and the framework of local operation and classical communication. So look at this simplest case scenario. So there is an information source from which an unknown qubit state has been captured by Alice. So Alice has no idea about the qubit state. And the task of Alice is to send the complete information contained in the qubit state to a specially separated lab bob uh, without uh, directly or physically transferring the quantum object itself. So they are only allowed to do local operation and classical communication. So Alice has no physical access to Bob's lab and vice versa. And he can only manipulate, he or she can only manipulate locally her particle. So if only LOCC is allowed between Alice and Bob, then Bob can at most guess the state rho, where this rho is a density matrix or a physical quantum state. And uh, he will calculate an overlap uh, between this uh, guess state and the actual state. Now, since this actual state is does, is, uh, is, does, is uh, actual state is not known to Bob. So he will take an average, but this average is known as the average average teleportation fidelity. So under LOCC, this average fidelity cannot exceed the classical bound two third. So if uh, the two third, if the bound is exceeded, then we will, uh, we can say that we'll uh, obtain some quantum advantage in quantum teleportation. So this quantum advantage is obtained if and only if uh, they share an entangled state. So in case of a perfect quantum teleportation, Alice and Bob shares an EPR state, but this is a Bell state or a maximally entangled state. And now Alice has two particles and Bob has a single particle. 
and Alice now performs a projective measurement in her lab where these projective measurements are in bell basis and after performing the measurement the outcome is communicated to bob classically so she will communicate two classical bits to bob and after hearing from alice bob will again perform some unitary correction so in each possible cases the teleported state will be exact replica of the input state or the actual state so this is known as perfect teleportation where every input state is teleported equally well with the same fidelity equals to the average fidelity. And it is uh, it will be one since the exact replica has been produced. Now, practically speaking, this uh, EPR state is an ideal concept. So these are uh, very fragile in nature and quickly interacts with the environment and becomes a noisy state or a mixed state. So if a, a mixed state is shared between Alice and Bob, then quantum teleportation becomes imperfect. So in case of imperfect quantum teleportation, Alice and Bob share some mixed entangled states. And the most general representation of a two qubit state is given by this expression, which is known as the Hilbert Smith representation. So there are four possible terms where the second and third terms are known as the local vectors, where these capital R and capital S are vectors, local vectors or block vectors of the individual subsystems. And the last term is very important, which is known as the correlation matrix term. So this TIG is a real quantity and it forms a three cross three matrix, which is a real matrix. And this matrix contains the information contained in a two qubit state. So in case of imperfect teleportation, all input states are not teleported equally well with the same fidelity, unlike the case of perfect teleportation. So in this case, it is expected that a distribution of fidelity values will appear about the average. So due, due, to, this, uh, uh, due to this noisy entangled states. Now, one may ask here that uh, in this aspect, how to completely characterize a given two qubit state in the context of quantum teleportation, since all input states are not teleported equally well. So recently in the paper, fidelity deviation in quantum teleportation with a two qubit state, the above question is answered. And the reference is this, Journal of Physics A. So in that paper, they have addressed that an arbitrary two qubit state can be completely characterized in the context of teleportation in terms of maximal average fidelity and the fidelity deviation in the optimal teleportation protocol. So what do we mean by the maximal fidelity and fidelity deviation? Note that this maximal fidelity is the average fidelity, is the maximal possible value of the average fidelity. The average fidelity can change and can change under local unitary transformation. So this has no correspondence with the entanglement content in the two qubit state. So there exists a product unitary operation U1 and U2 for a given two qubit state for which one can achieve the maximal possible value of the average fidelity, where the maximization is taken over all possible product unitary operation. And this is known as the maximal fidelity. And any protocol which achieves this maximal fidelity is known to be the optimal protocol. So why it is uh, known as optimal? since this uh, average fidelity is the standard figure of merit for quantum teleportation. So this is the primary quantifier for quantum teleportation and we have to maximize it. So that's why we are we say that this is the optimal protocol. And what is the deviation? So deviation is the standard deviation or the fluctuation of fidelity value values about the average. So this uh, fluctuation arises due to the distribution of fidelity values about the average. And we have to take uh, the standard deviation. So in case of imperfect teleportation, a non-zero standard deviation will exist. And in the optimal quantum teleportation protocol, the average fidelity becomes the maximal fidelity and the standard deviation can be written like this capital delta rho. Now note that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between these two quantity, two measurable quantity. So if we maximize one thing, it doesn't guarantee that the other thing will be minimized. But there exist certain states for which if we increase, uh, if we maximize the 
average fidelity, then it will automatically minimize the deviation. But in general, this is not true. Now, let us talk about this uh, particular result. So how to achieve uh, the optimal protocol? So for any two qubit state, there exists a product unitary operation, which can transform a two qubit state to its, to its canonical representation. So in the canonical representation, the correlation matrix of rho is diagonalized. So this TII are the eigenvalues, small TII are the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix of the state rho. So in this case, there are three possible regime. That means determinant of t less than zero, equal to zero, and greater than zero. And in this the first, in this first row, the first row is useful for us since any two qubit states with determinant of t less than zero will be useful for teleportation. So two qubit states with determinant of t less than zero will be useful for quantum teleportation. That means the maximal fidelity will be greater than the classical bound two third. And there will be a, a standard deviation, non-zero standard deviation or non-zero fidelity deviation. But the convert, converse argument is not true. That means there also exist uh, two qubit states with uh, maximal fidelity less than equals to two third, but have determinant of t less than zero. Okay. Now, uh, note here that the maximal fidelity and the fidelity deviation are the exact computable expression of uh, the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix. Okay. Now let us summarize three things that a two qubit state is said to be useful or it will show some quantum advantage in quantum teleportation if uh, the maximal fidelity is great that greater than the classical bound two third. And a two qubit state is said to be universal for quantum teleportation. That means every input state will be teleported equally well with the fidelity equals to the maximal fidelity when this fidelity deviation will be zero. And this will hold when the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix have, will have equal magnitude. So these eigenvalues are the uh, correlation matrix elements in the canonical representation. And a two qubit state will set to be useful and universal for quantum teleportation if the third condition is hold. So this third condition is useful for us. So consider this particular diagram. So consider an arbitrary state rho belongs to some greater set S where which have uh, all have the same maximal fidelity greater than two third and fidelity deviation greater than equal, equal to zero. So from this set, there will exist a strict subset, strict subset of states which have fidelity deviation equal to zero. So these states, these subset of states are most desirable states for quantum teleportation. So uh, these two quantities act, so these two quantities act as a better filter, as a filter to uh, to filter out the better states for quantum teleportation. So only one quantity, so only one quantity, for example, uh, fidelity, only maximal fidelity is not sufficient to completely characterize quantum teleportation. So we need an, another uh, quantity, which is known as the fidelity deviation. Now let us talk towards this particular problem. So up to now we have discussed about what is no, what is known as maximal fidelity, fidelity deviation, and universal quantum teleportation. So let us consider this particular scenario where uh, one of the party, say Alice, prepares a pure entangled state. And he uh, distributes the one half of these entangled states to Bob through some qubit channel. And finally, the shared state is used as a resource for quantum teleportation, where this rho lambda can be written like this, where this psi is a pure maximally, pure uh, non-maximally entangled state or a maximally entangled state. Okay, so the objective here is to find 
or to characterize the qubit channels for which the final state will always be useful and universal for quantum teleportation now note that uh, for pure entangled states pure entangled states in general are not uh, maybe you pure entangled states are useful for teleportation but not universal for quantum teleportation that means a pure non maximally entangled state possess non zero fidelity deviation so uh, these pure entangled states are useful but not universal for quantum teleportation but we want to see is there exist any uh, particular qubit channel for which the final shared state is always useful and universal for quantum teleportation now let us uh, talk about uh, quantum channels so we know there quantum channel has an operator some representation where these ki are known as the krauss operators where this completeness condition is satisfied since these are completely positive and trace preserving map so a krauss operator will have a krauss rank r if and only if uh, there will exist an isomorphic choice state like this so the rank of the choice state will be equal to the rank of the krauss operator so the rank of the krauss operator is uh, is defined as the minimum number of krauss operators required to specify a channel so if uh, lambda represents a completely positive trace preserving map so then the choice state uh, must be a density matrix okay so to check whether uh, a qubit channel uh, is represents a physical map or not then one must calculate the choice state and if the choice state shows positive eigen values positive semi definite and it uh, satisfies all condition of a density matrix then we can say that uh, this uh, lambda is a, a quantum channel now a quantum channel can be unital or non unital so unital channel actually preserves the identity operation and non unital channel doesn't preserve the identity operation so in general unital channels are denoted as the dissipative uh, non dissipative interactions environmental interactions and non unital channels represent dissipative inter, uh, dissipative environmental interactions so from now on we will denote this notation lambda r where this r represents the krauss rank of this particular channel now what we have found we have found uh, many short short results i am not going to the details uh, due to the complexity so first of all let us consider two particular scenario so there is a first scenario where alice sends one half of a bell state that means alice prepares a bell state and sends the other half to bob through an arbitrary qubit channel such that the final state is useful and universal for quantum teleportation now note that bell state bell state is always useful and universal for quantum teleportation which is very trivial now we have found some propositions uh, so let us look at, at these propositions i am not going to the mathematical details so if uh, the ali uh, the first proposition is that if ali sends one half of phi 0 so phi 0 is a bell state that means 0 0 plus 1 1 by root 2 through any lambda 1 that means any uh, arbitrary qubit channel with rank 1 krauss operator then the final state will always be useful and universal for quantum teleportation so this is a very trivial proof since uh, one can easily prove that any uh, qubit channel uh, with rank 1 krauss operator actually represents a unitary channel or a unital channel so it will just map a maximally entangled state to another maximally entangled state and uh, a maximally entangled state is always useful and universal for quantum teleportation the proposition 2 is little bit uh, non trivial now if ali sends one half of a bell state through any lambda 2 that means any arbitrary channel with rank 2 krauss operator then the final shared state will never be used never be useful and universal for quantum teleportation so that means uh, sorry the statement is little bit wrong 
so the final state can be useful but it will not it will never be universal for quantum teleportation okay so this uh, this uh, the proof is a little bit tricky but we can prove it so the third proposition is that if alice sends one half of uh, a bell state through lambda 3 that means an arbitrary channel with rank 3 krauss operator then the final state will be useful and universal for quantum teleportation only for a strict subset of qubit channel associated with rank 3 choice state so that means <clears throat> not all arbitrary channel for not uh, if we if alice sends uh, the one half of phi 0 through any arbitrary lambda 3 so there will exist a strict subset so not all channel uh, for, for not all channel will satisfy this condition and for proposition 4 we have found that if alice sends one half of a maximally entangled state through lambda 4 that means uh, an arbitrary channel with a rank 4 krauss operator then the final state will be useful and universal only for a strict subset of qubit channels so uh, these are uh, the main uh, proposition now let us look what happens when so you we... need to conclude now means we have okay lack okay. of time means okay okay so let us see what happens if uh, alice uh, individually sends uh, individually uses unital and non unital channels so if alice sends uh, one half of phi 0 through a unital qubit channel then the final sta shared state will be useful and universal for quantum teleportation if the channel is either unitary or a single parameter channel associated with a rank 4 choice state and uh, if uh, alice sends a uh, one half of bell state through a non unital channel then the final state will be useful and universal for quantum teleportation if and only if this uh, lambda in u that means uh, the non unital channel belongs to a strict subset of rank 3 and rank 4 choice states now let us there are uh, some uh, further proposition but i am not uh, going to the details so let us conclude so what have we found so we have found that if one prepares a bell state and distributes it through a qubit channel then there will always exist a subset subset of qubit channels that means unital and non unital for which the final state will be useful and universal for quantum teleportation and if one prepares a pure non maximally entangled state that is useful but not universal for quantum teleportation and distributes it through a qubit channel then for a given range uh, of the concurrence there will exist a subset of qubit channels for which the final state will be useful and universal for quantum teleportation so that means look at this uh, particular proposition 8 and this conjecture now if alice sends one half of a pure uh, non maximally entangled states with some concurrence greater than 0 then the final state will be useful and universal if and only if the concurrence of the initial state lies in this particular range otherwise the final state will not be useful and universal for quantum teleportation and for non unital channel we have estimated that non unital channels are more beneficial than unital channels for our uh, scenarios and so finally we can conclude that non unital channels are more effective than unital channels if we want to produce useful and universal states from for quantum teleportation from useful or non universal quantum states and these uh, noisy qubit channels which are beneficial for universal quantum teleportation can be realized by a specific physical noise models okay so uh, these are uh, our results thank you
thank you Arko. and now it's for some quick questions so audience anyone has any question or comment can i ask it? hello uh, manik okay. please continue yeah Arko. Ha. yes yes you you have considered that single copy use of the channel no yes 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 but in general i can do i have many money means i have many copies of this channel uh, take the uh, single state from each of them and then I, I i get some state and then i use the state individually that would be the best characterization for the channel no yeah actually here we have considered a single shot process that means only a single copy is available but yes, okay. uh, if, uh, if we can, uh, if we have the freedom of uh, taking multiple copies, then the problem is different. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other quick question? Yeah. Uh, hello. Am I audible? Uh, please continue. Yes. Yeah. So, Orko, you were taking these channels uh, to send the by maximally entangled state, and you were using them for the teleportation, right? So, yes. the question is: uh, Is it somehow connected with the one-way capacity of the one-way quantum capacity of these uh, channels? Uh, is there any connection? Well, uh, the yeah, there can be a connection, but we actually in our work we uh, do not derive uh, any connection between uh, channel capacity and efficacy of teleportation we are actually okay. here uh, observing that we are finding some particular channels for which uh, the final stage final shared state has more efficacy for quantum teleportation so okay. the efficacy is quantified in terms of uh, maximal fidelity and the fidelity deviation okay uh, okay 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 okay, okay. okay. So, thank you thank you so is there any other comment question? Uh, I uh, please be quick. Kindly continue, but be quick. Hello. 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 Uh, please continue. Yes, yes, yes. Not getting unmuted. Ha. Huh? There is a class of channels given by generalized toy map. Right. And uh, one can test various properties for that class. They they act only on diagonals and give a multiple of diagonal. Like EJK goes to minus D EJK, but EJJ they they have a map coming from EJJs. The diagonals get um, a tail, but off diagonals get only a multiple. Yes. Uh, and but, they, are, uh, they are called generalized toy maps. Okay, okay. So okay. one can test various properties for this class because everything is explicitly worked out. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good talk. Thank you for a useful thank comment you. and thank you Orko for a nice talk. So we thank once again Orko and since we are already running a bit late, so we quickly move to the next speaker. Shomo Dash from ISI Kolkata. So I'm not extending introduction of Shomo because we are a bit late. So Shomo, you can share your screen and by the time you share, I just tell you that I'm recently following one of your paper. So Shomo, please continue. Yeah. So, uh, hello, uh, Oniman, sir. Uh, thank you. So, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible, visible, just make it full screen. Absolutely fine. Continue. Okay. So, uh, thank you, uh, organizers, for uh, letting me to present my talk in this international conference on quantum information and foundation, uh, especially uh, Professor Guru Prasad Kaur. Uh, we are all his student, and we have taken his class since my uh, beginning of my PhD and now it's my end of my PhD. So uh, thank you, sir, for uh, giving this opportunity and uh, teaching us quantum information. So let's start. Uh, my talk is uh, maximum violation of monogamy of entanglement for indistinguishable particle. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, my supervisor, Professor Paul, Gautam Paul. Uh, he's a uh, professor of cryptology and security research unit at ISI. And uh, Dr. Onindu Banerjee is a research fellow at 
Center for Quantum Technology. Uh, anyways, previously he was uh, RP Professor RP Sat Pro. So uh, this work is based on our paper that is uh, maximum violation of monogamy of entanglement for indistinguishable particle by measures that are monogamous for distinguishable particle. Uh, this is published in 2021 uh, in Physical Review A as a letter. So. Uh, Okay, sorry. So uh, let's start uh, with this puzzle. Uh, uh, suppose uh, in an office, identity cards are issued to employees, different employees, to distinguish them and track them for some specific task. Okay, but if identity cards are not associated with that employee, then we cannot track each employee. In the figure, you can see there are two employees who are identical in nature. Okay, but they can be distinguished with their ID cards. And in the right hand side, there are two indistinguishable employees which are same alike and they cannot be distinguished. Now, suppose a specific task is assigned to this group distinguishable employee and non distinguishable employee. So, can that task be still completed? This is question number one. Question number two, can the efficiency of the task be improved when the work, they work with identity card or without identity card? Is there exist some specific task which can only be done with the employees having identity card and the employees without identity card? Now, this type of question may be a bit non-trivial uh, in the real life domain, that how identity cards may be affected in a company. But we address this question when employees are replaced by particles, right? So let us now technically define what is meant by distinguishable and indistinguishable particles. Okay. Now, there are two kinds of particles in the universe. And one is identical particle, another one is non-identical particle. And identical particle, we have distinguishable particle and indistinguishable particle. Non-identical particle are always distinguishable. That's why I make this column distinguishable. Now, two particles are said to be identical if their intrinsic properties, suppose mass, electric charge, spin, color, etc., are exactly the same. Now, indistinguishable particles means identical particles like boson or fermions, when each particle cannot be addressed individually. Suppose, uh, let's understand this indis indistinguishable thing with an example. Suppose this is a particle A and B. They are completely identical. And this is their wave function. Now, if A and B overlap, in the, so in the left figure, they are identical but distinguishable by their label A and B. So we can label them as their wave function does not overlap. But their wave function, if the wave function overlaps, we cannot label them. So they become identical, but not, but indistinguishable. Okay, so this is the basic difference between how we can make two identical particles distinguishable and indistinguishable, right? So we, uh, let us answer the puzzle answer. So we have shown earlier that there exist indeed a set of properties, quantum properties are application that are specific to distinguishable particle, specific to indistinguishable particle, and there may be some application which are more suitable for indistinguishable rather than distinguishable. So we show earlier in this uh, physical review a paper that unit fidelity quantum teleportation can only be performed using distinguishable particle. Okay. We're using indistinguishable particle, we cannot perform unit fidelity quantum teleportation. And there is a specific kind of state, hyper hybrid entangled state. I'm not going into this technical details, you can find in this paper. This type of state is only possible using indistinguishable particle. Using distinguishable particle, we cannot make this type of state. And there are some properties which can be performed using distinguishable particle and also in indistinguishable particle. We show specifically entanglement swapping. This can be done using two particle entanglement swapping. Okay, 
So we have not found any scheme to uh, entangle a swapping using two particle indistinguishable domain. So this is a unique feature for again indistinguishable particle. Okay. Now let us come to we know all know that Professor Panigai earlier told about monogamy of entanglement. So we have in our social life monogamy of marriage. That monogamy is the rule of marriage. It's only one partner. Yesterday was Valentine Day. So let's move to some technical detail. That if two particles are maximally entangled, then none of them can share entanglement with any part of the rest of the system. In the figure, you can see if A and B are maximally entanglement and E is the entanglement measure, if A and C are also entangled, so this, the joint entanglement is always less than their A given B. So mathematically, it can be written E for any entanglement measure, E of A given B, rho AB, this is the rho AB, and E of A given C, rho AC, less than equal to A given rho ABC. So uh, as Professor Paningawi have explained this thing, I'm not explaining this further. So this has application in uh, security of quantum cases, key distribution, classification of quantum states, condensed matter physics, and level physics. Now, the next question is, does monogamy always hold? So let us first as uh, analysis that on basic which two properties monogamy depends. Monogamy depends on the dimension of the particles and the entanglement measure we are using, right? So uh, OU uh, shown in 2007 paper that we know for uh, qubits, monogamy property always hold for concurrence. But for q trees using squared entanglement measure, he showed that monogamy is violated. So for this state, he has shown this result for monogamy is violated. So uh, we consider, uh, now we restrict our discussion for qubits as there are several monogamous entanglement measure in qubit system so for square concurrence, log negativity, entanglement formation, trial scheme entropy, etc. So let us now characterize that what is meant by the violation, monogamy violation. First of all, define Emax is the maximum value of any entanglement measure E. Sorry. Now we define first non-maximal valuation. If in equation one, in this equation, E of A given rho AB is less than equal to Emax, E of AC rho AC less than Emax, but their summation is greater than Emax. Okay. Then we say this is a non-maximal violation which is shown in this one, okay. The maximum violation, if we have both these terms, E of A given V and A of A given C is both equals to Emax, then we get the non-maximal violation. We said this a maximal violation because this is the maximum possible violation. E of A given V cannot be greater than Emax. So for the both the entanglement term, attains its maximum value. When both attains its maximum value, then we say it is a maximum violation. Okay. Now uh, let us uh, uh, begin uh, with quantum cloning. We all know that quantum cloning is different from what normal people know. Uh, this is a, actually meme that biologists can say we clone the ship, but quantum physicists say yes, but actually no, you cannot clone because we have a uh, no cloning theorem. No cloning theorem forbids the creation of an independent and identical copy of any arbitrary quantum set. This is a famous result which was uh, stated by Utrecht et al. in 1982. So this is the formal uh, 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 proof of this or statement of the no cloning theorem, I'm not going into the details. It follows the fact that quantum operation must be unitary linear transformation. So this has application in quantum error correction, quantum cryptography, black hole physics. Now the question is, is there any connection between quantum cloning and monogamy? Yes. So this is all about why we define the maximum violation of monogamy and why we find what it means by cloning. 
So maximum violation of monogamy implies cloning using distinguishable particle. Okay. Suppose A and B and A and C both are maximally entangled. Okay. Then using this protocol, using this protocol, we can have a cloning. How? Suppose phi x is an arbitrary quantum state. And we measure a Bell state measurement with A, and the output is Y. Then, based on the output, if we perform unitary measurement both on B and C, then we get the phi state in both B and C. So we have two identical copies of this unknown quantum state, right? So this way, maximum violation of monogamy implies cloning. Means the violation of is famous no cloning theorem. This is the relation of monogamy and cloning. Okay. Now we have an apparent violation. So in this figure, suppose A, B, and C are three particles and each having two DOF, one and two. Suppose the DOF of A, A1, is maximally entangled with B1. Now, DOF of A2 is maximally entangled with C2. Now, forget about this thing, uh, DOF view. Let us consider in particle view. So, one can say, okay, A is maximally entangled with B. A is again maximally entangled with C. So, we have a monogamy violation and no cloning theorem does not hold. But wait, if we go into the more details picture in the DOF view, degree of freedom view, then we have no, it cannot be done because A1 is not related to A2. They are two different degrees of freedom. So we need to move from particle domain to degree of freedom domain to redefine the monogamy of entanglement. So this is the monogamy of entanglement generalized in the DOS paradigm. So it says the same thing that if any DOS, suppose AI is maximally entangled with the any DOF of BJ suppose then uh, sorry uh, AI is entangled with BJ, BJ and AI is also entangled with CJ then it have to be restricted given AI uh, BJ given CJ so this is uh, you can see clearly that the extension of monogamy from particle view to DOF view okay so analytically it says if any DOF of A is maximally entangled with B, then it, this DOF cannot be maximally entangled with C. So we can see this figure that if A1 is maximally entangled with B1, then A1 cannot be maximally entangled with C2 or C1 or B2 or any other. Okay. Now we move, we will uh, state our main theorem that maximally, maximum violation of monogamy of entangle using indistinguishable particle, whether it can happen or not. Okay, so let us first uh, try to represent two indistinguishable particles, uh, each having two degree of freedom. Okay, so this has level alpha and beta. So uh, the ith and j DOF are represented by ai and bi. Bj, so the state can be represented by this product. This is uh, a new notation defined by uh, Lo Franco et al. This paper is a 2019 PRL paper. We have uh, taken this their uh, notation. Sorry, I forget to give the citation. And uh, the density matrix can be represented by this. So uh, in this view, we have to given for monogamy, we have to trace out, suppose these are entangled, this is entangled and this is entangled. So we have to define the trace out rule. Trace out rule for indistinguishable particle uh, is a bit tricky and uh, I'm not going into the detail why it is tricky. We are just defining our main result. We're just going to our main result. This is the DOF trace out rule that suppose A, two indistinguishable, we have two indistinguishable particle A, B, and C, and we, again, we cannot label them. 
So we have to trace out any of the DOF. So this can be defined by this DOF trace out rule. So this is proposed in our paper. I'm not going into this complex mathematical thing. So let's just go into our main theorem. So our main theorem states that in qubit system, indistinguishability is a necessary criterion for maximum violation of monogamy of entanglement at the same measure that are monogamous for distinguishable ones. So let's concentrate on what actually we show. So what actually we show in this circuit that uh, in the circuit of Lee et al, they proposed a state which uh, is uh, to using two indistinguishable particles, A1 and A2. So what we show, basically, suppose two indistinguishable particles we have, and with their degrees of freedom, suppose one indistinguishable particle is this place, another indistinguishable particle is in this place. So so for, I'm basically describing what we did that two indistinguishable and particle having a uh, polarization degree of freedom and path degree of freedom. This is a circuit of particle action. So this is a hyper hybrid entangled state. Uh, sorry, this is a, a hybrid beam splitter. This is HBS. Okay, so one particle pin down goes from here. This is hybrid beam splitter and it goes to this is off side or it can go to Alice side. And similar, this particle can go to this side and this particle goes, can go to this side. So we show that in this circuit, the polarization degree of freedom of Alice is maximally entangled with the polarization degrees of freedom of Bob. And simultaneously, this polarization degree of freedom of Alice is simultaneously entangled with the path degrees of freedom of Bob. But again, they are indistinguishable. That's why we have a maximum violation. Okay, if we this there's a distinguishable, then we can do cloning. Okay, so this Shomo, we have to move a bit analyzed. fast. Okay, okay, I will be uh, in two or three minutes. Okay, so uh, this is the state of the circuit, and we show that this one that they are both maximally entangled. So this is the uh, wish, uh, result. So you, you can see this uh, mathematical analysis in the supplementary material of this work. So now it's time for open question. So we show that uh, in distinguishable domain, maximum violation of monogamy of entanglement leads to violation of no cloning. Theory. But in indistinguishable domain, we say that Monogamy entanglement can be violated maximally, but no cloning theorem cannot be violated in principle in quantum mechanics. So which one is more fundamental, no cloning theorem or monogamy of entanglement? We don't know yet. This is an open question from my work. Again, what is the application of this maximum violation? We know that uh, monogamy of entanglement is related to the security of quantum cryptographic protocol, black hole physics, etc. So what happens this maximum violation of monogamy of entanglement? We again don't know what is the again explanation. And there are some other correlation like steering, coherence, discord, etc. So is there possible that maximally violate this correlation? So this is an interesting future lesson. Uh, I would like to study and if anyone want to collaborate, so I'm open with this work because I am not an expert in steering, coherent or discord in any of the things. So this is my open question. And the last slide, obviously, the publication slide. So I am a part of Professor uh, Dr. Paul's quantum group at ISI. So this is main quantum information, computation, and cryptography group. So we have two postdocs, six PhD students, and three master students. Six PhD students work in different fields of quantum computation, cryptography, and uh, uh, information. And uh, these are my related work in this domain. So this one is hyperhybrid entanglement, indistinguishability, and two-particular entanglement swapping, published in uh, Physical Review A. And these are the two papers currently communicated, uh, monogamy and cryptographic application of entangled indistinguishable particle. Here we show 
some cryptographic application of this indistinguishable monogamy and the generalization for teleportation fidelity and singlet fraction for distinguishable and indistinguishable particle and its cryptographic application these two are communicated and finally obviously i have submitted my thesis at isi and currently i'm looking for a good postdoc opportunities so if any of the professor think my work is interested so i will be happy to join the group as a postdoc so thank you professor patak thank you shomo and i wish you good luck in getting a postdoc and also success in addressing the open problems which you have listed so we are running late so we'll take a quick question and there is already a comment in the chat room so yeah okay. uh, can you can you answer that okay. means okay so let me see that okay which one is there in the uh, chat there is only one comment related to locality and function is pointed out by unit t12 would you like to comment yeah so uh, ben, uh, what benetti et al has uh, surveyed this physical report they have surveyed four uh, different types of uh, adnorm uh, indistinguishable approaches so one of the approaches and the recent approaches is the low franco et al what we have taken in this uh, literature okay so there are many other approaches and also obviously in this physical review report there are uh some uh, issues that how to improve these approaches so obviously this is the low franco approach in 2018 and uh, this is 2020 so this is the most recent one okay so if you have uh, more question you can obviously contact me in my email id okay is there any other quick question or comment so if not let us thank shomo once again and move to the next talk yeah. which is also on a very Thank interesting you, and up to the topic so next speaker is atonu bhunia who will talk about uh, non locality without entanglement and this is a topic of much interest at the moment and uh, without much delay let's move to atonu when atonu you can share your screen shomo please stop sharing your screen hello sir i am audible uh, yes you are audible oh, oh. shomo you have to stop sharing uh, so atonu you can you can share your screen okay oh is my screen is visible uh thank you slide is visible uh okay sir so that's your 41st slide move move fast you have 20 minutes and means maybe speak for 18 minutes and 2 minutes for question okay perfect thank please continue <clears throat> okay uh first of all um, uh, how it is uh, okay uh first of all let us thank uh, to the organizer uh, to give me an opportunity uh, um, uh, to talk uh, like a seminar uh, like this Uh, so i am basically a beginner uh, but uh, i uh, wanted to learn this topic uh, quantum information uh, processing uh, uh, so my uh, paper title is this and uh, 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 collaborated with my uh, phd guide indrani chattopadhyay and uh, our uh, senior professor professor devashish sarkar so uh, basically uh, uh, we first uh, start with the introduction Uh, we all know that uh, how quantum distinguishability uh, and indistinguishability uh, is a fundamental area of uh, research in uh, quantum information theory which is uh, very uh, which plays fundamental role uh, in uh, quantum cryptography in secret sharing and data hiding etc uh, so basically what is the task uh, local distinguishability uh, of a quantum state uh, attracts a lots in recent years uh, in the well studied bipartite case The state secretly chosen from a pre-specific orthogonal quantum state is shared between two distant parties, say Alice and Bob. Their goal is to locally figure out the exact identity of the state. So, uh, in this topic, uh, 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 first uh, Bennett et al. Uh, proposed a work which is a, a phenomena of uh, quantum uh, non-locality without entanglement, which is a very celebrated papers. 
Uh, after that, uh, many papers uh, uh, came out. Uh, Walgate in 2000, they uh, proved that uh, any two multipartite orthogonal products uh, can be distinguished by LOCC. After uh, Nathan Shen uh, uh, did this in C cross 3, uh, any three uh, maximally entangled state can be perfectly distinguished by LOCC. After that, Nishan Sarbin in uh, 2006 uh, did uh, this uh, paper. So uh, uh, after uh, 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 five or six years, there are many papers, but in 2019, uh, Haldar et al. first derived the phenomena of uh, strong quantum non-locality without entanglement, uh, which is uh, very, uh, which is the strongest uh, non-locality without entanglement until that date. In 19, Raoult et al. characterized the sense of non-locality uh, uh, sets in the sense of non-locality. In uh, 2020, uh, Ewan et al. construct first incomplete strong non-local set, uh, which is uh, till now open. Till that time open. So overview is my talk is a set of uh, orthogonal product state in a composite Hilbert space is genuinely non-local if the states are locally indistinguishable across every bipartition. In this work, we construct a minimal set of party assume a genuine non-locality in arbitrary large dimensional system CD cross CD cross CD, where D is uh, odd. After that, we give a discriminating protocol using a three qubit genuine entangled state as resource. Recently, uh, Haldar et al. Uh, in uh, PRL proposed the concept of strong non locality without entanglement, and they left an open question whether there exists an incomplete strong non local state or not. In 15, the author uh, Answered the question non trivially. In uh, this paper, they construct an incomplete party asymmetry strong non local set, which is more stronger than the set constructed in 15 with respect to consumption of entanglement as a resource for their respective discrimination task. So, uh, there are a few definitions, which is uh, what is uh, uh, a set of orthogonal uh, product set is locally indistinguishable if it is not possible to distinguish completely the whole set by non trivial orthogonality vis a vis local measurement. Therefore, it is by definition implied that all irreducible states are locally indistinguishable, but the converse is not true. And uh, what is the definition of strong non local set? A set of quantum state in tripartite quantum system is said to be strongly non-local if it is locally irreducible in tripartition as well as locally irreducible in every bipartition ABC, BCA and CAB. So uh, first of all, I uh, start with some example. So how to show a orthogonal state, this uh, 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 can be proved uh, it is indistinguishable. So this is the set uh, so, uh, and this is the uh, three dimension geometric picture of the uh, class. Uh, so uh, to distinguish the state, uh, first of all, uh, is some of the parties, Alice Bob and Charlie, uh, uh, anyone have to start with a uh, non-trivial measurement. So we uh, choose an arbitrary measurement choice, uh, MA, and uh, represented it in his uh, um, basis uh, as a uh, operator. And from that set, we uh, choose some state. Uh, next, we prove that M a dagger MA this uh, proportional to actually identity where identity uh, now uh, if we choose this uh, six straight from uh, uh, from the set and uh, we uh, do some mathematical calculation uh, we overall get this this m i j uh, that is the off diagonal element all becomes zero mm, uh, and uh, by choosing uh, some uh, particular choice uh, of element from the set we uh, can uh, prove that the diagonal element of the operator is uh, actually uh, uh, equal. Uh, so uh, ultimate the uh, 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 measurement choice uh, uh, choose by some parties or, uh, Apple or Charlie, uh, yes. it becomes uh, identity. So that's how we can prove that uh, a set of orthogonal uh, uh, product state uh, who, uh, if any party uh, uh, who can, who can come first, uh, they cannot uh, do some non trivial measurement. That's how uh, it is indistinguishable or irreducible. So, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the higher dimensional uh, 
figure of the uh, 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 completely indistinguishable sets if Alice, Bob, and Charlie are uh, are in distant lab. So we can generalize uh, the result uh, for uh, arbitrary uh, uh, dimensional parties. Suppose this two k plus one plus one two n plus one. There is a class uh, which can be uh, cannot be perfectly distinguished by LOCC. Also, if we uh, uh, change the function, uh, this two k plus one, uh, this twelve plus one, uh, and this is two m. Also, there is a, a minimal class. Uh, minimal class that means uh, till now that this is the minimal uh, as um, cardinality so um, after that uh, also we get this uh, c 2k plus 1 2l 2m there is a set of 6k plus l plus m minus 11 orthogonal product state which cannot be perfectly distinguished by loc loc um, also for if all the dimension are given that is 2k 2l 2m then there is a class which uh, cannot be perfectly distinguished by loc so this is the basically uh, basically uh, some uh, uh, lower dimensional example if we choose the particular value of uh, l m and n uh, this is uh, the uh, structure of c5 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 this is the structure of c5 c5 c4 uh, and uh, this is the structure of some sort of uh, c6 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 maybe um, yeah it will be c6 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 okay so uh, how we uh, basically the set of state are uh, indistinguishable if all the parties are in distant lab. Uh, so to discriminate them, we have to use some resource. Uh, so how we, it uh, uh, actually uh, works the discrimination task? Uh, uh, we share some uh, genuine entangled state uh, between the three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And this is uh, uh, this, and after that they become. Uh, 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 the uh, they can access uh, some ancillary system uh, and uh, after that as any of them uh, say charlie uh, do some uh, joint measurement with uh, her system with uh, 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 along with his uh, her ancillary system and do some measurement after that uh, the uh, set can be distinguished by yellow system in the um, um, mathematical structure and the complete proof are given in our paper so this is our next proposition uh, in a tripartite system if a set of orthogonal product state is distinguishable by using a two qubit bell state shared between any two parties then the set of states is distinguishable while the corresponding parties come together but the converse is not true that is basically uh, if uh, a set of state uh, is distinguishable, uh, if uh, mm, the two party come together, it may not happen. The set of state can be distinguishable uh, by sharing a two qubit bell set. This, uh, this is the uh, uh, corresponding example. Uh, this state is not shared the example of a set of orthogonal product state shared between the particle as Alice, Bob, and Charlie in 3 cross 3 cross 3. This set notice that two qubit maximally entangled state is not sufficient to distinguish the above set of state one uh, by the uh, uh, well defined protocol of Scott Cohen in 2008. Obviously, the resource state must be shared between uh, 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 Alice and Bob. The resource state will must not be shared between Bob and Charlie uh, and Alice and Charlie. But it can be verified that the set is distinguishable when Alice and Bob comes together. Uh, but the converse is not true. This is the example. This is the example uh, in this set uh, when Alice and Bob come together, the set is distinguishable. Uh, uh, um, also, uh, 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 particular bipartition, say Alice uh, ABC card cannot be distinguished by sharing two qubit bell state. Uh, so, uh, uh, the next thing is construction of genuine non-local set with lesser cardinality. Such a genuine non-local product state, uh, GNPS, is not locally reducible when all parties are in separate location. However, when two of the parties come together, it is not possible to identify all the states through non-trivial orthogonality preserving measurement. The GNPB is constructed in five con contains a large number of states about their respective dimension. So the generalization also is not proper with the higher dimensional cases. So it is further an issue 
to find genuine non local product state which contains lesser number of states about their dimension and generalized properly for higher dimensional subsystems also uh, so in 3 cross 3 we can find a, a 15 uh, 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 set of 15 states which are locally irreducible in tripartition and as well as locally uh, reducible but not completely distinguishable in every bipartite cut uh, the mathematical structure are not uh, uh, here it is uh, okay uh, now uh, it is the uh, basically uh, the uh, uh, picture uh, of the uh, set in uh, a particular bipartition a b c cut so uh, in uh, uh, actually in five author construct a complete basis uh, of type p a g n p b in c cross c cross c which has same characteristic in the sense of genuine locality as c also in five Authors derive a protocol to distinguish them and show that two copy of two qubit maximally entangled state is sufficient as a resource to distinguish the class of state. Obviously, the protocol used in five is a resource efficient protocol, whether uh, 20 gives a relative ordering relation of resource state for particular discrimination task. In 16, it was mentioned that the particular type 2A GNPB cannot be distinguished by using a GAZ set as a resource. That is the particular discrimination task. 2 qubit GAZ, uh, 2 qubit Bell state gives more advantage than a 3 qubit GAZ state. Here we construct a set 3, uh, the above set, uh, uh, this, which contains minimum number of state and has same characteristic in the sense of genuine non locality. Uh, as the set of um, set are locally indistinguishable in every bipartition then the set of state cannot be distinguished by using a two qubit maximally entangled state it is clear uh, and the state shared between any two parties as a resource therefore the discrimination task of three uh, uh, this therefore a discrimination task of three a three qubit dhz state gives us advantage next to generalize the result non-trivially for the class of state c in uh, actually in C D cross C D cross C D, but D is an odd number. The set of uh, fifteen by two into D minus one orthogonal product state, which is the class, uh, are locally irreducible in uh, uh, in tripartition uh, as well as locally reducible, but not completely distinguishable in every bipartite cut. Uh, after that, uh, the discrimination task, uh, the above class of state, it can be distinguished by a GAZ state shared between the three parties. Uh, the protocol start with some uh, 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 protocol. First of all, let us assume that a GAZ state shared between three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, that is psi ABC. Therefore, the initial state shared among them is uh, the initial state phi, uh, tensor product, uh, the uh, GAZ state uh, psi, where uh, phi is one of the uh, state from the above class. Uh, so now, Mm, after that, Bob will perform a measurement that is the uh, measurement choice. And after that, uh, they uh, do some sequence of measurement uh, to uh, completely distinguish the set. Uh, now, what is the uh, uh, strong non locality? Construction of uh, strong non local sets with lesser, card lesser cardinality. Such a non local set is locally irreducible even if any two parties come together. That is, uh, when all three parties are uh, in distant local, they are uh, irreducible. Also, in every bipartition, they are irreducible. In uh, this PRL uh, of Halder et al, construct a genuine non local product basis in C cross C cross C. This is the complete basis, which is locally irreducible in every bipartition and left an open question whether there exists an incomplete orthogonal product basis which is locally irreducible in every bipartition or not. After that, uh, Rao et al. Uh, gives a resource efficient discrimination protocol to distinguish that product basis that is GNPB2. Uh, they showed that 1 plus log 3 EBIT of entanglement is sufficient to discriminate that product basis. Recently, U1 et al. in uh, 2020 construct has an incomplete orthogonal basis um, in 3 cross 3 cross 3, which is locally irreducible in every bipartition. Also, they generalize the result for higher dimensional system. So, uh, 
in 15 the uh, chinese group yuan et al uh, they uh, give this uh, incomplete uh, uh, strong non local basis uh, uh, which is uh, 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 irreducible in every type partition as well as irreducible uh, in every bipartition interestingly it can be seen that the set of state uh, the above set of state uh, also uh, can be distinguishable by using one plus uh, log three EBIT of entanglement as a resource. We derive the entanglement efficient discrimination protocol for distinguish the above uh, set of product state. Uh, so we give uh, the protocol in our paper uh, the one plus log three EBIT of entanglement is sufficient to distinguish the above set of product state. Now, all strong non local set that is uh, the uh, uh, Haller et al. PRL and the recently 2020. Uh, the Chinese group described above have party symmetric structure. Uh, it also be noted that they consume same amount of entanglement as a resource for their respective discrimination task. Their question arises whether there exists a strong non-local set which has party asymmetric structure and uh, which cannot be distinguished by using the same amount of entanglement that is 1 plus log 3 EBIT of uh, entanglement as a resource in each bipartition. The next result uh, give the answer peaceful. So in three plus three, we uh, construct the twenty six states of orthogonal product state, uh, which has some uh, uh, acyclic configuration uh, with respect to the uh, party structure, uh, and we get that the state is irreducible in all tripartition as well as irreducible in every bipartition also, and it is uh, incomplete also. So this is the state uh, state structure. Uh, in a particular bipartition uh, AB by C cut. Uh, 1 plus log 3 EBIT of entanglement is sufficient to distinguish the incomplete orthogonal uh, set uh, in 15, which has constructed by the Chinese group, while this amount of entanglement as a resource is not sufficient to discriminate the uh, uh, task of this, uh, this uh, 26 state. So, uh, uh, why uh, uh, we can the, maybe this is a uh, uh, protocol dependency is there some sort of uh, how we can say that the, uh, the same amount of entanglement is not sufficient uh, for distinguish the uh, set of uh, class uh, class of sets uh, 26 states uh, but uh, till now uh, uh, we have uh, 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 there is a, a few kind of existing protocol and and uh, if we restrict the protocol uh, for uh, 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 then we can say that uh, for a, a, a for the uh, particular uh, uh, or the existing protocol the shape is uh, uh, more uh, strong than the uh, uh, before existing states so uh, we can say uh, uh, finally the set of 26 states uh, 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 they uh, need the uh, uh, resource to distinguish uh, at, uh, when all the parties come uh, together. Conclusion and some problems. Local discriminative content set has uh, attracted much attention during the last 20 years. Uh, the local distinguishability of quantum sets can be applied to design quantum protocols such as quantum cryptography. The construction of sets of locally indistinguishable multipartite orthogonal product states with only least number of uh, members is more difficult than bipartite ones. Uh, strong non-locality without entanglement leads to the strongest parts of the phenomena quantum non-locality without entanglement, which is firstly proposed by Haldar et al. Therefore, construction of strong non-local set with lesser number of uh, uh, lesser cardinality is more, more important issue of research in recent years. In this paper, we firstly uh, 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 we have constructed party asymmetric genuine non-local structure in CD, CD, CD. Uh, uh, it is noted that the set which are constructed include a considerable number of sets. Also, we provide a discrimination protocol using a GEZ state as a resource. This indicates strong advantage by uh, using genuine entanglement as a resource. Secondly, we construct an incomplete party as party asymmetric strong non-local set in C3 cross C3 cross C3, which needs much entanglement resource for the discrimination task and indicate the strongness from before. 
our results show the phenomena of strong quantum non locality without uh, with entanglement uh, sorry without entanglement uh, there are some interesting uh, problems left uh, how we generalize the construction in d to the power n that is uh, for n party uh, for any d greater equals to 3 uh, n greater equals to 4 uh, next uh, is to find the class of strong non local set which we have constructed in proposition 5 that is the uh, structure of 26 state uh, for arbitrary large dimension uh, also the portion of optimality of the entangled resource used in our discrimination protocol remains open so there are few references uh, of my work thank you so thank you Atonu and now it's time for some question so anyone any comment any suggestion question Manik, any comment? No, it's fine, Anirvanda. Yeah. <laughs> I have seen it already. Yeah. Uh, you already know it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how we... Is there anything, anyone else wants to discuss anything? So just to, just to the to Atonu and even if Manik wishes to answer means, uh, I, I, I started reading this kind of things recently and I wonder, is there any work on means cryptographic application of this kind of states? So if you are familiar, means put some light on that. Yeah, I mean, you can see, you can, you can see some, some data, I mean, secret sharing kind of task one can in principle. Work. Secret sharing means some classical message Somebody wants to distribute it between two party or many party, and he mm -hmm. wants that the message will be revealed only when both the party, all the party, come together. They they cannot reveal the message by talking to each, each other by classical. They are this kind of, and, and that has application in in in, in multi-party banking system. This kind of, so these are the applications. Secret sharing, one possible application. Yeah. Uh, and and Manik means have you I mean, explored means the role in randomness generation means where where they what kind of randomness exists in if if a theory has this kind of states and the non-local states are not there means the pro conventional non-local states are not there this kind of states are only full set. Okay, means your question is uh, if I understand properly that uh, this a theory which has non-locality without entanglement phenomena. Hey, I mean this kind of this kind of non-locality is there but not yes, the no. full full picture. And Whether and there will be some kind of randomness, will... there will be intrinsic randomness concept will be there or not. Hmm, hmm. Uh, Is that essential or not? Yeah, to be honest, I haven't I mean, think about this direction. Uh, okay, so don't ask this question on my talk. Anyone, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone, I am Devasha. Uh, one thing uh, you can, uh, as far as the application part of this kind of uh, structures is concerned. There is wide open, you can think about what kind of application you could do. Lots of work has been done. Basically, this Calcutta group, Sadonath, Mani, they have started this work. They are, um, so lots of work has been done in this non-locality without entanglement business. But my actual application, you need to export uh, secret sharing, data hiding and, and another uh, other business. But the, these are the possible uh, uh, area where you can apply. Exact protocol is not there. Okay. Hmm. Thank you, uh, uh, everyone, uh, for uh, sharing this session. <laughs> so okay. is there any announcement from the organizers? No, 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 no. Uh, at this moment, the, the lunch. Uh, uh. After lunch, we will meet at 2 o'clock, uh, exactly 2 o'clock. Okay. okay. So, so uh, Devasita, the, the, yeah. I, I heard every day you are having mutton biryani in ISI. But I, 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 I am not. I am not. <laughs> I'm not, not at uh, I, uh, ISI. Okay. 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 <laughs> Anirban, we are missing that. Huh? Uh -huh, of course. Uh -huh. yeah. Anirban, yeah, so. we can we can explore uh, at Calcutta some um, program regarding coast uh, activity. This. Uh, uh, I could ask with Orun that whether... Yeah, but, but now Indronil has hijacked it to Hyderabad. No, no, no. Hyderabadi biryani will also work. 
no 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 but but this this is that is also we have to look at look at the pictures only because in april uh, this is also an online mode no it's it's physical physical yeah. oh. oh initially uh, i said that it is online okay no but in we had a we had a theme theme one meeting and in theme one meeting orbind told me that it is it is physical Okay, okay, okay. Then uh, the situation changes. So, okay, okay, okay. I will ask uh, Odin uh, better. But or in okay, okay. Well, but I don't know if there are two two different plans because Arvind told that when there will be a new meeting and that meeting will be physical. Uh, it is on April. April, April eleven to thirteen. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, hmm. okay. okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. Bye. Okay. Okay. Bye. Hmm. a very general uh, introduction of uh, what do we mean by self-testing a device. So usually uh, by self-testing we mean that we have a device which is basically black box so we don't know what is inside, what are the mechanism, gears or uh, things happening inside the box but we have access only to the input and output from the box. So just by looking at the input and output from the box, uh, if we can uh, 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 test some properties, interesting properties of this device, then we say that it's a uh, self-testing. Self-testing because uh, <clears throat> the manufacturer of the device just gives the device. We have in, uh, input and output access only and if we can learn more about what is inside the device. So uh, one of the uh, self-testing we often do, which is self-testing functionality of a device in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, 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 so uh, this is very common. So for example, if we go with a friend to buy a cell phone, so immediately we make calls and send messages and test whether what I buy is actually a cell phone or not. So this is not so uh, fascinating. But here, uh, when we say self-testing, uh, we, we just from the input and output from the device, we would like to learn more like uh, uh, some unknown inner state of the black box. So. It is in this context we are referring to the self-testing here. So uh, let's come to our uh, uh, self-testing of quantum device. So basically it is a quantum device, which means it has a state of the system inside the black box. And maybe some measurement is going on the state of the system when we press the input buttons and we get some output. So, so here we assume that the, the physical system and operations going inside the black box uh, obey the laws of quantum mechanics. So in this case, uh, by self-testing, we would uh, want to ask, like just by looking at the input and output from the device, uh, how much can we know about the quantum state of the system? or how much we can know the quantum measurement performed on the state of the system when, when pressing the buttons of the device. So, so if we can answer to these questions, just by looking at input output uh, statistics from the device, then uh, we say that we have self-tested this quantum device. So, 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 so in, in a more broad perspective, in a more broader sense, what we basically want to do is that we have an unknown quantum system and we want to certify or characterize an unknown quantum system. So this can be done in many ways. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, convention, uh, conventional and experiment way of characterizing our non-quantum system is by doing quantum tomography. 
but uh, this may require large resources. Uh, uh, there are other also implementations like entanglement witness, so which can certify presence of entanglement in the black box. And, 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 and the third one, which we will be talking about here is a device independent certification. So in, in this, we have a very minimal assumption, uh, just that uh, uh, quantum mechanics is a correct description of the phenomena going inside the black box and we have access to input and output and in some cases by this minimal assumption and by just this uh, minimal statistics data we can uh, get a lot of information so compared to for example quantum tomography in some instances where this is possible device independent certification uh, we can achieve it with quite uh, low, uh, comparatively quite low resources. So, so here I'll be talking about self-testing quantum states in Bell experiments. So <clears throat> here our device is composed of two boxes, uh, basically, and it is also considered as a black box. And one box is with Alice, one box is with Bob. Uh, they share this and the state uh, quantum state shy of the box is unknown and uh, <clears throat> they can uh, press some some input buttons alice and bob and they can get some output a and b so x and y are input buttons which correspond to doing some measurement on unknown state shy and a and b are outcome of the measurement for alice and bob so in, in the device independent scenario or black box scenario, so what would be the input output statistics in such kind of experiment? So usually we can just uh, estimate probability of getting outcome A, B when the inputs were X and Y. And uh, here we will be just considering with a very simple experiment, like simplest Pell experiment. So the possible inputs for L, both Alice and Bob are just a choice between two inputs, which we call zero one, and output for Alice and Bob are also binary, which can be either zero or one. So the and 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 there are sixteen this kind of probability. So we collect all the probabilities in the form of a vector, and this vector we call a correlation or behavior. So so the, from the correlation or behavior of the black box, the problem is if we are given a P, vector P, that is behavior of the box, can we find psi, the quantum state of the device? So this is the question we'll be addressing. So now here uh, we should be also ca uh, careful when we say that we want to learn psi as much as we can, or uh, here I'll switch to this notation of the unknown state of the system, which is rho AB. So we, we, we can know this uh, only up to local isometry. By this, what we mean, uh, we know that from the black box, we have access only to these probabilities. And these probabilities are calculated from Born rule. So given state and measurement, applying Born rule, we get this, uh, this probability can be described. But if we also uh, give a unitary rotation to the state rho AB, and then it changes to rho tilde AB, and uh, correspondingly, we also change our measurement in this way. And these unitaries are local unitaries for Alice and Bob. And if we again compute uh, the probability, with the new state and uh, this rotated measurement and rotated state, we will get the same probability. So in some sense, just by looking at the black box statistics or these probabilities, we cannot distinguish between rho AB and rho tilde AB. So, <clears throat> so, and similarly, if there are, if we add some additional degree of freedom and construct a state rho hat AB, 
and, so, and also extend the measurement in this way such that measurement on this Anisila uh, space acts uh, trivially. So this identity. Then again, if we apply bond rule, we will get the same probability. So this kind of this kind of uh, interconversion of a state from rho AB to rho tilde AB by applying unitary or rho hat AB by applying anisila, they are all in equivalent and we cannot hope to distinguish between these type of uh, thing uh, just by looking at the uh, statistics from the experiment, these probabilities. And this is something we call, uh, when we combine all these things, what we get is a local isometry map. So basically local isometry map uh, is a map from uh, of this kind, which preserves the inner product. So basically local isometry means we uh, adds, at least add some anisila to her subsystem and applies a unitary. Bob adds anisila and applies the unitary. So in this case, the state is can be transformed and similarly measurement can be transformed, but this probability remains invariant. So when we say we want to learn about psi, we then we say that we want to know psi only up to application of local isometry. So one of the psi uh, among, among this equivalence class generated by this local isometries. So, yeah, before I go further, it's also interesting to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the geometry of this uh, set of behavior or quantum correlation in this way. So for this experiment, uh, basically these, all these P vector or correlation vector or behavior vector, if we, in, if we draw the quantum set in this, uh, uh, space. So this point of this set are these behavior or correlation vectors. So uh, this is the basic picture, like uh, this, the set of all quantum correlations are shown as Q like this, which is uh, a convex set and set of all uh, local correlation are like this. And quantum mechanics respects the no signaling principle in this kind of experiment, Bell experiment. So the, the biggest set uh, represents the set of all no signaling correlation. And uh, we know that uh, quantum set is more than the local set of correlation, which we get usually by uh, violation of Bell inequality and quantum set is again, contained, properly contained in set of all no signaling correlation. So uh, this, why I'm talking about the geometry? Because this, the question of self-testing in Bell experiment is uh, very deeply connected with the geometry of this uh, set of quantum correlation. And more specifically, set uh, the non-local quantum correlations. So, so here is a nice review paper, a uh, very recent one in 2020 by Ivan Supik and Joseph Balls. Uh, uh, and I took this uh, uh, diagram from their paper, uh, which in a nutshell tries to describe when, when we can hope or from what kind of statistics we can hope to self-test the quantum state and sometimes also quantum measurement. So this is the local set and outer one is the quantum set. And this hyperplane represents some kind of Bell inequality, which is a linear Bell inequality. And uh, here this write that often extremal point, example, this Q of the quantum set, which maximally violates some Bell inequality uh, up to local transformation, a unique relation in terms of particular entangled state and measurement. Self-testing involves identifying such probability distribution and proving their unique realization. So to best of our knowledge, whatever result uh, is present in literature till now, always take uh, uh, this approach, uh, try to find some bell, linear Bell inequality and try to maximize it. And the point, the probability distribution at which it maximize 
those often lead to uh, self-testing of some quantum states. So we were surprised uh, 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 with our result, what we find that in, in some cases, uh, self-testing can be also achieved via non-maximal bell violation. So it's true that self-testing often comes from maximal bell violation, but there are some uh, uh, some uh, uh, non-local correlations or some some bell uh, uh, kind uh, correlations, which even if they are not maximal for that reference bell. Uh, test uh, still it can lead to self testing. So, and our work concerns with again with the simplest uh, Bell scenario, uh, as I described previously. Like there are two parties, two measurement for each party, and it two outcome for every measurement. And again, the question is: given a correlation or behavior in such kind of experiment find shy or when can we find shy? And of course, finding shy means up to local isometry. So, so the, the first I would just in this slide, I would just like to discuss the, what is the key uh, uh, result which we applied in this work and also the key question or key intuition uh, which led to our results. So first one is a very important paper by Louis Mazanes, uh, 2005 archive version and another paper, uh, which is 2006, uh, which says that in the simplest Bell scenario, if the dimension of the local Hilbert space is uh, unknown or anything, so there is always a basis in that scenario so that we can decompose the, the, the big Hilbert space HA tensor HB into direct sum of small subspaces for Alice and Bob indexed by I and J. And these subspaces have dimension like for Alice, it can have at most dimension two and for Bob also at most dimension two. So basically, in a nutshell, it says that uh, this Hilbert space can be decomposed <clears throat> into some kind of uh, qubit subspaces, so of uh, uh, maximum dimension two. So uh, uh, this kind of decomposition is possible. So this is not true in general, but only for this uh, particular Bell scenario and also some uh, uh, if the uh, n party extension of this kind of scenario. So due to this result uh, uh, explicitly proved in this paper, uh, uh, what we can say is the, the statistics from the black box of unknown state of unknown dimension can be decomposed in this way. Where, where I haven't written the details of this, but mu ij are coefficients which are positive and uh, sum of mu ij is one. And these probabilities are as if uh, uh, this probability of this uh, like two qubit subspaces, uh, p i j. So the whole probability can be always decomposed into uh, this kind of component probabilities. So in essence, if we see the behavior vector or correlation vector, it can be decomposed like this, mu ij, uh, small p ij vector, where these, these behaviors are from uh, two qubit subspaces. Now, the, we, uh, the intuition or the question which uh, immediately one can ask is that, is this a small p ij, that is two qubit subspace uh, uh, behavior equal to the behavior of the, the black box that is P for all IJ, for all IJ, that is for all two qubit space, whether this condition holds. And if this condition holds, we ask another question, 
does observing p in a two qubit subspace implies a unique state unique up to local unitary so our initial intuition was that if answer to both this question is yes then this, such an answer may lead to self testing so here independent of uh, any any uh, thing uh, any particular bell inequality we consider etc uh, this these two question yes answer points to self testing so as a, 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 as as a as a test for uh, our this we consider this particular kind of non local correlation which goes by hard which is due to hardy hardy's non local correlation and which states that if if in the bell experiment we were considering if these four probabilities satisfy this condition this probability is greater than 0 and three of them is zero then such a, such a behavior or such a correlation must be necessarily non local and the second question that we answered answer to the sec and why we choose this because for this it is already known that answer to the second question is yes that is in a two qubit space c to c2 no mixed state can show hardy's non locality argument this was result proved in 1997 long back by professor Jikar. So, because of this, we led to uh, choose this particular uh, correlations. Now, so immediately, what one can see that uh, what are all two qubit state which which can show Hardy's type of non locality. So, here uh, uh, what we find is that uh, all state of this find. which are parameterized by two parameter r and s and there are some phase uh, zeta and phi and if uh, this kind of measurement is performed here and uh, and this r, r are related to this uh, uh, angle of measurement measurement parameter and r and s can take any value between 0 and 1 and these are short hand notation for sin z by 2 cos z by 2 so if this kind of state and this kind of measurement is performed so for this kind of measurement only this state shows hard in non locality argument in two qubit space and the and the probability distribution for two qubit space is of this form so these are the measurements which we showed in this slide so if we take this measurement uh, and then one necessarily only one one pure is two qubit state gives hardy non locality argument and and the statistics or the uh, probability distribution uh, for measurement and outcome is like this and this particular the blue ones this one is the called as uh, success probability the the probability which needs to be positive of hardy's non locality argument and these are the zero conditions so from here we go and ask the same question what if we observe similar kind of statistics from the black box so now we don't know whether it is two qubit or uh, d1 d2 dimensional uh, state space or some big state we don't know we just see that in an experiment whatever probability we get two of them we write as r and s and then we verify if these conditions are met the zero condition and and others can be written in terms of r and s with the help of this function so if this statistics is observed in a black box experiment so then our claim uh, in this work is that all observed correlation in the above form self test two qubit state psi rs hardy for all rs one two so so if if this kind of statistics is observed in black box experiment then then it points to that self testing of all these kind of states and and let me just mention here this covers all two qubit entangled x state except maximally entangled state 
So if we vary R and S between zero and one, so it will eventually cover all possible two qubit pure entangled state. Uh, so this. So so uh, and here I I just go quickly to the construction of the proof. So construction of the proof depends on again uh, this. Uh, the lemma proved in this paper by Mazanis, and, and which says that the probability from the black box can be decomposed into this kind of probabilities. And, and, and then uh, we just construct, a, in general, we construct a, 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 a linear function of these probabilities from the black box. And these are some arbitrary coefficient, real coefficient, C0 and C, A, B, X, Y. And if one applies this kind of decomposition, one can immediately write this in terms of mu ij, omega, r ij, s ij. So now this r ij, s ij will be in the two qubit component subspaces. So r ij is this probability in uh, h i, h j subspace and similarly s ij. And one can verify all this condition. Uh, that Hardy condition also hold, if it hold in black box statistics, it also hold in component subspaces. So then we turned out to prove this uh, lemma, which turned out to be very useful. And it says that for any this kind of omega RS function of the, which is linear combination of probabilities from the black box, uh, 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 if there is a concave cover omega rs and suppose that this concave cover uh, is equal to the omega rs function in some region then for all rs belonging to r and for all ij uh, one can show that this is uh, true so basically I, I just show as an illustration for one example we took is immediately is the Hardy, uh, this uh, success probability. So for this, we <coughs> draw, uh, this is the projection. So for this, for example, in this light blue shaded region, the function is uh, concave. And uh, this con concave envelope of this function can be also constructed. Uh, analytically, it's very difficult, so we construct it numerically. And this dark shade region shows that region where it is uh, uh, this uh, blue. And and then uh, and this is the point in between is the point which shows maximum success in Hardy's argument. So th this is a, so if if in an experiment a probability comes from here, we know for sure from this lemma that Rij in all subspaces is equal to R from the black box and, and similarly Sij. Now, from this intuition, we, we could just extend to over all Rs, covering all possible uh, values in an experiment. So for that, we have to construct a more general function. And we showed that this region R mu is basically uh, if we take union, it covers all the region. So here we show that as an illustration, I think I'm running out of time. As an illustration, uh, we show that uh, if, if one consider this kind of function and uh, uh, construct then. So in a nutshell, like what I will say is that this lemma too. If black box statistics in the Bell experiment is of the form RS Hardy, as we showed uh, in this table before, then for all RS in 0, 1, 0, 1, whatever RS value take, and in all IJ subspace, RIJ is R and SIJ is S. So basically, the, the probabilities observed in black box experiment is exactly same in every 2 by 2 subspace. So this is the main uh, main idea, uh, main thing what we proved. And from this, then it immediately follows uh, uh, what we were uh, uh, intuitively observing. 
so so if if we can observe that kind of statistics in a black box experiment the two qubit state we can self test all two qubit state uh, uh, entangled two qubit except, except maximally entangled state so it is not more interesting that we self tested all pure two qubit state because this is already done so this is one another way of self testing all uh, almost all pure two qubit state but mo more interesting is our uh, me methodology and this uh, and then what we showed is that when we considered hardy's non locality argument even non maximal uh, hardy non local correlations can be used to give self testing of some uh, uh, two qubit entangled state so this is so now i will just quickly try to uh, summarize what we have done so with hardy test of non locality or two qubit state except maximal entangled one can be self tested even non maximal hardy correlation leads to self testing so to com compare if uh, uh, there is a paper by rabelo etel from 2012 they there they showed that uh, mac the correlation uh, showing maximal hardy non locality can be self tested here we showed that Uh, it need not to be necessarily maximal in fact we showed that uh, in two qubit state any hardy correlation we generate uh, that leads to self testing of some uh, state now set of all hardy non local correla correlation is arises from two qubit pure state or extreme point on quantum boundary so the 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 correlation the two parameter family of correlation that we generated in fact gives a part of the quantum boundary so this is another uh, uh, new addition because many other parts uh, so full quantum boundary is uh, is still complicated even simplest del scenario as today as a professor uh, uh, r warner was discussing that it's a very complex problem so like some telson landau boundary is known or boundary generated from tilted del chsh is known so this is another uh, new addition to Uh, generating one part of the quantum boundary and most importantly what i say is that what we show with hardy uh, is is the, the, the method we adopt can have a much uh, richer uh, uh, give much richer results oh. because to in deriving our uh, yeah. <coughs> results what are the things we use due to constraint on probabilities a hardy non local state in two qubit state space is pure and unique for arbitrarily fixed measurement so this by fixing some probabilities possibly to non zero even to non zero value but maybe in that case we have to fix more than 3 uh, we can lead to same kind of thing that in the two qubit state uh, that kind of parameterization will give a unique state second property we use is existence of a simple jordan canonical form for two dichotomic a uh, dichotomic observable for each party so this so this this refers to a certain kind of bell scenarios so so in those bell scenarios and possibility to find a concave cover for arbitrary linear combination of outcome probability and application of jensen's inequality so this is also applicable so so all this feature which led to derive our result actually points to much broader application of the tools which we have developed in our work so it can have a much broader applicability especially from the point of view of uh, uh, studying the uh, the geometry of the quantum set of correlations so uh, thank you for your attention yeah thank you asu for a very beautiful talk we are now open for questions Please, uh, whoever wants to ask, please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, yeah, Prashant. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, okay, sure. Uh, I can see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. I muted myself. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. We can hear you. Okay. So, so anyway, uh, the two small remarks. One is that uh, the 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 uh, extreme points of that larger body that you're looking at, like you you including the marginals, in contrast to my talk. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 and, yeah. Um, that's right. But the extreme points to, for that are all known. 
and they 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 are in this in this old paper with uh, Michael Wolf some some time back. So it's a it's a four parameter family. So these are very explicitly known. Also, one small remark on the application of this this lemma of Masanes. Um, with very little extra, so so he is actually thinking, and probably you are too, thinking in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Yeah, yes. but the basic fact, which is the C star algebra thing of two two projections, is also true in infinite dimension. Only then you don't get a direct sum, but a direct integral. But for for the purposes of your proof, that's the same thing. So you could easily include infinite dimensional spaces and get exactly the same arguments. Oh, that's all. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank, thanks so much for your comments. Arjun, yeah. Yeah, Ashutosh, uh, thanks for the nice talk. So, this is a new approach of self that I did. Uh, if you compare it, with the uh, standard approach of self testing using some inequality, say in the it, Bell scenario or maybe in the one sided scenario. So, it, what you can do through maximal violation of that inequality is that you can precisely identify the state that you have self-tested and by, by, by the same logic you can calculate or you can actually obtain the value of the entanglement in this uh, in the state that you have self-tested. So is, is that possible in this case? So that is the first question. And the second question is what happens to robustness in your scheme? I mean compared to the standard analysis of robustness that is usually done in self-testing. Uh yeah so actually uh, first i'll take this robustness thing actually uh, that that needs further study so uh, th that would need further study to address the robustness because here we are considering very ideal situation which won't be uh, holding in the experimental or laboratory situation so uh, so th this is one thing we need to address but uh, here we were inspired more by the uh, the found uh, the found uh, th this is aspect that if from here we can uh, self test in ideal situation and also know uh, about the geometry of the quantum set and so on and and re re regarding the bell uh, application of linear bell inequalities in finding self testing so uh, the i'll go to this slide so this is generally what is done which is shown in this uh, slide so one takes a linear bell inequality one maximizes it and uh, and the probability uh, at which it's maximum one hopes for uh, self uh, that it would lead to self testing of some quantum uh, state so in this approach, one thing is like there is also self-testing by tilted Bell CHSH inequality, which is again two parameter family of Bell inequalities. And then it again leads to uh, a similar kind of uh, result. But the main main point we, uh, what we feel excited about this is that uh, <clears throat> there is some, uh, some uh, something else which ticks uh, uh, when leading to self-testing and which is answers to these two questions. So first of all, in the simplest Bell scenario, as Professor R. Werner was saying yesterday, that uh, the two qubit space is very powerful. So from there, we hope to like uh, actually know everything about the geometry of the quantum set in that Bell scenario, simplest Bell scenario. And, and this question, like this uh, in the component space is small p i j is equal to p for all i j. So this is of course achieved when we take a linear Bell inequality and maximize and reach at the point. But in this work, what we showed is that uh, even like some alternative approach uh, like Hardy test, which is again a kind of tailored Bell inequality one can say, uh, one can reach and quite counterintuitively there even uh, if, uh, the success probability in Hardy non-locality argument is non-maximal, even that can lead to self-testing. Of course, there will be another linear Bell inequality, which will be like uh, uh, maximized to all those points, but we have to keep changing these Bell inequalities to cover all the Hardy points. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe we need, this needs further discussion, oh, okay. but yeah. we can take it on later, take it up later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you. See, uh, Asu, there was a question by Professor Singh. Can you just quickly see what was it? Chat box. Uh, chat box. Professor Iqbal Singh. Uh, 
uh, map that take max entangle to max entangle has form t going or a similar map using so modulo such maps can all maximum be also self test uh, yeah thank you for this question uh, i i need to uh, think uh, to like uh, about this so i immediately i can't uh, fully grasp okay, this okay. so then you can answer that later so yeah. thanks asu thanks a lot now uh, equivalent okay professor uh, werner has also put a comment all maximum entangled states are equivalent for this purpose yeah that thank you. you okay so sir, now uh, we are uh, ready for the second talk uh, professor manik 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 is here and manik is of course our own very own did his phd from isi kolkata was in math science now came back to assembo center and he is one of the you know very profound uh, has a very profound understanding of the geometry of the state space and i have read some of his papers with lot of uh, you know interest now he has moved to our sister institute iso tiruvanthapuram so we will now get to hear from him classical superdense coding quote and quote classical and communication advantage of a single quantum so manik am i audible plus five kind of a much am i audible yeah you are audible little little more sound yeah. so can you hear me now yeah thanks professor panigrahi for uh, your kind words yeah this type quote unquote classical super dense coding and communication advantage of quantum uh, single quantum system so i hope by uh, next half an hour I'll, I'll try to convince why i call we call it a classical super dense coding so uh, so far uh, in in the last two day we are uh, we are learning uh, or are uh, listening many talks on quantum information processing so we find that it is also better to go back into classical information theory and to look whether something striking is still possible there or not so this is a collaborative work so these four guys they are uh, doing their phd presently with me and tomal shoman mir are my long collaborator and they are uh, doing postdoc and Mo mir is presently doing his postdoctoral study with our group so as we have uh, know that revolution of I mean, second quantum revolution try to identify this peculiar feature of quantum mechanics or quantum single or uh, individual quantum system to come up with different different task that is not possible in its classical counterpart for instance yesterday when guillo's talk we have seen this uh, indefinite causal order concept that is not available in classical so one of the most striking result uh, in, in information processing is by uh, quantum super dense coding uh, by uh, professor Bennett and professor weisner what they have shown they have shown that a perfect qubit channel in presence of entanglement between sender and uh, sender and receiver its classical communication capacity can double so why this is interesting this is interesting because entanglement by its own doesn't have any communication power on the other hand due to the famous nogo theorem of Polevo, a perfect qubit channel its classical capacity is upper bounded by a perfect qubit channel but entanglement can enhance the communication utility of a single qubit channel, perfect qubit channel, that is important. And all these analysis are, we are, what we are discussing, single shot analysis. Very recently, this Nogo theorem of Hollebo was more, means a generalized version has been obtained by uh, two, uh, two, two mathematicians, Frankel and Weiner. They have shown that while, while in Hollebo's theorem, Hollebo, this utility is characterized by, uh, by mutual information between the sender, uh, means sender's data and receiver's data in uh, received data. So if one consider any arbitrary payoff function, still this, still this, uh, uh, this Nogo theorem holds. Quantum cannot give the advantage over classical. So we observe that this theorem, particular theorem, when they derived it, at that point, they have considered that classical shared randomness is free. Now look into that classical shared randomness as well as quantum entanglement, both has communication utility zero. Quantum entanglement is costly, but in that theorem, they are considered classical shared randomness a free resource. So we ask what will happen if we consider classical shared randomness as a costly resource, because the creation of classical shared randomness between two distance party requires some communication. 
So uh, 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 I, I'd also like to mention that some other branches of research already people have identified that classical shared randomness has some non-trivial utility. For instance, in Bayesian game theory, Omen has shown that this concept of correlated equilibria, the set of correlated equilibria is larger than set of normal, uh, what is called Nash equilibrium. On the other hand, uh, Lazio, Baba, and Kimmel, they also have studied that uh, this shared randomness has non-trivial utility in uh, randomized simultaneous versus passing model introduced by Au. So here our aim is in simplest communication scenario, what is the utility is, is uh, does classical shared randomness has non-trivial utility? This is the aim. So with this motivation, this is my plan of talk. So first I will discuss the setup and then we'll introduce a two-party communication game. Then I'll try to emphasize what do we mean by classical super dense coding. And then I'll try to move to in quantum quantum uh, advantage and what is the possible origin of the quantum advantage and so on. So the setup, as I said, a communication resource we can consider or, or, or mainly uh, divide into two broadcasts. One is this type one, this is common fast resource. Common fast resource means the sender and receiver before their game start in their common pass, they meet and prepare some correlation that could be entangled, that could be some classical shared randomness. I mean, that could be beyond quantum correlation like chronic correlation. On the other hand, another type two resource of direct communication resource. That is classical system, which is state space in the simplex or a quantum system or some hypothetical system, for instance, polygon system. So now our, we are trying to ask how if we combine these different resources with each other, how their communication utility change. For instance, quantum entanglement and quantum system, that is the quantum super density. So now in two-party scenario, so there are three distinct scenario can be considered. First one is the Solevo and Frank Weiner. So what is this thing? Alice, she got some input X and Bob has to produce some output B, classical, all are classical input and output. In between, they can have some type one or and, and or type two resources. Second one is this W Weisner, Ambianis, Nayak, Tasama, Bhajirani scenario. In this case, Alice is given some input variable AX as well as Bob is given some input variable Y and Bob has to give the output B, classical output. And depending on this X, Y and B, they are given some joint payoff uh, as a team. So, and that aim is to maximize this pure with the resources, given resources type one and type and or type two. And finally, another scenario is this, the famous Bell scenario, where each the just uh, uh, Ashutosh has just discussed, each, in, uh, each party has given some classical input and they are given, uh, they have to produce some classical output and given the, uh, the, from this input output, uh, given from this input output tuple, they are given some uh, payoff function. So now this Bell scenario, in this Bell scenario, we know that local uh, means non-local correlation, entangled state can reproduce non-local correlation. But classical, all classical correlation are local. That's why they are considered to be free. So this is a general practice in general that, okay, this local correlation or local shared randomness is free resource. But it is in Bell scenario, this is the scenario. Our aim is to ask in other communication scenario, what advantage we can get in using classical shared randomness. So with this motivation, let us introduce a game. So suppose Charlie is a manager of chain of a hotel. There are a number of hotel. And each one day, each of the, one of the hotel remain closed. And which hotel remain closed? That information is given to Alice. But Bob has to visit the hotel. But Bob doesn't know which hotel is closed. Alice tried to help Bob with limited communication resources. That is what different kind of resource will be given. That will be clear subsequently. So this is their aim. So Bob, first aim is Bob never visit a closed hotel. And second hotel is in long run, Bob, Bob, Bob visit each hotel with equal probability. Now mathematically, that scenario can be described by this particular visit matrix. Here all the IJ element is conditional probability that Bob visit the IF hotel, let's say this one, Bob visit two number hotel, provided that two number hotel is closed. Now the winning condition, first condition says all the diagonal terms should be zero because Bob should, Bob should not visit a closed hotel. On the other hand, second condition says all the column sum should be same. 
um, the, all, all the columns um, should be same because all in long run, they, their uh, success, they should visit all the hotel with equal probability. And we are assuming that all the hotel are closed with equal probability, means one upon n probability. So what is uh, so 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 and, and and this game in general can be more generalized. The second condition one can put not equal probability, some given gamma k probability, and this gamma k are known to Alice and Bob before the game start. And uh, since all the hotel are closed with equal probability, so there is an obvious bound on this gamma k. Gamma k should be less equal to one by, one upon one by k. So in general, such a game can be uh, designated by this parametric family gamma one to gamma n and uh, special cases all are equal. So now what is our, in, 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 in if assume now that Alice can send only one bit of communication, Alice and Bob doesn't have any classical shared randomness. Alice can send only one bit of communication, then how they can play the game? What is, uh, what is their strategy? So first, this is the deterministic strategy. A classical deterministic strategy is encoding decoding tuple where E is a log n bit to one bit deterministic function, whereas decoding is a one bit to log n bit, log n bit deterministic function. On the other hand, classical mixed strategy is a nothing but a probability distribution on Alice encoding times probability distribution on Bob decoding. Finally, the classical correlated strategy is a probability distribution on the Cartesian product of this encoding decoding. So now, fundamentally, this uh, this mix mix strategy can be realized with the local shared uh, with the with the local randomness on Alice's and Bob parts. On the other hand, the correlated strategy can be realized if Alice and Bob has sufficient amount of classical shared randomness. So at this point, how to quantify classical shared randomness? The, the, we can one 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 possible one faithful measure is this mutual information, but that is not all. There are more intricacies there. Uh, I'll not going to there. For that, I'll, I'll refer one of our recent work, this quantum advantage of shared randomness generation, recently pub uh, got published in quantum. Okay. Now come to this. What do you mean by classical super dense coding? Let's look into the three hotel game. So now three hotel game is parameterized by uh, three, uh, this parameter gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, but all of all of them are not three parameter because they satisfy gamma one plus gamma two plus gamma three is equal to one. So in x y z it is a x plus y plus z is equal to one surface. So this is the game space, but this orange region are unphysical because all gamma i should be in this case less than uh, two by three. So now what we have shown, I will not go to the explicit proof. What we have shown that if Alice and Bob, Alice can send only one bit of communication, then only the game of this green polytope, only the, only the boundary point of this green polytope can be win perfectly. On the other hand, if this classical perfect classical channel is assisted with additional shared randomness and one bit of shared randomness, then all the point, all the game can be perfectly formed. So what it proves? It proves that a single shot utility of a perfect classical channel gets empowered with shared randomness. So we call it quote unquote classical super dense coding. But we have to be very precise here. There is a fundamental difference because in quantum super dense coding, we have actually increased the mutual information. That is not possibility here. Here, the communication utility has to be quantified in terms of other payoff function. In this case, our payoff this success probability of this particular hotel game. So this is we call classical super dense coding. Now, naturally, the question arises: what will happen if instead of a classical bit, if Alice can send one qubit? Is there any advantage? Yes, we answer, gives a positive answer. If Alice, let's say, consider this, uh, this uh, special case, all gammas are equal. In this case, this uh, red point will be Alice encoding. On the other hand, this is Bob's decoding. Now, look carefully, Bob's decoding is not a projective measurement. Box, it is a trained measurement. Now, this will never occur. You see, this when, when this particular outcome will occur, Bob will sure that shy one is not the case because it is perfectly perpendicular. So, first condition is automatic satis satisfied, and also the second condition is satisfied. So, this game can be win in quantum world using only one qubit without any shared randomness. Not only that, we have also proved that not only this special case, any such game can be used using quantum encoding and decoding. So uh, description of total um, means, mm, mm, this is a lengthy proof. I, have, I am not going to discuss here. 
if one is interested, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, request him to go to our paper, lengthy paper. Now we ask the question, okay, what is the origin of this quantum advantage? Like in RSE scenario, as I said, Weisner, Ambianis, RSE scenario, there we know that in quantum advantage, Alice at encoding part, Alice has to use quantum superposition. On the other hand, at decoding end, Bob has to perform different, different measurement, which are non-commutative or more generally, which are incompatible, depending on the what input he is getting. But in this case, we prove, we ask, okay, what is the origin of the quantum advantage here? Our first proposition, what we can prove that a qubit is no better than a qubit in the HFW scenario, Alevo Frankel Weiner scenario, for any orthogonal encoding applied by Bob. If Bob limit to orthogonal encoding, there could not be, and, and Bob's decoding is arbitrary measurement, it could be C, it means generalized POVM, still there will not be any, any advantage. Second proposition we can prove is that, is that let's Alice measurement is arbitrary. She is trying to use means she is using this coherence for her encoding. But Bob is performing only a projective measurement and then post-processing this data. Still, no, no advantage is possible. So advantage is so that, that these two propositions imply that for advantage, proper use of superposition or quantum coherence, both at the encoding level as well as at the decoding level is necessary. So in, in, in some sense, in, we can look into classical uh, quantum super dense coding protocol. There, this entangled state is required at ent entangled uh, means at encoding step, where Alice will uh, perform the suitable unitary operation, and the decoding step also, bell based measurement is required. On the other hand, in RSE scenario, non-commutative measurement is required, but such a thing is not required here. Here only single system coherence both at encoding step as well as decoding step by Bob is necessary. It may not be sufficient, it is necessary. This two theorem proves that. So we can further ask, okay, is this, is this advantage strictly quantum? We show no. There are again hypothetical toy model, as I said. So this is a particular hypothetical toy model. So this is called polygon model studied by Zanotta et al. And many other author has studied different interesting feature of this model. Particularly recently, I can uh, remember one of the paper by Massar, where he have shown that this toy model, though their number of perfectly distinguishable state is two, but asymptotically all even gone has hollow capacity more than one. So it is uh, so all odd gone are hollow capacity is more than one. So what we have shown, we have shown that all this game, HN game, special case, can be perfectly win by even gone, two n gone. So it, in other sense, it proves that all the two n gone, their classical utility is strictly greater than a one qubit communication. So uh, we also extend this result. We have actually shown that in H uh, means uh, three uh, means three three hotel case, all the all the all the possible game can be win by suitable encoding and decoding for the square bit model. Okay. Then we ask. Okay. Is it possible then come up with some game where the advantage is strictly quantum? Okay, with this aim, we define a new game where the first condition is same, but the second condition is now strict. It tells that Bob's visiting IF hotel or Bob's visiting a particular hotel when a particular JF hotel is closed, that must be equal. In earlier case, Bob's visiting hotel IB, that should be equal. Now we are saying that condition that Bob J hotel is closed at that time in long run on all other hotel Bob has to visit with equal probability. So it's a stricter demand. And we could able to prove that this game cannot be perfectly win with one C bit and one bit of SR. Even one bit of SR is not sufficient. But if more SR shared randomness, log C bit shared randomness is given, then it can be perfectly win. On the other hand, and, 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 and a more generally result, we have proof that it, it is true for it can be generalized for arbitrary n hotel game also. In that case, one bit CC classical communication and log n minus one bit SR is sufficient. On the other hand, we have shown that qubit gives a precise perfect success strategy. And in this case, we have to generalize this encoding to be the symmetric tetrahedron and the decoding should be sig POVM inverted sig POVM. But interestingly, we show that using this polygon model, this game cannot be perfect. So this indicates, of course, 
it is it is not not the most general proof that indicates the the, the, the success probably more quantum sensitive because in earlier game the success is perfectly possible with this uh, polygon model but in this case it is not possible so the, so so the, in some sense it proves that the advantage is strictly quantum in nature so finally we also uh, also also uh, done the robustness analysis because the encoding decoding will be uh, may not be perfect so let's assume for the time being this encoding is uh, um, is uh, disturbed by depolarizing noise and both decoding is disturbed by depolarizing noise then what will be the uh, so epsilon e is the depolarizing noise for encoding and epsilon d is the depolarizing noise for decoding then these are the, uh, these are the parameter space within which this quantum success will always be there but if there is some more 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 means arbitrary kind of uh, quantum error then it is a little bit difficult question then we have to introduce an error function uh, this is one possible error function this is the nonlinear uh, error fu error function you can see the expression now the most general classical strategy in this case is actually a seven parameter family so now we have to optimize the error function over the seven parameter family this nonlinear function we have used this monte carlo uh, method and we find that the error can go at minimum 0 0.01 so any quantum strategy whose error is less than 0 0.01 is actually showing a quantum advantage so so the, the, the quantum advantage we are reporting is actually robust against the noise so it is possible in principle to implement or test it with the present day quantum technology so so uh, uh, so whatever result we have obtained that can be listed in this table so let's define this three ordering relation between communication resource. So we say a resource R1 is equivalent to resource R2 in HSW scenario if any payoff that I can achieve with resource R1 can also be obtained with resource R1. In that case, we'll say R1 is equal to R2. On the other hand, R1 less equal to R2, if R2 is as good as R1 for any such task, and there exists at least one task, where R2 yields a strictly greater utility than R1. This is one particular ordering. On the other hand, R1 less than instant R2 implies that there is a some instance where R2 is strictly better than R1, whether, whereas there may be different instance where R1 may be better than R2. So with this uh, ordering relation, now this is the list. Now you see, we can say that Q, a qubit is strictly less equal to, uh, less equal to Q plus one EBIT. This is the canonical quantum super dense coding laser. Very recently, Frankel and Weiner has actually shown that C is less equal to C plus one EBIT. On the other hand, if there is no restriction on the amount of shared randomness, then again, Frankel and Weiner CMP result, it follows that C plus SR is equal to Q plus SR. There is no distinction between them. On the other hand, our result shows that C is strictly Less, uh, less equal to C plus SR. Also, we can say C is less equal to Q. Also, we can say C is less equal to two bond. Similarly, we have this, our stick game, game shows that C plus one SR is less than instance Q. Again, we can show C plus one SR is less than equal to C plus log three SR. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, C plus log 3 SR. Similarly, we can say a polygon, if we look, look into the stricter game, there is an instance where polygon is less than or equal to quantum. And finally, if we lo look into strict game for higher end, then it can be shown that even C plus SR is strictly greater than Q in that instance. And also we can say Q plus SR is there is an instance is less than C plus EBIT. And there are so many more interesting uh, uh, this order of merit is in principle possible. So let us come to my conclusion. So our brings our work brings to the forefront the efficacy of classical shared randomness in empowering the utility of classical communication. So although at this point I want to mention that if we look into the quantum reverse Shannon theorem, there already it has been shown that if we want to simulate a noisy classical channel use, using noiseless Sorry. If we want to simulate a noisy quantum channel using 
noiseless quantum channel, they are shear randomness as non trivial infinity. But all these results are in asymptotic sense. What we are trying to show here, it is a single shot. In, even in single shot scenario, a classical shear randomness can empower utility of a classical, perfect classical channel. So, and finally, also, this if we compare our result with recent, recent result of Frankel and Weiner, this is our result is more striking because Frankel and Weiner have shown that utility of a perfect classical channel can be empowered with the help of entanglement. What we are showing, utility of a perfect classical channel can, can be empowered with the help of shared, classical shared randomness. Both are classical research, classical perfect channel, classical shared randomness. That's why you call it classical super dense coding. From a foundational perspective, we all already know that if we look into, so this is not yet explored, these are possible direction one can, we would like to further explore. If we look into Bell model for qubit or Cochin Specker model, we know that there is a hidden variable model possible if Alice, if, if a projective measurement is performed on the system. Very recently, Spekens in, in, in 2014 in this foundation of physics work paper, he has shown that such a hidden variable deterministic model is not possible if we consider more generalized kind of measurement. So it is naturally a question, is it something our, our advantage, is this something related to a indicate some deeper ontology established in uh, Spekens paper? Because as our theorem says, it uh, so for encoding both the, both the quantum uh, means coherence and encoding state, as well as coherence or more general kind of measurement at decoding state is required. And very recently, uh, Spekens and Liefer, and they have a paper, uh, it's a review kind of paper where they have claimed that why interference phenomena do not capture the essence of quantum theory. Uh, actually, they try to motivate from earlier work of Spekens uh, where uh, the uh, Spekens gives, gives a toy bit model and show that this model has many, many familiar feature like quantum theory, superposition, all these things. That's why they are trying to say maybe quantum interference is not that strictly quantum phenomena, it is some classical phenomena, okay. But our result is trying to say probably we may have to look into their claim because the particular advantage we are reporting here, that is not possible in this toy bit model. Because this toy bit model, this kind of measurement, seek or trim kind of measurement is difficult to construct in general. Because this is a very, 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 I mean, it is, it is, it is a just a toy model, even any arbitrary convex combination, it doesn't allow. So there are lots of other interesting questions one can come propose that okay, is it possible to come up with a scenario where a classical communication channel? empowered with arbitrary amount of shared randomness gives a payoff, but that payoff can be obtained through a single qubit channel. That whether this, this, this gap can be made arbitrarily large. We believe it might be possible and particularly one recent, one old work by Hardy, as well as very recent result by Oppenheim and Christopher Perry indicate that it might be possible, but we could not come up with. And the, our res uh, result is uh, very recent. And uh, since uh, I have today talk here, that's why uh, I, I, I we, we make the paper very uh, presentation very quickly and put it in archive uh, uh, incidentally today. It's a little bit lengthy paper, 23 page paper, but uh, I can assure you, if you look into that, it is very easy going paper. It, everything is calculated in details. So finally, I uh, end with, my, with my, my talk with a quotation from uh, Manamin. It is a quotation by uh, when he, uh, while he reviewed this super dense coding paper, why he thinks super dense coding is a striking phenomena. We are trying to say, okay, some, some strikingness is also possible probably also in classical information theory. It is sometimes better to look back into there. With that, thanks everybody for your patience. And thank you. Thank you, Manik, for a beautiful talk. Thanks. Very nice talk. Now we are open for questions. Orchan, yeah. Yeah, Manik, uh, very interesting talk. So if you can come to the table, maybe uh, there is a slight confusion in my mind. Yes. Probably something I could not understand properly. Yes. Yes. So if you come to the uh, one, two, th three, fourth uh, row. So in this case, you are saying that uh, 
classical plus shared randomness is uh, always i mean this is always greater than classical right no no all, not always it, it is saying you see it's saying r2 is as good as r1 for ah. any such task and there exists at least one task okay 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 there exists at least, uh, that task is our h1 game Okay, that, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Classical? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, I got it. Now, if you come to the next, the next row, say yes. classical is, uh, I mean, in the same spirit. So classical, I should call this less than maybe classical less than quantum. Yes. Uh, right. Now, now if you go to the uh, this thing, okay, second last row. So yes. here you have found an instance. Instance. Where instance where quantum is less than classical plus shared randomness. So the, my my yes. confusion was: is it in a sense contradicting the spirit of uh, what you no, found? No, you see, you see, no, you see, it, it, uh -huh. it, it is not contradicting because uh -huh. I have used some another resource SR. Okay, okay, okay. Because in CQ there is nothing else is there, but here something SR is there. So that SR can play non-trivial role in some instance. So, so there can be some instance when this thing is completely reversed. That is, classical less than quantum is completely yes, reversed. Yes, it is uh, possible. So that, that, that is the that is capturing the spirit of your yes, yes, argument. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to go through your paper in detail, certainly. Yeah. Malik, Shivasi has a question about classical capacity of a quantum channel. If you can read it. Yes, that. Shivala. Okay. Chat more. Do do people also talk about classical capacity of a quantum channel using the pure function of LW? What is LW? Shiva, I don't get what is LW. I think it's FW, FW. Frank Weiner. Okay, Frank Weiner. Okay, so uh, uh, so far I haven't seen any such work. All this, all this discussion are on single shot level. While uh, Hollebo is in asymptotic level, when we are looking here, or Frank Weiner. They are all looking into single shot uh, use of the chain. Does it answer answer your question, Shivala? Yeah, looks like that. So, Manik, thanks a lot. Even in single shot level. Even no? in single shot level. So now you see, uh, you see that is uh, that, that's 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 why I want to emphasize here. So capacity already already is a meaning. That's why I am I am intentionally not using the word capacity because whenever we say capacity, we have this Hollebo in means means this Hollebo entropic kind of quantity. But a channel's utility can be can be measured in different contexts. No, this particular particular uh, task is important. Uh, Shivada, uh, Shivada, you can unmute yourself. I think. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, yeah. No, I understand. You know, people do talk about single shot uh, capacities of channels also. Now, that is why I said it is quote unquote capacity. You know, it's not. Uh, ha, 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 ha. So, okay. Uh, so, yeah. In that sense, we can also call it in some sense in this game, winning this game, what is this capacity? Exactly. But, uh, so, so, since there is no confusion arise, uh, so and that's why people I mean, I mean, uh, use the term or terminology utility. Utility of particular task for this task. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, Manik, thanks a lot. Very illuminating yeah. talk. And now we are going to the last talk of the session by Professor Bankier. Good afternoon. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Welcome. Right to... And uh, thank you. Let me very briefly introduce Professor Bankier because. He is well known to our community. So he has worked on a variety of areas and did this PhD with Professor Jisa. Now, you know, I mean, he is no stranger to us. We are all aware about his, uh, you know, work on indefinite causal order. So today he will be talking about, he's from the, you know, Institute Deal grants. And today he's talking about quantum processes with indefinite causal order. And uh, Professor Venkert. We have uh, you leave, uh, leave five minutes uh, for questions, so thirty-five plus five. All right. Thanks for the, um, the very kind introduction. Well, thanks to the organizers to, to give me the um, the chance to talk here. Can you hear me well? I will assume you can. Okay. Um, so indeed, uh, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. 
So indeed, I, I will talk today about uh, quantum processes with indefinite causal order and how to demonstrate causal non-separability with some uh, relaxed assumptions. So what, what is it all about? Um, well, a little more than a decade ago, it was realized that um, just like quantum properties, like uh, position or momentum, um, some the causal relations in the quantum world can also be indefinite. And uh, there's a famous example that you heard already uh, about uh, yesterday in the talk by uh, Giulio Kiribella, which is a quantum switch, which is um, a process which takes two uh, quantum operations and uh, uses a quantum system to control their, their order in a coherent manner. In this sense, you get a superposition of two causal orders, and we, we understand that the, the causal relation is then indefinite. So this is a, a nice example, and now we want to, to study this, and, and we, we need a framework to, to, to investigate this kind of, um, of situation with indefinite causal order. And uh, there's a framework that was uh, introduced in this paper by uh, Oreshkov, Costa, and, and Bruckner in 2012, which is the process matrix framework. And this is uh, really well suited to, to, to understand this, um, this idea of indefinite causal orders. And in, in this framework, this uh, concept of causal indefiniteness is, um, is called causal non-separability. And now that we have this, um, this um, notion of causal non-separability, then we want to, to verify in a, in a, in a practical um, um, experiment maybe, or when, when we have a, a given quantum process, we want to verify whether we have this uh, causal non-separability or this indefinite causal order. And how do we do that? Well, we can, there, there are, um, mostly two approaches which were proposed so far, which are the device dependent or device independent approaches via um, causal witnesses in the first case or, or um, causal inequalities in the, in the second case. And uh, so this is essentially what I will tell you about and, and I will uh, be interested in going beyond those two extreme uh, cases and, and investigate some possible scenarios in between the device dependent and device independent. Um, approaches. So maybe a quick comment already on, on this uh, slide. So if you, even if you're not familiar with this, um, this um, subfield of um, quantum indefinite causal orders, then you may be familiar with some of the terminology that I'm using here. So non-separability or device dependent, device independent approaches. So the, these are um, terminologies that we use a lot in quantum foundations and especially in the study of um, quantum correlations. Or, um, or quantum non-locality. And so indeed, uh, there is a, a nice analogy to be made with uh, entanglement and, um, and non-locality. And this analogy, you can, uh, I, I will come back to this analogy, but you can keep it in mind to, to try to maybe understand where I'm, I'm going. And uh, if you work in the field, to keep in mind this analogy to, uh, to try to find some uh, good um, uh, promising directions to, um, to pursue. Okay. So the outline of the talk will essentially follow this, um, this uh, quick introduction. I will uh, introduce this um, process matrix formalism that allows us to study indefinite causal orders and this notion of causal non-separability. Then I will uh, introduce these uh, device dependent and device independent approaches with uh, causal witnesses and inequalities, and then uh, introduce two, two scenarios that are in between the device dependent and device independent um, scenarios. All right. So the Process matrix formalism, as I said, was introduced by uh, Oreshkov, Costa, and Bruckner. And the, the situation that we, that we consider um, is, um, to make it simple, this uh, bipartite situation where we have two, two parties, A and B, which will uh, apply some quantum operations. So wh what do we mean by quantum operations? We have some, um, some, uh, some incoming system, some outgoing system, and we attach some Hilbert spaces to these. And any quantum um, operation um, is a, a CP map, completely positive map, and uh, is part of, a, of an instrument, which I will denote like this, MX. So a CP map is one of the realizations of, um, uh, of, a, of an instrument giving some outcome A. Okay, so X here denotes the, the choice of, the, of the, the instrument, and within an, an instrument, we get uh, different results A. Okay, and same, same for, um, for Bob. And now we are looking, as uh, quite often in quantum foundations, 
we're looking into the, the correlations that we can uh, establish in such a scenarios. So the priorities of getting outcomes A and B, given that um, Alice and Bob chose the instruments MX and MY, so these correlations. And we want to understand how these correlations can be, can be established, how we can get these uh, priorities. And we will assume that these priorities, they're coming from, from those uh, quantum operations. So they, they should somehow be functions uh, of these uh, CP maps, M A given X and B given Y. Yeah, and we want to understand how we can get these probabilities. And in particular, we want to, to know if we can get these probabilities by applying the, um, the operations A and B in some well-defined causal order. So what, the, what do I mean by, the, by that? Well, if, if there is a well-defined causal order, then either A is before B or vice versa, or they are, they are separated. But essentially, there can only be at most one-way signaling. So if we, if, we have, um, if we embed those operations in a, in a well-defined causal structure, then there, there needs to be at most one-way signaling. And this is how I, I will denote uh, this one-way signaling. So to, to warm up, let's look at some, um, some particular examples. So here's a, the example of a quantum state that is sent to, to A and B. Well, it's, uh, it's well known how to, ca to calculate the, um, the correlations. It's uh, simply the Born rule. And those operations are just the P of EMs. So we get the P of EM elements and the, and the trace formula um, that give us the, the correlations. That's a non-signaling scenario, of course. Now we can look at um, the signaling scenario. So we can assume that there, there is a channel that sends what comes out from A to B. And well, we, we, we can write the, the priorities in this way. So we apply the, the channel to the, the state prepared by, um, by uh, A and then apply the POVM element here. And if you work a little bit uh, with this formula, then you can also write it in this way in terms of uh, the choi jamerkowski representation of the, of the channel. Okay, So we also get a, a trace formula, which is quite similar to the, um, to the previous one. Um, I mean, that going through the details, but this uh, choi jamerkowski is, um, is uh, used a lot in this field. And that's essentially a way to represent a quantum map as a, as a matrix, essentially. OK, so, so we can see that those two um, scenarios can, can give correlations that are really um, given by the, the same kind of formula. And indeed, the, the process matrix framework tells us that any, any correlation of this form that is required to depend on the, the Alice and Bob's quantum operations has to take this form. And this is what we call the generalized bone rule. And this was introduced by, uh, in, in this uh, paper that I mentioned already. Okay, so that this, this um, generalized bone rule uses um, a quantity, um, a, a new object, this uh, W, which we call the, the process matrix. And this is really the, the key um, resource, uh, the, the, the key um, uh, tool in the, in the, um, in the formalism. Um, so ju just to clarify, so these are the choice representations of the, the operations. So they live in the, the input and output Hilbert spaces of, the, of Alice and of Bob. And here that's a process, the process matrix lives in the, the full space of all Hilbert spaces. Right? Um, so, so far, this is just a mathematical construction. And I just give you two examples, but the fact that we can always write it in this form is just a mathematical statement. And we can try, try to understand this, um, this W. And so, so far, it's essentially what connects Alice and Bob's um, operations. So intuitively, we, we, we may imagine that there, there are some connections here, but the, the W is really blind about how, how these uh, labs are connected. So we, we, we often represent it just like, uh, like this. So that, that's essentially the outside world of Alice and Bob's operations that relate um, whatever happens in, in Alice and Bob's labs. Um, so admittedly, this is quite vague so far, so we want to, to understand. And, um, and um, in fact, the, the two, two previous examples of the quantum state and the channels are specific examples of such a, such a W. And we, we, can, uh, we can also um, uh, wonder which Ws um, 
correspond to, to quantum channels or quantum states. And we, we may wonder which Ws uh, correspond to, um, to a situation where there is a well-defined um, causal structure between the use of A and B. Okay, So we can um, uh, look at which process matrices are compatible with a definite causal order. And again, definite causal order means that there, there is at most one-way signaling. So here the choice of, um, of Bob's uh, operation of Bob, of Bob's instrument shouldn't um, um, change the, um, the, st the local statistics seen by Alice. And this is this uh, no signaling constraint that, uh, that we get here. So that, that there are some process matrices which uh, characterize this kind of, uh, of, of scenario. Some process matrices which, um, which uh, represent the, the other uh, scenarios, so a channel from B to A. And it's also very, quite, um, quite natural or quite clear how to make sense of, um, of a probabilistic mixture of the, of the two cases. So a mixture, probability, probabilistic mixture of a, a process matrix from A to B, so a channel from A to B and a channel from B to A, that's essentially um, a, a resource that you, in which you, you use a channel in one direction with some probability Q or in the other direction in, in the, with the probability one minus Q. So we can still fairly easily understand this kind of, um, of, um, of process matrix. And this is what we call a causally separable process matrix. Um, and of course, what's interesting in the, in, the, um, in the framework is that the framework allows for process matrices which are not of this form. These are the causally non-separable ones. And this is what we, what we understand as, um, as the, this uh, new resource which has no definite causal order. Okay, so somehow this process matrix connects the, the two labs of Alice and Bob, but we cannot ascribe a definite order to how these are, these are used and to how these are connected. That's the, um, the basic notion that we that we need to um, to understand um, causal indefiniteness in the, um, in this um, in this framework. <clears throat> um, so in this uh, first paper by uh, Oshkov, Costa, and Bruckner, they gave an example of such um, such a causally non-separable process matrix, which is uh, is this one. Um, well, that's just a mathematical statement that it is. Um, causally non-separable. I cannot tell you what kind of physical situation this represents. Actually, we don't know. But yeah, the, the formalism has, allows us to write such a, um, such a W matrix, such a process matrix. And it's, um, it's possible to show that it's not of the, um, of the convex mixture form like this. So not very physical so far, but um, it's maybe, maybe in more interesting to, to look at some uh, more physical scenario. And a, a famous example, as I was mentioning in the introduction, is uh, the quantum switch. So the quantum switch is um, such, a, such a process where then there is um, a control qubit here, which will determine the order of application of the two operations A and B, okay? Um, and you can describe this quantum switch in this uh, process matrix framework. There is just a, a subtlety here because we, we need to keep track of the, of the control qubit essentially to make it interfere and, uh, and measure it in, the, um, in some uh, diagonal basis. And so we will send the, the control qubit to some final party here. So it, we just need to consider a tripartite uh, scenario to make it interesting. But essentially the, the idea is the same. So, so we can describe the quantum switch in this, uh, in this framework and we can check whether it's causally not separable or not. So here we have the, um, we have to consider this uh, kind of um, convex mixture with uh, the two orders A, B, F, and B, A, F. Only those two orders because F is always at the, at the end. And it's also fairly easy to see that the, the quantum switch is causally non-separable. So this framework allows us to, to really um, put some, uh, some um, well-defined concepts of this idea that the quantum switch um, has some um, involves some uh, indefinite causal order or some superposition of, of um, causal orders. You can see the, the superposition in this, uh, in this uh, vector here. All right, so these are the, the basic um, tools and the examples of uh, causally non-separable process matrices. Um, 
So this process matrix is to be understood as the, the physical resource that allows A and B to, and to connect their, their operations and to, uh, to establish correlations. And talking about correlations, we can then also directly look at the, at the correlations. So as I was saying, these are given by the, the generalized Born rule here. So if we, if we start with a causally separable process matrix, so remember that these terms have um, at most one-way signaling. So if you look at the correlations, then you also get um, a convex mixture of, um, of correlations compatible with uh, a, a given order. So no signaling from B to A. And then we, we can also look at this in a, in a kind of a black box scenario, just at the correlations. We forget about the, the instruments that were, that were used. We just look at the correlations and well, we also have this, um, this kind of a decomposition in this uh, black box scenario. And in this scenario, we call such, um, such a correlation a causal correlation. So again, a decomposition where one term is no signaling from B to A and the other is no signaling from A to B. Okay. So that's the, um, that's the, the type of correlations that can be established if you have two, two black boxes, essentially, with inputs and outputs, and you use them in some uh, well-defined causal order. If you don't allow for two-way signaling, that's the, uh, you only get causal correlations. And of course, just like for, um, for causally separable or non-separable processes, we are interested in the fact that there could be some non-causal um, correlations. So any correlation that cannot be decomposed in such a, such a mixture is said to be non-causal. Um, so the interesting um, uh, observation that was made by uh, Oreshkov, Costa, and Bruckner is that the formalism, the process matrix framework allows for some, some um, Ws, some process matrices to generate non-causal correlations. And the example that I gave, that, that uh, OCB gave in their paper on the previous slide is precisely one of them. So it was shown that this, this, uh, with this process matrix, if you apply some, uh, some uh, well-chosen measurement, some well-chosen operations, then you can, you can get non-causal correlations. Um, but it's also good to note that not all causally non-separable um, process matrices can generate non-causal correlations. So looking at non-causal correlations essentially is not sufficient to, to check whether um, a given uh, process matrix is causally non-separable or not. And um, again, the, the famous example of the quantum switch is uh, such an example of a, of a causally non-separable process which we can show cannot generate non-causal correlations. All right, so now that I've set up the, the, the general framework, how do we check whether a, a given process is causally separable or not? Um, and let me, let me talk again about this analogy that I mentioned at the beginning between entanglement and, and non-locality on one side, and, um, and the causal indefiniteness on, on the other side. So in this analogy, um, as you would expect, the analog of separable states would be causally separable process matrices. Entangled states are the causally non-separable process matrices. And there is the, um, the analog of non-local correlations, which are the non-causal correlations. How do we check on the, on the left-hand side uh, for entanglement and, uh, and non-locality, where the, the simplest approach is to use entanglement witnesses in this case. And here it's uh, testing bell inequalities and um, analyzing the correlations in the, in the local or non-local, in the local polytope and see if we, if we are outside of the local polytope. And we can really use this analogy to, um, to do the same um, in, our, in our case. So here we can construct what we call causal witnesses to, uh, to verify causal non-separability. And here we can co construct causal inequalities and, um, and analyze the causal polytope. So ju just to clarify the, the difference between the two approaches, that's essentially the, the same as with uh, entanglement and non-locality. So the first one, the first two lines there, and they represent the, um, the, really the physical resource. They are theory dependent. That's uh, quantum theory dependent. And you test 
typically test an entanglement witness in a device dependent way. So, so you will um, typically need to make sure that your your devices are really doing what uh, what you want them to do, and you trust that you that you have a, a good quantum description of the the devices. And below here, we have the, um, we are looking at the, just the, the observations, uh, just the, the the correlations, and the, this is a, a theory depend independent approach. And uh, when you test a bell inequality, and in the same way as when you test a, a causal inequality, that's a device independent uh, thing. Um, so I, I will clarify how this um, this analogy works here. Um, maybe ju just um, a quick remark, nonetheless, is that then this analogy is not too formal. So the, the mathematical structures behind are not the same. So we have to uh, to um, to take a little care when using the, um, this analogy, but still it, it provides some um, some good inspiration and understanding and of, um, of what to do to study the, these new concepts. Um, so very quickly, the causal witnesses. So recall that um, to build an entanglement witness, well, the, the most basic idea is to, to notice that the, the set of separable states is, um, is convex. So if you, if you have an entangled state, you can always separate um, separated from the, the state of separable states by a hyperplane. And this is how you get um, uh, an entanglement witness. And this is really the same in this, uh, in this um, in the scenario that we're considering here. The set of causally separable process matrices is, is convex. And we can also build for, for any causally non separable um, W, we can always build um, um, a witness, so a hyperplane that separates it from the from all the, the causally separable processes. And it's interesting to note that here, it's, uh, it can be done using uh, semi-definite programming, so efficiently, which is not the case for, uh, for entanglement. And, and you can measure um, this weakness by combining um, the statistics of, um, of different um, measurements. And when you reconstruct this quantity, that, get, that will tell you whether it's, um, it's um, causally separable or not, when you reconstruct this, then you really need to, uh, to make sure that you're measuring the right things. So you, you need to measure these device dependent uh, probabilities. So then the conclusion uh, that, you, that you draw from this, to, to, to draw the conclusion, you need to make sure that your devices are doing what you, what you want them to do. Um, so now on the other side, there's the device independent approach, which is, uh, based on this idea of um, causal correlations. Well, any causally separable process matrix will generate a causal correlation. So, so if, if you generate non-causal correlations, you verify that it's causally non-separable. And as I was saying, you can really have the, the same geometric approach as uh, for, um, for local correlations. You can build a causal polytope, the facets of which are causal inequalities. And whenever you, you're outside of the, of the um, causal polytop, then you violate one of these causal inequalities and you're sure that the, the correlation is, is non-causal. And therefore, that the, the process matrix that we, you are using is, um, is causally non-separable. So that was an example of a causal inequality, but uh, and, and of some, um, some process matrix correlations that, uh, that can violate it. Uh, I will go, go quickly on that. Just to, to, to emphasize that this is a device independent certification of causal non separability. Um, okay, so, so let's compare the, the two possible approaches the device dependent, device independent one. So that the first one is uh, universal in the sense that it can be used to, to certify the causal non separability of any uh, causally non separable process matrix. For any such such process matrix, you will be able to find a witness. The drawback is that um, if you want to measure it, you need uh, full trust in the devices that you are using. On the other hand, you have the, um, the device independent approach. We are we are testing causal inequalities. Um, no need to trust the devices, so you can use uh, black boxes. You can uh, buy the devices from, from someone else and you don't need to, to know what's inside. Um, the drawback is that it's not universal. And the thing is, uh, this, the quantum switch, as I mentioned, cannot uh, generate non-causal um, correlations. So you cannot violate a causal inequality with, uh, with the quantum switch. 
And in fact, all of the, um, the examples that we know how to, uh, to realize um, in the labs, in, the, in, in practice, are of the same kind and cannot violate causal inequalities. So all the examples that we, that we have that violate causal inequalities, we don't know what, what physical interpretation to, to give to them. Um, so it could be interesting to, to also look at, um, at a, a kind of um, middle scenario here. And so this is what I will tell you about in the, in the remaining of the, the talk. I'm, I'm interested in semi-device independent approaches to kind of relax the assumptions that we, the strong assumptions on the devices that we, we need with this approach, but still not go straight to this uh, device independent approach where um, using causal inequalities, we cannot certify the, the causal non separability of, uh, of the quantum switch, for instance. Um, and of course, as I, as I will um, also consider the quantum switch, I will also look at the, this uh, tripartite scenario. All right, so two approaches that I, that I want to mention in this uh, semi-device independent certification. So the, the first one is, uh, was due to Bavaresco et al, uh, colleagues from Vienna, uh, where essentially they are device dependent for some parties and device independent for others. And then the one that I will talk more about is the using trusted quantum inputs that uh, I've been working on with, uh, with colleagues uh, more recently. So the, the first one is um, considers a situation where some of the parties are treat, treated as, um, as uh, trusted devices. So we call them T and some as uh, just black boxes, the untrusted U devices. And this is in an keeping in mind this analogy with um, non-locality and, um, and entanglement, this is kind of uh, analogous to quantum steering or this uh, one-sided device independent um, approach. And so to, uh, to analyze here the, the quantum switch, for instance, um, a bit more uh, quantitatively. So we, we will look at the, um, the robustness of the quantum switch to white noise. So essentially we define this uh, noisy quantum switch defined as the quantum switch to which we add some, uh, some white noise. And we are looking at how robust it is. So how much white noise parameterized by R you can add before the quantum switch becomes causally separable. Okay. And so we know that in this um, device dependent uh, approach, the quantum switch is causally non-separable. So you can, uh, and you can still add a bit of noise so uh, that's the, uh, the amount of noise that you can add in this, in this uh, fully device dependent. So trusted, 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 TTT um, scenario. So it's, it's uh, these authors call this TTT non-causal. On the other extreme, if you don't trust any of the devices, so untrusted, 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 then all the correlations that you obtain are, are causal. Okay, so this is U, 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 causal, and you can not even, I mean, even, even the, um, the pure quantum switch is non-causal. So you, for sure you cannot introduce any noise, it, it's causal. So for sure you cannot introduce any, any noise. And then you can look at um, those intermediate cases. So for instance, in this, uh, in this case, you would trust Alice and Bob, um, Bob's operations, and you wouldn't trust the, the last operation here. So this is trusted, trusted for Alice and Bob and untrusted for, for um, the final party here. And this is still non-causal for this amount of noise. So we, we cannot quite introduce as much noise uh, as in this uh, fully device dependent scenario, but still we, we can introduce um, a bit of noise and, and still verify causal non-separability non of the switch. And you can look at um, all the, the other scenarios and you, you can check the, the amount of noise that you can, you can um, introduce. And here, what you see is that as soon as both Alice and Bob are un untrusted in this, so even if uh, F is uh, trusted in this UUU, UUT scenario, it becomes causal. Okay, so that, that was one possible approach to, um, to relax the, the assumptions on the devices for some of the parties. So another approach, um, which I will uh, present in, the, um, in this, um, this final, um, final five minutes, 
um, is uh, inspired by an, another approach to, uh, to quantum non-locality, which is uh, the so-called uh, Buscemi non-locality. It's uh, Bell scenarios with quantum inputs. So rem re remember the, the Bell scenario, we have this, um, this uh, test um, using, a, using a, an entangled state, and you're looking at, the, at the violating a, a Bell inequality. And you know that not all entangled states can violate a, a Bell inequality. And in uh, 2012, Shemi proposed to, to look at um, scenarios where instead of having classical inputs, X and Y, you would use quantum inputs. Okay, and the quantum inputs um why does it make a difference because you cannot um if you use um, um non-orthogonal states you cannot perfectly distinguish them and uh, as it turns out well this this helps to um, to verify and um the entanglement of, uh, of the quantum state that you that you started with and in fact any entangled state as well, as was proven by uh, Buscemi, any entangled entangled state can generate non-local correlations in this uh, scenario with trusted quantum inputs. Okay. Um, the way you, you can uh, analyze this situation is just put everything that is not trusted in a, in, a, in a box, and you're looking at the correlations. You can write the correlations as some operation performed on the, on the input uh, states. Okay. So that, that's an effective measurement that you're, that you're making on the, the two input states. And this is called the distributed measurement, distributed POVM. Distributed because there, there's one output for Alice, for A, and one for, for both. Okay. And so when, when you analyze this, this kind of scenario, well, you, if, if you use tomographically complete input states, then you can fully characterize those uh, POVM elements. And essentially, the, the idea is that the entanglement of the state gets transferred into the, these, um, these um, uh, POVM elements, and, by, and you can see it by looking at those, um, those elements for any, for any entangled state. All right, so let's do that, try to do that for, the, um, for our scenario with, um, in, the, in the causal uh, scenario. So let's replace the, the classical inputs by, uh, by uh, quantum inputs. And we can uh, write the, the correlations that we observe. So that will depend on the, on the operations A and B, the process matrix, and those input states. And you can re rewrite, you can put everything in the box again. And you can also write um, all these as some uh, effective measurement on the, the input um, um, quantum states here. Okay, so again, we have a, a distributed POVM. And once again, if you, if you use um, um, tomographically complete input states, then you can fully characterize these um, this, uh, POVM elements. So now we can just look at those elements. And we want to see if looking at those elements, we can, we can say something about the W. In particular, whether we can say that, the, that whether the W was uh, causally separable or not. So let's try to see which kind of, um, of uh, constraints we get. So if we start with, um, with a process matrix that is causally ordered, so compatible with A before B, well, it's easy to, to verify that the, the POVM that, that you get, the distributed POVM that you get, also satisfies some, uh, some non-signaling constraint. So clearly what you get out here analysis side cannot depend on the on the, the input state here okay so from some constraints on the w you get, you get some constraints on the distributed POVM here and of course now if you if you start with a causally separable w well you you, you get the same kind of decomposition for the distributed POVM here so it also has to be um, a convex mixture of a um, distributed POVM with a before p and one with B before A. And so we, we, we introduce um, this notion of causally separable distributed POVM. So before we were talking about um, causal separability for process matrices, and now we, we introduce the, the same notion for, for POVMs. And conversely, of course, if you, if you observe a causally non-separable POVM, then you can conclude 
that the W was causally non-separable. That's basically the, end, the idea of this, um, this uh, kind of certification. Um, and then when, you, when looking at the, at the, um, the DP of VMs, then you can construct causal witnesses as you do for, for process matrices. Now you can do it for, um, for distributed PRVMs that you can measure with, uh, when, by using different kind of, um, of uh, input states. Okay. So if you can um, test a causal witness for distributed PRVMs and you find that this distributed PRVM is causally non-separable, then this certifies the causal non-separability of the process matrix that you started with. Now the question is which causally non-separable process matrices can, can generate such um, causally non-separable DP of VMs. Um, is it the same as with uh, Shemi non-locality that any, any entangled state can be certified in, in this way? Well, it's not quite the same. So here we could show that this is the case for some causal um, bipartite W. So, so by causal here, I mean so, some causally non-separable by W that only generate causal correlations. So if you use um, classical inputs, you cannot uh, violate a causal inequality, but with this approach with the quantum inputs, then you can certify the, um, the causal non-separability. And more interestingly with the quantum switch, um, our basic example, well, we can do that for, um, for some amount of noise. Um, so, for, for the perfect quantum switch, we can now certify its causal non-separability for uh, using this approach with a uh, trusted quantum inputs in, instead of uh, classical inputs. And this is still robust to noise, but not quite as much as, um, as using uh, causal witnesses. Um, so, as I said, it, it's, um, it's not quite clear, in fact, which um, Ws can generate causally non-separable distributed PRVMs, and we are not sure, but we, we have a strong indications that it's not the case that all of them, all causally non-separable process matrices can generate such uh, DPOVMs. So it's uh, most likely that in contrast to Buscemi non-locality, we can still not certify all causally non-separable process matrices in this way. Um, well, that's a, that's a bit disappointing. So we, we try to, to, to understand what's missing in, in the proof to, to get to the same result as, uh, as for Buscemi. And we found out that if we impose some additional structure to the, um, the untrusted devices, so we, we still don't trust the, the devices, but we, we, stress, we trust that we are sending some bipartite state and one part is measured with the, the input system here. The other part is just transferred to the output system. So, this, this measurement on this uh, channel are treated as uh, black boxes, but we, we just um, trust the structure. And now we can recover the same um, um, conclusion as with uh, Buscemi non-locality in the bi bipartite case that any um, bipartite causally non-separable W can be certified in this uh, scenario, which we call measurement device and, and channel independent uh, scenario. Um, so we recover a kind of similar result as to Buscemi and uh, looking at the, um, at extending to, to multipartite scenarios, it's not, not obvious, but, um, but at least for the, for these, um, these, uh, TTU non-causal process matrices that, uh, that I mentioned before, we, we can also do that. And so that includes the, and the quantum switch. If you trust this, then you can, uh, you can certify its causal non separability in a more robust manner. Um, very quickly, how to, to go beyond this? Well, in the case of non-locality, the, there's a trick that was uh, proposed, which is uh, using self-testing to extend the scenario and then extend it to a fully device independent scenario. So that's a, a quite promising idea, I believe, and we're we are actually um, working on this. Uh, so it seems that it can be adapted to the, the causal scenario. And uh, yeah, we're we are working on this. So I think I'm out of my time. So I will just leave this, um, this uh, slide here. And thank you for, for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. OK, thank you. Thank you for quickly wrapping it up. We are now open for questions. Please unmute yourself and ask. 
Yeah, Manik. Yeah, I see nice talk. This is Manik. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Manik. Yeah, can you just uh, what is distributed POVM? Can you just uh, go? That? Yeah, that that was a bit quick, I guess. Um, so that that's uh, that's essentially a, a POVM, which gives you two outputs, A and B. And you say that one output is given to uh, to Alice and one is given to Bob. Okay, so so you identify an output to Alice and, and one to Bob. Okay. okay. And, what and, is and the then so you have a, a bipartite structure, and then you can analyze whether the, this uh, DPOVM, distributed POVM, is a signaling or not, and, and so on. Yeah. And what is the next part? Next part is what additional structure you have imposed to get this Bushimi kind of. Ah. Um, that's the, the the structure. So inside those black boxes, so so far I, I was just treating these as black boxes that um, that were um, receiving some uh, some quantum inputs, and now I only trust that the quantum input input is um, is kind of bipartite, and that the the black box implements a measurement and one party of the quantum input, and just sends through uh, through any channel the, in the other part. So how so it's it's really just about the the structure that I have one channel here and one measurement here. Yeah, but in earlier scenario, how how I am understanding, you see, Bushimi's case, the fundamental mm -hmm. thing is this Hanbenak theory, this separation, this uh, this causal inseparability that using this you know I means non-orthogonal quantum state, he tried to replace mm -hmm. that that from that he constructed this uh, measurement yes. device independence. Yes. So now in this scenario also causally uh, non-separable uh, causally separable process that 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 that, that, is, that is a convex set. So so similar uh, Hanbenak theorem theorem is there. So some similar witness is always exist there. So I'm just thinking. yeah. So so once once you have um once you manage to uh, to generate a causally non-separable distributed POVM. Then indeed, uh, there will exist um, a witness, and this is again the uh, high, um, hyperplane separating uh, theorem. Yes. So the, the thing is, it's not for sure that you will be able to construct a causally non-separable POVM from a causally non-separable process matrix. So here, you, you need okay. to find uh, the right quantum inputs and, um, and, the, and the right measurements to do that. In, in the case of Buscemi non-locality, there, there's, a, there's a simple recipe that works for, for every state. And here, that's not the case. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Or, okay. or we didn't find um, the simple uh, universal recipe. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. yeah. So we can unmute and ask questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, Cyril. Thanks for this nice talk. Hi. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one is regarding uh, this noise robust um, uh, analysis for this uh, quantum switch. Uh, I mean, when you introduce this white noise, how do you interpret it physically? Like, um, so do, um, does it does it actually maps to just put, just uh, making the control noisy, or you need to also? Uh, no, mean, so not, how, no, it's, yeah. it's not quite just acting on the control. So th okay. this yeah. identity component is just. Um, all the, all the um, all the parties just receive receive some uh, fully mixed state, uh -huh. um, and you just discard whatever comes out. That's okay. Nice. And I, I, for, for simplicity, I just assume that I, I mix the the quantum switch with this kind of a of noise with a single parameter. So you, you could also um, consider just depolarizing the the control qubit, uh -huh. or this kind of thing, and that will give you some uh, different uh, noise model. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So it is it is already included in this analysis, or um, so, so the, this analysis think, that I that I did is only for this kind of noise. Right, right. Okay, 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 okay. And you can um, extend it to, to any any other kind of noise. Sure, yes. sure, sure. Yes. Uh, so the next um, question is uh, regarding this um, Bushemi like uh, theorem. Mm -hmm. So you um, can I go to this slide? And your conjecture and your conjecture. 
Yes. So uh, you conjecture that not all uh, causally non-separable uh, process matrix can generate uh, this uh, causally non-separable DPOVMs. So my question is, uh, if you look at the set of those causally non-separable process matrices, which are purifiable, do they give always give uh, these causally non-separable DPOVMs? Um, well, no, I don't believe so. Uh, well, the, isn't the the noisy quantum switch is an example? So oh, if okay, if you okay. if you introduce enough noise, ah, okay, 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 and we will not be able. At least we didn't find a way to um, to uh, to certify uh, the noisy quantum switch beyond a, a certain level with this approach. While we know that it's it's still purifiable, right, right, right. and it can, yes. um, yeah, and it's yes, yes, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Thanks, thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. So thank you, Soom. And thank you, Cyril, for a very nice talk, illuminating talk. Thank you very oh, sir, much. Can I ask yeah. a very quick question? Uh, this money, can I ask a very quick question? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Well, Cyril, another question yeah. is not on your work. Just have you uh, seen this work by uh, Short, Anthony J. Short and Tom? Uh, yes. Any comment on that work? This basic um, theory cannot violate the cause of anything. Yeah. Um, well, so so they consider um, a, a model for quantum theory, and uh, based on this model, they, they show that uh, they cannot get any violation of um, of a causal inequality. And th this is actually a, a result quite similar to to what we what we had. I, I, I only mentioned, well, I didn't mention it, but we, we we can consider more general more general processes than uh, than quantum circuits. That we can still build in the lab, and um, I mean, still build means so far. But, 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 but yes, yes. One can say yes. that okay, OCB OCB cannot be means far from that. One cannot means that possibility it cannot be. Yes. So they, they, they describe a, a model which they, they call it quantum theory, but I, I think that's a, that's a bit abusive to to call it this Mis way. A little bit misleading, Where, particularly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and. Um, and according to their model, which uh, which involves some uh, some operations that you can uh, realize indeed with uh, quantum theory, all the processes that you can um, you can um, obtain um, will be causal in the sense that they they cannot violate causal inequalities. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So so it, it goes uh, a little bit beyond um, the um, the process matrix framework actually. So it, it's also a bit more general than this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so we thank all the three speakers, Asu, Manik, and Cyril. And now I hand over you know, to our organizers. Thanks again. again. So <clears throat> thanks to all and Prashant also for chairing this session. Thank you. Okay. We'll meet uh, at 16.10 possibly. Okay. Ramich Kotai, next. Solota Doseto. It's a schedule time. It will start at schedule time. Guda Katar introduced Kota Havana, organizer Niji. Navi our Gorbogar, organizer Kenter Kota ঠিক <laughs> 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 Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. <laughs>
So let us start our <coughs> post feedback session. Uh, in this session, there are two speakers. One is Professor Thomas Patarek, and another is <coughs> Dr. Fabio Del Santo. So, uh, first talk will be given by Professor uh, Thomas Patarek. He is a uh, faculty of mathematics, physics, and informatics in the Institute of Theoretical Physics and Astrophysics, University of Gdansk. And he seems to be very well known to the community because of his works in quantum information theory. Especially, he is an expert in non classical correlation and its applications. And in particular, I have seen students in India to work in some areas where his contribution is significant. And I request Professor Patrick uh, to start his talk. Thank you very much. Many thanks for this nice introduction. So am I, can I share my screen? Is that, no, I think no. I can. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so you, I guess you see my slides. So once again, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for this nice invitation. I'm really very honored to, to, to speak here. And I was asked by the organizers to say something interdisciplinary. And here we go. So my title is Entangling Life to External World. But what I'm really going to do is I'd like to describe you to biophysics experiments where people actively verify that subjects are alive or at least not dead, because you'll see that this, the, the two things perhaps are not always, uh, do not always mean the same. And at the same time argue for quantum entanglement. So maybe not that much quantum information today, but somehow a bit more out of the box, let's say. So these two experiments that I'm going to review are the following. So please confirm that you see my mouse also, or some pointers. Do you see my pointer? Yeah. Which is over here. Yeah, okay. So the first experiment is with bacteria that are coupled to light. And it has already been done a few years back by David Coles and, and colleagues. And the second experiment is by the team of Reiner Dumke, and, and, and I also contributed to this. It's with tardigrades, which are coupled to, to, uh, to superconducting qubits. And I actually will also tell you one more idea that, that will bridge these two, which has not been realized, and I tell you why it has not been realized. So I think this kind of talk, it cannot be, you know, it will never be complete without a slide on Schrodinger's cat. So let's have this done. And Schrodinger cat is often described as this kind of quantum mechanical animal that is simultaneously dead and alive. What we really mean is that you, it could be prepared in this kind of superposition, macroscopic superposition when it's dead plus alive. So whatever makes, makes this thing alive, all of the atoms are in, in in these two macroscopically distinct states and superposed. But the actual, so we're really far, as far as I, as far as I can tell, we as a community are really far from this sort of experiments. The actual Schrodinger's formulation is slightly different. It, it talks about the cat, but it also talks about the atom or some nucleus that gets, that emits some particles or, or some kind of radioactive decay. And then the hammer and you know all that, right? So the atom, when the atom is in, in say a zero state, which means it has decayed from some excited state, then the dots here mean that the, the hammer is triggered and it breaks this flask with poison and, and finally the cat is dead. And when the atom did not decay, the other thing happens and, and, um, and the cat is, is alive. So, we are also really far away from this sort of experiment, but the two, the two works that I will describe later, they are kind of slowly going in this direction. In this direction, these are little steps towards realizing this kind of goal, where where we have entanglement between some, say, microscopic or or a system that is unambiguously quantum. Say here it would be this decaying nucleus, and something macroscopic. And in the experiments, it will not be something that is so much biologically relevant, that something is dead or alive. There will be well-defined physical degrees of freedom within a living creature that will, be, that will be entangled where or not. I will show you different arguments with degrees of freedom that are outside of this living creature. So yeah, I think that's it. So let, let's go on. The Coles experiment is, is using living har light harvesting bacteria. These bacteria, they are collected from some deep waters. They have evolved, you have their image here on the left called A, Chlorobaculum tepidum, and they have evolved uh, in this cold and in these dark regions and developed huge antennas. So these guys are highly light sensitive. They can absorb individual photons and successfully use their energy for, for living to sustain their life. So what these guys have done, again, and so, so I think that really nice, I want to emphasize in this talk that this part where people actually argue that these animals are alive during the experiment, how do they do that? And in this experiment, there's kind of a nice idea that what they do 
they, these bacteria, they are kept in water. People have recorded their, exten their extension spectrum, so some sort of absorption, how do they absorb, and they highly absorb at 700, whatever, 60 about this. And also there is another peak here at 450, but really this one will be, will be of our main interest. I, I will show you later where does it come from. And at the same time, in this water solution, they have uh, trypan blue, which is some sort of a dye, so some, so a little bit of it, which, which is, which is a dye, and as you see, it it mainly uh, absorbs here in this about 600 nanometers region. So why why do they do this this way? Is that it turns out this is this this so-called cell viability stain that when the cell is dead, it will this this trypto uh, trip trypan, trypan or whatever, I don't know how to say it, say trypan, uh, since I'm Polish, it will, it can then penetrate into the cell, it binds to the, to the proteins, and then it, and, and then, and then you can see it shining a different color. And when the, when the cell is alive, then its membrane does not allow this trypan to, to be, to come in. And in this way, they, it shines a different color. So by looking at, at colors, so this is what they marked here. And I think it's essentially the blue stuff is, are, this, are these bacteria that are dead and the, and the green stuff are these bacteria that are, that are alive. You can, you can distinguish that. So in the final experiment, they actually argue that they don't see any, you know, they only see the green things. So that's, that's how they argue that these bacteria were alive during the experiment. And, they, and the experiment is, as I told you, these bacteria in water solution with, with this particular trypan are placed in a very small um, cavity. And we're shining essentially the, the, the authors, or the David Coles and colleagues, they shine light on this and observe that the light couples to the bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's, here's their data. So what, what they have is that what they observe is that this would be kind of the usual transmission, the black dots would be the transmission of the cavity in the absence of any medium, so or just water, let's say in the absence of bacteria. And now what they observe is that you have a splitting. And this splitting is, is precisely where you, where you kind of want it. It's, it's at this 760 60, uh, nanometers, which is, which is where the bacteria highly absorb. So it's in, it, this is being interpreted as, um, as some joint, as it's called polaritons, so some, some kind of virtual particles or so. So the, it, this is an interacting system of light and, and, and excitations combined together, right? Polaritons. And in the, in the, in the actual uh, intensity curves of this cavity, the transmission curves, you see then this two, two peaks, so the Transmission, the transmission peak of, in, of the cavity without bacteria is now with bacteria split into two. And that's what in quantum optics we would call vacuum Rabi splitting. And you can work out from, from the distance between these two peaks that actually this particular data set shows that we have, we have a strong coupling here between light and this antennas, or I'll show you in the next slide what exactly in this bacteria couples to light. So that's the data. And then you have, they also do it for other, for other cavity modes, for other sizes of the, of the cavity, and also observe some sort of splitting, but, but less. So the strong coupling is really over here on the left. So that's the data. Now, where is entanglement here? So one, so here's, here's a paper where people put forward a model in, in, which, in which you could, you could kind of and this, you, in which you could see some forms of entanglement. It, it's essentially, so it's due to Chiara Marletto and, and others and Radko Vedral published here. And essentially it points down to, to the quantized light strongly interacting with electric dipoles. And where are those dipoles? So this 760 peak that I showed you in, the, in, in, this, absorption spec, in this absorption spectrum, people have identified where exactly does it come from. And in this, in this bacteria, there are fluorosomes, which in turn inside them, there are those aggregates. These are these shapes over here, the green shapes of BCHL uh, hmm, aggregates. 
And inside them, there are they are those BCHL molecules, and it's known that these guys have an have a have an electric dipole and hasn't measured how much how much is it. So this is what couples to light this this electric dipoles of BCHL molecules, and they 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 transition the energy transition in these molecules matches this 760. So they now, as in a model, they take a collection of such say two level atoms with this particular transition frequency, do some theoretical steps. And in the end of the day, they, 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 go, they get into a model where you have quantized light and, this, and also a harmonic oscillator for these charges within the bacteria strongly coupled. So both, so dipole-dipole coupling and both A dagger plus A terms are here. And if you take this model, you know, it's not hard, especially with strong coupling, it's not that hard to, to show that its ground state is entangled and it's actually even more entangled the higher the, this, this coupling is. So it's presented as, as energy being the entanglement witness. So if you can argue that you're in the ground state, you should, you know, there's this kind of entanglement there. And here indeed, uh, we're talking about this optical transitions. So they are about hundred times uh, more energy energetic than the, than the room KT at room temperature. So this system from this optical perspective is in the ground state. But you can, you can, you know, and now, now, now let's, let's play a bit more, but you can, of course, you can question this by saying that, fair enough, but this conclusion about entanglement is based on the model used and not on the evidence only. The evidence here is, are the transmission curves of the cavity. So the question kind of appears, is it possible to model this particular uh, curves that have been observed, the transmission curves, with, without entanglement? And it turns out that actually this, this sort of discussion has been around in the optics community in the 80s. People were wondering, so they're, they're, this was already, so as you see, this paper is from 1990, but it really is a, uh, kind of uh, the final line to the whole discussion whether a vacuum Rabi splitting is the can be seen as the evidence for quantum for quantum effects, and what these guys show is that the answer is negative. So they can you can observe exactly the same splitting of the of the of exactly the same transmission curves. Look over here at this plot, right? So there is this is this is the resonance of the cavity without in this example atoms and here it is with atoms and the model here is purely classical based on some interference of 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 waves right and so this thing here this splitting is supposed to be exactly the same as this thing here and it really does right you could use that model to to explain this splitting that people observe here in this experiment and so essentially th this is uh, so it would be great to have some experiments where where, where these kind of explanations are excluded. And let me also say one more thing for the future is that in this, in this experiment with bacteria, the light used is, is, so you see that in the model, it's really based on the fact that it's a quantized light that's, that couples to, to the electric dipoles. And entanglement is between say, the number of photons in light and, and some excitations. Uh, whereas the actual lighting experiment is, is some white light and that, that, that's a bit hard to argue from this perspective for the quantum nature of it. The EM waves would just do the job. So I learned all this. That was, this is the end of part one. I learned about this experiment and this, all of these different explanations from Vladko Vedral around 2016 or 17 when he was giving a talk in Singapore. And then I, then, then I thought, that, hey, I think I know how to solve this problem. And you will see at, in a second that it's not really a solution, but still, I think it's an interesting idea worth, worth keeping in mind maybe for other purposes. And it has to do with mediators because this is one of my favorite topics is, is this kind of scenario where you have three objects, A, B, and C coupled in this way. So A does not interact with B, but interacts via mediator with, with B. So A interacts with C, B interacts with C. And in this setting, this scenario, one can prove that very generally, without really making some assumptions about what exactly is the physics of this mediator, that when you see entanglement gain between these particles A and B, then 
there has to be during the dynamics some form of quantum correlations and interestingly it's not entanglement at you know the first thing there are, there are two surprising aspects of this setup the first one is that when you look at it you might think that in order to entangle a and b you should be entangling c also that's not the case and this goes back to 2003 to the paper by toby qubit and others where they showed that you could you could also entangle a and b via separable states on c but nevertheless, there is some quantumness and it's in, in the so-called quantum discord. So there is some form of quantum correlations that is present also in non-entangled non states. And this is the relevant feature here. Once you, once you have this quantum discord, you can, you can entangle, right? Or you can reverse it. And you can say that once you see entanglement between A and B, there must have been discord and mass measured on C. There is one more subtlety, sub subtle thing which is that you have to be careful about the initial state. You have, to, you have to make sure that there is no entanglement in the initial state, because otherwise there are some tricky ways of, of, of entangling A and B, even when you keep on measuring C. That's exactly what has been done in this NMR experiment in Pune with, with, with Prof Mahesh. But in, so essentially the idea is, let's use this methodology to this bacterial bacteria experiment. Let's place bacteria in a role of, of mediator of entanglement between some light modes. So essentially, it's at first sight, it looks, it looks interesting because it's not that far from what, what these guys have already done. You have to have a cavity. Bacteria are in this cavity. They know how to place them there and so on. So now they used to drive it with, 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 I don't know with what exactly, some white light, but let's say white one mode. So now you have to make it, we have to make two modes that don't interact. So here in this setting is important that A does not directly interact with B, but this you could realize in many ways. One way, for example, that kind of the simplest that comes to mind is that you just take two orthogonally polarized lights with light modes. You know, these guys don't interact directly, but the dipole moment of this mole of this bacteria, of the molecules in the bacteria, it could be somewhere in between. So, so you could be coupling these two orthogonally polarized modes via, via this in-between dipole moment. That's one particular realization. But we and what we actually computed here, we wanted to simulate it to see if you can really get measurable entanglement in this setting with, with knowing all the parameters that I already showed you, this extension spectrum and all that. And in particular, what we didn't consider this orthogonal polarization, but we considered different frequency modes for this, for this cavity. So essentially we have a bunch of frequency modes for, so this is the model for the cavity. And the bacteria is this uh, BCHL molecules are actually modeled also by two harmonic oscillators because there were two extensions, extension peaks in the spectrum that I showed you at the beginning. So we really want to take all of this into account. We take strong coupling, so nothing is ignored here, no rotating wave approximation or so. And we also take the driving field. And also some decay. So we really try to do these simulations, you know, as complete as, as, as one can. This is together with Tanjung Kristanda, his contribution is, is really vital here. And Vladko and Mauro Paternostra and Chiara Marletto. So when you, when you do this model, this is what you obtain. First of all, turns out that just two light modes, which would be the first thing that comes to mind, are actually not great because they don't lead to steady state entanglement. They do; they are entangled at the, at the initial of at the at the very early in the evolution, but only for a few femtoseconds, and they don't lead to steady state entanglement. So that would be tricky to measure. You have to consider more modes, and turns out that four modes is something reasonable. Because, but, but here's the problem, right? So you see that if you, if you take four modes and you ask about entanglement between, between four cavity modes, you do get a little bit of it. It's the logarithmic negativity that is plotted here, but a really tiny number. So at least at that stage, when we were writing this, the state of the art in, in, the, in measuring logarithmic negativity was one over a hundred. So this thing is, one order of magnitude better than, than, than what people could measure, clearly challenging. And it's a bit a pity because actually you do have a lot of entanglement with bacteria, with this bacterial mode. So this one and two, Roman one and two are the bacterial modes and one, two, three, four Arabic are the light modes. 
And it turns out that actually light and, and these bacterial modes, they are entangled considerably. But when you trace out those, but when you get rid of these bacterial modes and you only look at light, and this is of course what would be user-friendly, it's the amount is tiny. At the end of the day, it's just a challenging experiment. So no one, so Vladko was talking to these people at Sheffield, whether would they would be interested in, in measuring this and uh, they weren't. So this is, it's, it's a challenging experiment. So here's my last part um, about, about the tardigrades. So, so I'd like to tell you about this one more experiment and where, where it's actually naturally coming if, you, if, you're, if you're coming from this perspective. That's why I started with the bacteria, just, just to show you where does it improve uh, kind of in this, in this little step towards entanglement with the living creature. So one of the issues with this, with this bacteria experiment that I already emphasized is that it uses the classical light. And so, so there's one system that is that you can explain with electromagnetic waves, and it's really difficult. It kind of opens the, it asks for, 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 for the classical models for these experiments. So, so essentially the basic idea that we had was that let's try to replace that and let's try to interact the animal with something that is unambiguously quantum. So no one, no one would question that, okay, this is a quantum object. And when you think about it, this is, so what, what could that be? A quantum bit. So no one, I think a quantum bit is, is the basic building block of a quantum computer and you can clearly realize it's superposed state and states and prove that quantum mechanics is necessarily needed to explain that. So this is a picture of a superconducting qubit in Reiner's lab. And I'll maybe tell you a few more words about how it works in the next slides. And essentially it, it requires, it's, it's an, it's an oscillator, it's an unharmonic oscillator that has the frequency gap of, of about a gigahertz. So if you want to, so this already shows you that you want, if you want to keep this thing coherent and, and, and see quantum effects, you have to have work at temperatures that in terms of frequency are smaller than that, say at least an order of magnitude. So, and this, this translates to 10 millikelvins. So that's about 200 megahertz. So these things operate at 10 millikelvins and at very low pressures, 10 to minus 12 millibar. And Reiner and his colleagues, then they can demonstrate that, that these devices have coherence times, say the lifetime of excited state T1 of a few microseconds. Let me spend the word because I guess might be some students here, what exactly this quantum, the superconducting qubit is. So, Essentially, you could think about it just as a, as a, as a quantum LC circuit with, with nonlinear inductance. So these are the pictures from this nice review. I, you're, you're invited to read it. And essentially it goes like this. So we probably, everybody knows from, from secondary school that LC circuit is an oscillator. And in practice, if you have it at room temperature, it's really hard not to have RLC circuit with, with some resistance, but when you cool down the materials down to uh, down to this say millikelvins, when they become super, they, when they where they become superconducting, it's a nice realization of a quantum harmonic oscillator. So it's an LC circuit and is an oscillator. You cool it down, you you get a quantum harmonic oscillator, and this is this is its well-known spectrum. All the energy levels are equally spaced. And now what they do is that the, the connections, say, between the capacitor plates are not just, just kind of small wires, but small wires separated, right, something like that, small wires separated by a, by a piece of um, dielectric. In this way, it turns out that this is so-called Josephson Josephson jump, junction. In this way, you make this oscillator unharmonic, and this is its, uh, its well, and the effect is that different states are separated by different energies. In this way, you can, you can now nicely address, that's, that's the basic idea. So you know, for a theoretician like me, I can say that, I guess in practice, it's not that simple. You can now nicely address two levels because they have, they have a specific frequency gap. And this is your qubit, this zero and one. So of course, then you ask, so once again, right? These things in practice, this, 
H bar omega zero or omega zero one is about a gigahertz, which translates into into the conditions where you're talking about ten millikelvin temperatures, ten to minus twelve pressure milli millibars. So, is there? And we were asking ourselves, is there an animal that can actually that has a chance of surviving near next to this operating superconducting qubit? And then it turns out that actually there is a really good candidate. And this is this is this amazing creature called a tardigrade. These are photos. These photos were made by Nadia Mobierk, our collaborator from Copenhagen. She's a she's an expert in these animals. And and what's what's the trick here, right? So how do they do that? Obviously, you know, none of us can do this. And there are it's really hard to find some in some sense living creature that that can survive 10 to minus 12 millibars and, and so on. So and 10 millikelvins. The trick here is that when the, when the conditions are somehow adverse, for example, this, this, these animals, they usually live in water. So if you, if you remove water or, or if the water freezes, what they do, they essentially pack their legs and they pack their organs. So normally they have this eight legs and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and four somewhere here and also on the other side, they would pack their organs and they, they compress in a sense, because this is what they do. They form this so-called tan state. And in this state, to us, to a physicist, they are essentially a piece of matter. You, you know, there is almost no metabolism going on. And we will show you, I'll show you in a second what, what they managed to survive in this, in Reiner's lab. And that really proves that there is no metabolism going on. So this is a, a, piece, of, a piece of matter, essentially. Back to physics. And amazingly, they, if you reintroduce them to water in and, uh, and normal pressures and so on, normal conditions, they can revive from this back to this active form. So these are the tardigrades. And uh, yeah, here I wrote uh, uh, after someone, I don't know whom, that tardigrade men would be unbeatable. Forget about Spider-Man or whatever other men. These, these guys are the toughest ever. So they have already been exposed to 100 millikelvin for a short for a short time. They were sent to to the low Earth orbit. Apparently, they are in a Tesla car and perhaps even on the moon because they were on some on some kind of spaceship to the moon and that crashed. And now they are perhaps are enjoying being on the moon. All right. So essentially, that's the idea, right? To have to take this experiment to take this these amazing animals in this form that is that is uh, in the tan form where they where, where they already were shown to survive a lot put them next to the superconducting qubit and see if we observe any coupling and then use that coupling to entangle to to somehow prepare a quantum entanglement so this is the picture right we have we have two layers of uh, substrate each of them has a superconducting qubit so this black uh, shapes are the capacitor plates of the qubit. The Josephson junction is somewhere in between them. The very same structure is below. So the upper one I will call qubit B. The lower one I, I shall call qubit A. And the tardigrade is placed here kind of next to the, to the Josephson junction. So this we have simulated what would be the best place where the electric field generated by this qubit is, is somehow considerable. Turns out that's, that's a good spot. And here, just for visualization, you have you have a photograph of the of the tardigrade in the experiment, but already the active form. Uh, and at the back, you have the superconducting qubit. So these are the these are the two plates of the capacitor. The experiment proceeds in three steps that I will now describe one by one. Step number one is a proof of the coupling between between the tan and the upper qubit, qubit B. So. It has been characterized uh, without a tardigrade first, and its frequency is, is this 3.271 gigahertz. The lower qubit has this frequency, and the, uh, the lifetime of, this, uh, of the excited state is six microseconds. Then in the subsequent cooldown, the tardigrade was placed on this, on this upper qubit, and the whole setup was, uh, was, was cooled down to this, to this 10 millikelvins. And it was observed that now the frequency of the upper qubit has lowered to 
3.263 gigahertz, so minus eight megahertz, whereas the frequency of the other of the other qubit is, is essentially unchanged. The coherence time uh, changed slightly, but it's still of the same of the same order of magnitude. So you could think that essentially the whole thing is the qubit and the tardigrade are isolated from the environment essentially just as well as the qubit alone. And uh, so this proves the coupling because now this combined system has a, has a different frequency. Note that we cannot measure the tardigrade independently here. So this is the combined system, a capacitor, inductance, Josephson junction, and the, and the tardigrade on top of this thing. But we have done some simulations. What, what one would expect from, from, a, from kind of uh, this shape of, of the tardigrade, so a tan shape, a cube, if it were composed with, with, with the usual molecules, with the permittivities that, that they usually have in there, they essentially are in this range from about five to 30. And you see that for about, so this would, from this simulation, you see that this minus eight megahertz corresponds to the permittivity of the tardigrade, of, the tardigrade uh, of about four. So the first step is this coupling. And now you can you can you can now again kind of follow the same strategy as what's, what has been done with bacteria. So first you could you could immediately jump and say, okay, let's try to build some some model, some very fundamental model with quantum mechanics about of this coupling. So you would assume in such a case that well, qubit is a qubit, so it has its its usual Hamiltonian, say sigma z. But the tardigrade is a bunch of electric dipoles, just as previously, which you model by harmonic oscillators. So this is this term. And this time, because this energy shift is so small, you, you, you rather deal with weak coupling, not strong coupling. So that would be, that would be your, your simplest James Cummings or Davis Cummings model, because now you have many oscillators. And if you, if you work out what are, what are the eigenstates of this model and what are, what are the corresponding energy gaps, Indeed, this energy, gaps between, the energy gap between the ground state and the first excited state is smaller, can be smaller than with, with just a qubit. And furthermore, there is, there is some entanglement here. So this time it's not in the ground state. The weak coupling makes the ground state being just a product state. So it's just a product of the ground state for each individual oscillators and the qubit. But the first excited state is somewhat entangled, right? So where you have the qubit in state one, then the oscillators are all the oscillators in state zero, superposed with the qubit in state zero and some kind of state of, of the oscillators where there is one excitation of on kind of like W, but the weights are different. So if you try if you buy this model, there is entanglement here already at this level, it's in the entangled state. And we know because this T1 time has been measured. It's three microseconds. It's pretty well isolated from environment, just as well as the qubit itself. That you know, this is it, right? There is some entanglement here in the in the entangled state, which is which is which in the excited state E, which is well isolated from environment. And again, as before, well, you can ask yourself, yeah, fair enough. But you conclude this by by considering this model. There is this modeling involved, right? Can you can you actually uh, sort out some other model, right, which would be compatible with this with this uh, frequency shift, which is which is not based on entanglement, which doesn't use entanglement. And here the answer is again yes. And it's not in the it's not it's not a discussion in 1980s, but the discussion kind of 200 years ago boils down. It, it goes back to the to the Faraday and his experiments on electricity. Essentially, he was the first one to, to measure the capacitance of a, of a capacitor where you put the electric into it. And essentially, you, again, maybe a bit for students, right? You can ask yourself this basic question that insulators, so it's clear, it has been observed, they don't observe, they, they don't um, conduct electricity. So why is that, right? Is this, is this because they don't have electric charges? That's a sim simple question that comes to mind, right? And Faraday answered that in a way because, so they actually do have electric charges. They have to do it because they modify the capacitance. So if you take a parallel plate capacitor and you put some charge plus Q on, on one side and minus Q on the other side, that's the formula for its capacitance. And what happens and what Faraday observed is that when you put a D-electric in between these plates, 
the capacitance increases. And how come? Well, it's essentially the story is that when you, you know, have you have some, maybe before this, right? You have some electric field that goes from, from the plus to minus in between this parallel plate. Now, this field induces the dipoles inside the material. And in the simplest case, you know, you'll get kind of the same dipoles all over the place so that they, the net, their net effect inside the, inside the material is zero, but there will be some induced charge at the surface here minus here plus. So essentially you will have a smaller electric field. And because of that, a smaller volume, a smaller voltage, small, smaller potential difference and bigger capacitance. So Faraday's story kind of applied to this is really simple, right? If your qubit is in state zero, you essentially don't have any dipoles because let's say there is no electric field. That's, that's that what I'm trying to write over here and note that because qubit is clearly a quantum system and you, you, you can't explain this classically, you really have to use this cat notation for at least for a qubit, right? So then I'm just writing this sort of cat for, for, the, for the dipoles within, the, within this D electric. So zero, no electric field, no dipoles. Now, when the qubit is in state one, it's, it's, it produces some electric field. There are induced dipoles and therefore the capacitance changes. And it's well known that essentially for LC circuits, the frequency is one over square root of LC. So C increases, omega decreases as observed. There is no entanglement here whatsoever. Ground state is just a product of, of, of qubit in state zero. Lack of dipoles, excited state is also a product. Qubit in state one, there are, there are dipoles in the dielectric. So, but this is not you know, the end of our story. We, because of this, essentially, to make some, some, some improvement on this, we have, we have a second step in our experiment. This is exactly why we have two superconducting qubits, the upper, the upper qubit and the lower qubit. And now what Reiner's team is, is doing, they are applying this C0 gate and, and Hadamard, so just some entangling gates uh, in order to entangle this coupled, coupled system of, of qubit B and the tardigrade with the lower qubit. And then they can also perform a tomography of this in, in this four, four dimensional space spanned by zero and one for, for the lower qubit and G and E, the combined states or the dressed states as if you wish of the, of the upper qubit. And this is I know, somehow, this is, what, this is the proof that you, that you have entanglement in at least in this four dimensional subspace. Uh, at this stage. And again, let's, let's do the same analysis, they, they will advocate, right? So if you take this first model that, that I told you where the where this tardigrade is, the quantum model where we model the, where we model the charges by quantum harmonic oscillators, you can work out this different, different entang entanglement across different cuts in, of this tripartite system. And in particular, you observe that, that within that model, the tardigrade itself is entangled with the two qubits. That's, I think, this red curve. And this is in terms of the coupling. So, but anyway, so for any non-zero coupling, you do have this entanglement, right? And we don't know what exactly the coupling is, but it's not zero because, because there is this frequency shift. And there is even some tripartite entanglement. That's the, that's the black curve. But now I think what's nice is that also in this kind of Faraday's model, let's say, so now I'm, I'm kind of jumping towards some ideal prediction. So, so note that the fidelity, of this, uh, the fidelity of this state is 85%. And of course that has to be taken into account, but just, just for the simplicity of explanation, right? Let me, let me now explain where, where would entanglement come from in this, in this Faraday's model, right? So the idea, ideally produced state would be zero E plus one G. And now E was, uh, the excited state had the dipoles in the in the in this tardigrade degrees of freedom, and the when the when the the ground state had not right. So essentially, this is it. I'm not saying that d and not d are orthogonal, right? But this is this is essentially where this tripartite entanglement would be after the second step. And so finally. You can ask yourself, yeah, fair enough, but can you still work out a model where, where the data of this experiment is explained uh, without any entanglement? 
And indeed, we were able to find one such a model. It's uh, so you can you can you can you can cook up at the following mathematical model, where where you have where the qubit is a qubit, and now for simplicity, let's model the this and uh, this um, d electric with also a qubit with two levels with the frequency gap which is bigger than the one for the qubit, and the coupling is sigma z sigma z. Maybe without going in, in, into the details of this picture, because I see I'm kind of 10 minutes before the end, and I still would like to say something, you can, you can work it out that here in this model, the energy gap between the two lowest states is indeed smaller when the, when the coupling is on than as compared to the situation where there was no coupling, as, as observed, right? And simultaneously, the state of the, of the tardigrade degrees of freedom is zero. So it's one and the same independently of whether the qubit is in state zero or state one. So there would be no entanglement and you would be still compatible with all the data that has been recorded. Maybe I wrote here magnetic analogy just, just to say that because imagine you have a magnet, right? It's similar to, it's something like this in this model that when you have a magnet and you try to flip it upside down, right? It will cost you some energy to do that. But it will cost you less energy if you do this in the presence of another magnet because, because now this guy produces if you, if you arrange it well, right, it will produce magnetic field that will help you in flipping the first one. And it's still always in one and the same state. So it's this kind of story here. But of course, as far as we know, the, the, the TAN is not an electric dipole per se, right, on, on its own, right? It's you rather, really the coupling to the qubit happens via the qubit's electric field. So in this two dimensional subspace, it is proportional to the sigma x Pauli matrix. And so if you consider this, this if, you, if you kind of put this additional information, right, then you can prove for a general class of Hamiltonians like this, where this is whatever Hamiltonian for the tardigrade you want, but you have sigma x here for the qubit, and again, whatever coupling Hamiltonian for the tardigrade, that the energy between the two lowest states of this system is always greater than omega q. So only with entanglement, the levels of this system can, can attract. And I think this, this, is, this is kind of a natural model because, because we know for that, that the coupling to the qubit happens via its electric field. Okay, so finally, the step three, all this, all this data that I have shown you was gathered, gathering it takes some time and it's actually 420 hours. It's two weeks and a half. So the tardigrade spent two weeks and a half at 10 millikelvins and this 10 to minus 12 millibars, after which we gently reintroduced it into room, room temperature and, and room conditions. And after about one hour, it woke up. Here it is. So that's the video of the, of the survival. So Kai Sheng, the, the, the first person on, on this author list called him Neil Warmstrong. So this is Neil Warmstrong, the first, the first dude to survive so, so for so long, so, so low temperatures and pressures and quantum entanglement. All right. So let me let me let me summarize. So what I was trying to convince you is that this we have realized uh, quantum entanglement, or at least you know we I have I have listed the this various conditions, right? Maybe under under which you this is this is this is the this is the reasonable conclusion. This is the entanglement with a complex form of life. And now this animal, as demonstrated here on this video, right? And mm, it is clearly alive after the experiment, right? Now, was it alive during the experiment? You can probably take different perspectives on this. And, and the, when we first started thinking about it, I was thinking that you know there should be some sort of continuity to life. If when you have an adult specimen that is alive today, it was alive also yesterday. Somehow dying and, and then being alive again doesn't happen in the actual world. But of course, this is you know subject to debate. The biologists actually, when we were when we were discussing these things with Nadia, for her this the, during the experiment, this the tan state is actually not alive. For her, the definition was of life means metabolism. 
And this experiment actually shows there has been some discussion of whether what exactly is the stem state. Biologists call this latent life, so the, the, the hidden life. How, the, how does it work? Like, is there some small metabolism still going on? So here you have situations where for two and a half weeks, you are at 10 millikelvins, which is, which is lower than, than any, any usual energies required for chemistry to go on. There is no chemistry going on here. There is no metabolism. So I guess for her, this animal is pretty much dead in the experiment. And there is also this evolutionary perspective that something that is capable of, of procreating, generating next generations is alive. So from this perspective, you know, this dude can clearly have next tardigrades and it, then it was alive. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on, on what exactly, what, what's interesting in this experiment is that I, I think it's really thought provoking and stimulating. And I hope, for example, these questions are, are really intriguing, right? What makes life, life? And yeah, so in any case, maybe one more comment on this because sometimes people ask me. Uh, I think that, it, so this living or not living thing, it depends on your perspective, right? That this, for example, these three different definitions, you know, you choose, choose the one you like. But it's definitely not an, uh, not dead and alive in Schrodinger's sense. It's really just dead or just alive. Uh, so note also that it's interesting here that the conclusions about the tardigrade are drawn by measuring the systems coupled to it. Of course, it would be great to measure the tardigrade independently. I think that would close any, any discussions here, whether, whether we have entanglement or not. But, but at present, this, is, this was just impossible. And I think I already said this, right? That it's, it's the longest ever exposure of an animal to such low temperatures and pressures and where, where the animal actually is able to survive them. And this really shows you that this late in life is ametabolic, which, which was some, some question, a topic of debate in, some, in biology. Okay, thanks a lot. I think I'm perfectly on time, so I shall stop here. A lot of thanks to Professor Patrick for his uh, new kind of talk that I have uh, ever heard. <laughs> so yeah. now it's open for uh, question. Question or comment? Yeah. Hi, Manik. Hey, Thomas. Thanks for nice talk. So uh, I'll ask to question that's not exactly related to your talk, but there is a recent work by uh, Scott Arnoldson and uh, Leon Leonard Suskind. They say hardness of detecting macroscopic superposition. About what, sir? Sorry? Uh, it's on, on the hardness of detecting macroscopic superposition. Oh. Hardness, okay. Okay. And they have said that Macroscopic superposition, the hardness is same as sending, I mean, bringing a dead, dead cat into a alive one. So they call it necromantic heart. So from your experiment, do you think then, means since now it is, I mean, superposition is in this animal behavior, so we can look for uh, macroscopic superposition kind of things? <sighs> So, you know, I, I think it, it is really, as, as I said on the slide about Schrodinger cat, I think we're really far away from this sort of macroscopic superpositions that Schrodinger had in mind. In this experiment over here with the tardigrade, we, we were actually simulating the electric field that penetrates this, this tardigrade according to, uh, to, this, to the ANSYS Maxwell simulation. And then it turns out that it's actually really just a small volume within this animal. That is that is coupled to the to the electric field. You do have a coupling because you know this is really the energy shift is observed. So clearly there is a coupling, but it's a but the dipoles are in a small volume of compared to the entire to the whole animal. So that's that's not that's definitely not a macroscopic superposition. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and I think it's really far away from to, to that one still. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. I don't know that paper, so I'm not sure what exactly they say. Yeah. Hi, Matik. Yeah, is there anyone? I think Matik was. Is now me? 
I think there is a question from Shivashish. Oh, Shivashish, sir. Okay. So, me or who? Oh, Professor Greenstein. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, the, I mean, the, it's always like that. I mean, you have a result from the experiments. And uh, obviously, there can be a quantum and classical experiment that explain the same result. The point is that you would like to have several experiments that somehow uh, support the idea from different perspectives. And this is the same thing as you said here, okay? I just want to comment about the Mos Tom Mosberg experiment because I was working with Tom Mosberg in the end of 80s and beginning of the 90s. And the first experiment that they did in the uh, Cavity QED evidently was showing vacuum rabbit splitting, which was in our language today, which would show the entanglement be because it was the same. We, we knew that we were working with the system, but the signal was, of course, only measuring the splitting and nothing else. If they could done the additional uh, measurement at, the, at that time, they would have been able to demonstrate that there was entanglement there. In the other experiment, it was different. So this is what I'm saying, that one has to really push on trying to develop the method of validation, which are uh, looking at different things from different perspectives. And this is very important. Yeah, thanks a lot. That exactly. It's just so, a comment. Yeah, it's really important to somehow try to be, try, to build a loophole free, let's say. Uh, That's the most Oh yeah, as much as, as you know, trying to to close the loop, man, as many loopholes as you can, uh, the yeah. classic like loop explanations. Yeah, Thank so you. really, this is just the first step, right? I really, I think all of our co-authors uh, agree that the, uh, yeah, it's just a really small step for towards this entanglement with between living and something external. Okay, I I will now read the question by Sibashish. Why do we need to keep temperatures small to get effect of having entanglement, quantum fluctuations? Yeah, typically, typically the decoherence, right? So you would, it will, the coherence will just spread to environment and you won't see it. Even the qubit will decohere. You may wish to have a look at something. Yeah, thanks. So I think there is no more question. So. Let us thank Professor Patrick for his beautiful talk and uh, different kind of topics that he has selected. So let us move to uh, uh, Dr. Fabio Del Santo. Yeah. Uh, he's from Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, maybe he's He's a student of Professor Wig, uh, Bruckner, uh, who has done a lot of works on this uh, indefinite causal order. So, so uh, I request uh, Santo to start his talk. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for this kind invitation and for the nice introduction. Uh, I hope, can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah we see. Good, good. Thanks very much. All right. So today I'm gonna I'm gonna talk uh, about the work that I'm conducting is a is a whole research program that I'm conducting with uh, uh, Nicolas Gisan at the University of Geneva, and our idea here is to uh, sorry second let me hide this uh, how do we hide this okay I don't well, let's keep it like that. Anyways, uh, the, the idea here is to explore um, the possibility of having fundamental indeterminism in our physical theories, not only where one is, is uh, uh, more, more inclined to look for it, namely in quantum mechanics, but also going back to classical theories and see whether in, uh, fundamental indeterminism is a possibility there. So uh, let me start by what is determinism. Determinism was, uh, came about uh, uh, through the regularities that were found in physical theories, uh, the great success of the application of Newton's laws to the solar system, for instance. And in the following, in the following years and centuries, it, it became more and more accepted the idea that our physical laws are uh, mapping one-to-one -one, uh, states in that time evolution, so that there is a unique solution. This comes directly from the from the theory of uh, 
uh, ordinary uh, differential differential equations uh, that that have a, a unique continuation in in the time evolution. So uh, it was first formulated by um, by Laplace. So Pierre Simon Laplace says the following that the, his famous demon, as it was, as it were. So if there was an intelligence knowing all the forces acting in nature at any given instant, as well as the momentary position of all things in the universe, we would be able to comprehend in one single formula the motion of the largest bodies as well as the lightest atoms in the world, uh, provided that this, this intellect were sufficiently powerful to subject all data to analysis. To it, nothing would be uncertain. The future as well as the past would be present to its eyes. So this is really the concept of traditional determinism. Um, this concept was already slightly challenged in the first, so this is a not very well known uh, uh, historical fact that as everybody knows, uh, uh, probabilities came about in our physical theories uh, through statistical mechanics in the, in the late 19th century. Um, and some of the of the founders of, of uh, statistical mechanics, uh, uh, first and foremost, Ludwig Boltzmann, started questioning the fact that perhaps it is uh, actual actual uh, randomness that is governing uh, the fundamental motion of particles, and determinism is just something that we saw at certain scales. So. Um, yeah, he says, Boltzmann himself says that the fundamental equation for the motion of individual molecules will turn out to be only approximate formulas which give average values. Uh, at the same time, so this is, has been called the Vienna determinism because it, it was uh, something that was here in, in Vienna. Uh, was a, uh, it, it was a quite widespread for some period here in Vienna. So another very influential Viennese physicist, Franz Exner, went so far as saying that everything that happens in nature is the result of random events. And then only when the number of, of the event uh, is big, one can consider a low, a low deterministic, but in the, in the infinitely small, you have random phenomena. And this was a completely independent of quantum theory. So you see this, this quotation is from 1909, but it's actually uh, since the end of the, uh, 1890s that uh, this was uh, put forward. And Schrodinger himself, who was considered a champion of, of determinism, who wanted to restore uh, re real realism and determinism in, in our classical, in our uh, in quantum mechanics, so coming back to classical concepts, actually he says that as a, as a pupil of Franz Exner, he was in intimate terms with the idea that probably not microscopic lawfulness, but perhaps absolute accident forms the foundation of our physics. Okay, but besides this small uh, uh, historical parenthesis, where indeterminism really came uh, to be taken seriously in the physics community was with the advent of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics, first of all, introduced the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, this fundamental property that in, in phase space, you don't have any more single mathematical points that represent a state, but you have a, a fundamental uh, limitation of the, of the smallest volume that you can have, which is given in terms of, uh, of h bar. So two, two pi h bar for each degree of freedom, um, which of course means that you, you can have you cannot have a fully determined state, even if you have a fully determined evolution, you will never be able to 100% to map one to one a state at certain time to, to a state at the next time. And moreover, in more, more recently, in the 60s, Bell's theorem put even more weight on this fact of indeterminism because while Heisenberg uncertainty principle can be explained with uh, some some hidden local models, some some um, variables that we were not able to complement the theory with. Bell's theorem tells us that if we want to uphold a very intuitive concept of locality, then 
even one complements with these additional variables, one cannot restore the standard concept of determinism. Good. Um, let me let me uh, do two small remarks to clarify what I mean here by indeterminism. So indeterminism should be taken here as a sufficient condition. So it doesn't mean that uh, that we we are not able. So every time every time I take a ball and I let and I and I leave it fall, it always falls on the same on the same direction towards the towards the the mass. The center of mass of the earth okay so there is a regularity i can predict this with probability one this doesn't mean that indeterminism is completely ruled out it means so for me indeterminism here means that there exists at least one event or some class of events that are not fully determined the fact that some are fully determined is completely compatible with this idea of indeterministic laws second remark is that through the the Bell's inequalities, uh, indeterminism is all or nothing. So if one has at least one bit of non-predetermined information, one can use this to feed it into a Bell's inequalities as an input. And Bell's inequalities with, with uh, arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary large number of outcomes can enlarge the amount of bits that I have, do not have predetermined values. So Bell's Bell's tests performing entangled states can be thought as, as machines that multiply indeterminism. So one, once one has a, a bit of indeterminism, can arbitrarily decide through Bell's theorem to, to generate more. All right, but now let me go back to classical theory. So this is somehow the, the sketch of our research plan here. So we know that, let's look first at the right, at the right hand side of this, of this table. We know that in quantum mechanics, uh, we have uh, we have a state living in a in a Hilbert space, and and the measurement postulate that introduces this kind of uh, probabilistic indeterminism through the Born rule. We know, however, that the theory can be complemented with additional hidden variables, and for instance, Bohm's theory. So. Through the through the addition of the initial position of particles, one can retrieve a certain uh, to a certain extent the concept of determinism. So you have different interpretations of quantum mechanics that complementing with hidden variables reintroduce determinism in the theory. On the other hand, in classical theory, we always take for granted that all the variables, in particular the initial conditions of equation, take values in the real numbers. And through Newton's equation, you have, uh, as I said already, uh, a deterministic evolution of states. Now, our idea is what, what lies here? Can we find alternative? So have we been so far always blinded by historical facts that it was always assumed that uncontroversially classical theory is deterministic? Or can we find, in the same way of quantum mechanics, alternative interpretations that render uh, classical theory non-deterministic. Uh, our our first uh, um, so our departing point is the following. We noticed that this unwarranted and quite strong assumption in classical physics, which is that the fact that there exists of any instant of time an actual value of physical quantities that has infinite predetermined digits in the form of a real number. So a real number comes with the infinite already determined digits. Uh, I should mention that uh, these real numbers, so all but uh, a measure zero subset of real numbers, so almost all in a mathematical sense real numbers, are non-computable. So they're, they cannot be compressed into an algorithm that has uh, uh, finite bits but it's, they really have uh, uh, infinite Kolmogorov complexity, which means that they really contain, genuinely contain infinite information. So to get the, the standard interpretation, as I call it, of classical physics, one has to assume that at every point of the, of the phase space, there is a, uh, accumulation of infinite amount of information. 
what we have tried to do is to relax this principle. So trying to avoid the infinities in physics, and in particular to avoid uh, an infinite uh, in density of information for physical variables. So we, we have substituted this principle of infinite precision with the principle of finiteness of information density. So finite volumes of space, finite volume also of phase space, can only contain a finite amount of information. In this way, if you can follow my comparison with the class with the quantum physics, in the same way as Bohmian mechanics is a hidden variable completion of the theory, what we're doing is uh, uh, removing the hidden variable from the classical theory that are these infinite, uh, these objects containing infinite information, namely the real numbers. So what we postulate here is that initial conditions are not real numbers. And the existence of infinite predeterminate digits of initial condition is regarded here as a hidden variable. So one, one can, in the, in the words of Gizan in this work that, that pioneered this research line, one can say that one could add supplementary variables to alternative classical mechanics in order to restore determinism. It suffices to add the mathematical real numbers and you could get you get back to the standard to the standard theory. Now, what happens when you remove this hidden variable real number? You have to substitute it with something else. So we have to redefine some mathematical objects that would be used instead of real numbers, which we've called finite information quantities or fix. So these are physical quantities are not anymore do not take any more values in the real numbers, but actually. Uh, they take values in, in uh, an ordered list of propensities, which is objective tendencies or objective probabilities to realize a certain digit. So you have to imagine now that each digit of a, of a physical variable, say the length of a ruler, is not anymore the collection of all its predetermined digits, but it's the collection of the objective probabilities associated to each uh, digit that one can possibly measure. And upon measurement, one will find one of the possible outcomes that are all possible in the same sense of, uh, of the outcome, in the same sense as one can think of the outcomes of a quantum measurement can all be possible. Um, so a propensity is a, is a rational number, so it does not contain infinite information between zero and one, and it defines a measure function that quantifies the likelihood or the disposition of a binary digit to take the value one. So if the propensity is one, one gets for sure the value one in a binary expansion. If the propensity is zero, one gets for sure the value zero. If the propensity is one half, for instance, one has one half probability of finding uh, the value one upon measurement uh, and the same one half probability of finding the value zero and all the intermediate levels. So a fig, finite information quantity, is an infinite ordered string of propensities such that, however, the total amount of information is finite. So if one sums over all the, the um, Shannon entropy, for instance, any measure of any reasonable measure of information that one can have of this string, one should find that its information content is always finite, this by definition. In this way, we have turned classical physics into a fundamental indeterministic, uh, indeterministic theory in the same way as quantum mechanics, in the following sense. We started with this uh, strong assumption of infinite precision that everybody has wallowed for, for centuries, that you have a mathematical single point in phase space defining the state of a system imposing reasonable condition on not having an infinite amount of information in a finite volume, it means that this, this point here must explode into some finite volume. The finite volume, together with the existence of chaotic systems, means that if one takes a, any ar arbitrarily small but finite uh, uncertainty, so indeterminacy of the initial state, this can grow unboundedly. So 
Of course, you have your Liouville's theorem that tells you that this uh, that this thing uh, is um, remains constant. But of course, in the same way of quantum mechanics, you can stretch it in any direction uh, arbitrarily. And I, rem I remind you that in quantum physics is exactly the same. So the only thing that quantum physics has better than than these theories that it it has a, a, a well quantified minimal volume, whereas here we only impose the volume is dynamical. So these these figs evolve in, these figs evolve in time, and so this volume can change. It can get arbitrarily small, but with the constraint that the, uh, it must be always finite. And this is our alternative. Uh, classical physics. Um, one first thing I would like to mention is that um, this seems to, to introduce also in classical physics a kind of measurement problem because as I told you propensities uh, are, are here what is the so the real state of, of physics is given by these objective probabilities by these propensities in the same way that, that they are encoded into into the the, um, the quantum state in a Hilbert space, although I mean here you here you have directed probability and there you have this the square amplitude, so you have probability amplitudes. So in this theory you do not you do not have uh, of course uh, interference, but still you have uh, some digits. Most of the digits are not predetermined, but only determined through an, an intrinsic probability. What happens if I force the, the, the object to, to, to give me a result? So what happens if I measure with a higher precision? It seems like I'm imposing one digit to become either zero or one, because when once I measure, we assume that you have a certain stability, that you can remeasure the same digit more than once, that people me measuring the same, the same object will find the same results, and that you have a precision in probability. You can measure with more digits of, of uh, uh, precision, which means that in this indeterministic theory, you have a kind of measurement problem. So it's not clear what's the mechanism, what is when, how, and under what circumstances a potential single outcome is, is realized out of its potential ones in the same sense of the classic, of the quantum measurement problem. So it seems that you're imposing by measuring with a with a measure of coupling the measurement apparatus to the system you want to measure, depending on how precise is your apparatus, apparatus, you you are kind of forcing the result out of the probability to reveal one single outcome, and this is exactly the same that happens in the standard quantum measurement problem. Um, let me mention also another another line of research that is pursued mostly by by Nicolas Gisan himself, which is um, can this be a problem of mathematical language? So, can this be that we have always used uh, um, the wrong tool to describe physics? So, is it possible that it was it was simply using um, so the the concept of real numbers? had a bit of an historical de um, debate. So it was Hilbert who imposed this uh, kind of platonistic mathematics. And there was the alternative that Brouwer uh, put forward by proposing uh, the in intuitionistic mathematics. So since Fix rely on the concept of a creative time, as I told you, so time actually passes while these, uh, these um, digits in internal property of the digits are updates updated um, in standard mathematics instead is platonistic all mathema all mathematical entities are all are all given at once they avoid the concept of time you have a real number and that's it so it, it it's given at once with all its numbers so Jusan says the state of affair might well be due to the inability of standard mathematics to speak of indeterminism. It's an ability to present as a word view in which new information is created as time passes. And the alternative is to use this intuitionist in mathematics in which at any instant of time, only finite sequences are determined. And you have uh, an intrinsic time for mathematics that constructs 
the mathematical entities as this in, in internal time passes. So this has several consequences. For instance, you don't have the law of excluded middle anymore because you don't have fully determined closed intervals, for instance. Okay. Uh, so far for the first part of this, uh, um, of this uh, alternative uh, classical mechanics, I will pass to the second part of our research, which was applying these concepts of, to relativity. Uh, this was triggered through many discussions because people are okay, are quite uh, quite okay with thinking of uh, classical physics that has uh, that has time as a as a fundamental concept. It has, it has this absolute time that is passing, so they have no real problems in thinking of something that evolves with an internal clock that in the indeterministically, but but in a, in a fundamental in fundamental time steps, something that becomes actualized at some point. But then people are asking, okay, but what do you make out of, of relativity? Because relativity is given to time a completely different value. And so we have studied this problem of indeterminism, compatibility between indeterminism and special relativity, as I will show in a moment. Um, a bit of motivation for, for why we would like to have indeterminism in relativity in the same sense we have done so far. So let me repeat one more time. We had the Newtonian mechanics with its infinite precision that I told you will lead to, to determinism. Now, if you remove this infinite precision and you accept the principle of finiteness of information density, we end, up, we end back in our alternative indeterministic classical mechanics, which is indeterministic. Now, on the other hand, in Newtonian mechanics still, the interaction of particles is only described by potential energy. That is a function only of the relative position of the interacting particles. So you have, you have, as Newton was well aware, an infinite speed of propagation of Newtonian, of Newtonian theory. What happens is, is that if, if you impose the principle of finiteness of information, then having finite volumes and moving them in space would necessarily lead to the fact that the amount of information exchange in time is finite. So impo just imposing the principle of finite information density imposes that the finite speed of propagation of information is also finite. And if one adds to this the fact that the laws of physics should look all the same, in all reference frames, so the principle of relativity, one can directly derive the theory of special relativity. So this is not a formal proof that you, you need still some assumptions, but this is a hint that if one upholds the principle of information density, this hints at the fact that physics should be at the same time non-deterministic and relativistic. And the question now is, are these two concepts compatible? So the standard block universe picture would say no, because the spa space and time in this, in this uh, Minkowski picture are simply two dimensions put on equal footing on this geometrical constructed space. Time is just a label for a dot within this big volume, and there is no, no fully defined past and future. It's only relative to light cones, to light rays, and, and time just gives you the label where to find something inside this cube. That's how it's called the block universe. It's this frozen block and there is no actual evolving time. So what I would like to show is to rebut this idea that you cannot have a, a, an infinite, you cannot have um, an indeterminate, fully fundamental indeterminism compatible with special relativity. To do so, we introduce the concept of true random number generators. So you can think of it as an abstract device that out outputs generally random bits. So before each bit is output, its value is not only unknown, but actually it has no determined value. So it's a non-ontological indeterminism. Also, notice that this, 
own indeterminacy can be seen as a lack of truth value. So if you take a proposition such that the value of a certain bit j at time t is zero, so is output at time t and becomes zero, has a definite truth value, either, either true or false, only after it is output by the random generator. It was ontologically indeterminate before. Therefore, there is a third truth value, which is neither true nor false, but is indeterminate. So this is the, a propositional way of formulating indeterminate. Now, I will, I will follow this example by uh, Rijek uh, uh, and Putnam, independently put forward by them in the 60s, which aims at showing that one cannot have indeterminism in special relativity. And Smalling called this the example that illustrates the power of the black universe picture. All right. So you start with uh, um, an observer, an inertial observer, Alice, which at a certain time, say 1 p.m., outputs, she has a true random number generator that outputs a bit A equals zero. So at this time, this event, this little explosion here is the event of creation of this bit. So from, from the truth value indeterminate, it becomes determinate equal zero. Now consider a second observer at rest with respect to Alice. And in, in, in space-like separations, you see. And what they say is that since they are at rest, they kind of share a common reality. I mean, they, this could be to, this is independent of special relativity. So B can also state that A equals zero is determinate. They they have this plane of simultaneity where things are, have happened at the same time in their shared reference frame. Now consider a third moving uh, inertial observer who is moving with respect to V with respect to Alice and Bob. So this guy is, is going away from here. And imagine that at, at this time, when uh, is 1 p.m. in the reference frame of A, Charlie happens to be exactly at the same position of B. So what happened? What happens is that Charlie, sorry, so what happens is that Charlie, being at the same position of Bob, can claim the same things that Bob can can claim. So if Bob is thinking, okay, I know that Alice is measuring, she finds a zero, so it's determinate for me as well. Charlie is here, I say, ah, if it's determinate for Bob, he can tell me it's determinate for me as well. But now there is a third, a fourth observer, Debbie, who is at, res at rest with Charlie, but since in their reference frame, the plane of simultaneity uh, looks tilted in this way, Debbie, is in the past light cone of Alice. And for Debbie, using the same argument, she would say that A0 is determinate because if it's determined for Charlie, she shares the same planes of simultaneity in the, in the rest frame. And so Debbie can tell that A0 is determinate, whereas by assumption, a true random number generator cannot be determined before it before it triggered. So this is, con this is considered a contradiction by Rijek and Putnam. And um, I would like to, to show that this is a, a, an unwarranted example. So it relies, may I, may I ask, there is somebody with the, with the mic on, I think if, if, if I listen a lot of, of noise. I don't know who it might be. Um, okay, so I was saying uh, um, this argument of, of Rijek and Padnam, um, let's spell out what are exactly the, the assumptions that they, that they are taking. So the first assumption is local reality. So any two observer that locally overlap, that they share a region of space-time, attribute the same truth value to the propositions, 
including the value indeterminate. And this, of course, is good because, I mean, it's operationally verifiable. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the other person so the two observers are, can actually communicate. And of course, this is true. But then they assume this kind of present reality. Any two distant observers at relative state can attribute the same truth value to proposition about locally present events. Present meaning that since they are at rest, they share this, uh, this uh, um, simultaneity plane. But this is clearly where the argument fails, in my opinion. So this is based on a misleading classical intuition. So what do we propose is that finiteness of maximum speed of propagation of any piece of information renders determinacy as well a relative property. So indeterminacy is a relative property as well. Let me show you this for an example. My claim is here that imagine to have again Alice and Bob, and each of them now has a true random number generator, uh, which will give a certain value to the bit um, A and B, respectively. So, as we said, by definition of random number generator, in the past light cone of Alice, A equals zero, the statement A equals zero, has truth value indeterminate, neither true nor false. At this particular time here, the random generator trigger and A equals zero becomes determinate. Say it becomes true. However, in the light cone of Bob, that no, does not overlap with the light cone of Alice, the future light cone of Alice, one should consider A equals zero an indeterminate, fundamentally indeterminate statement. Bob state, Bob's statement B equals zero becomes determinate instead in his in this future light cone, but in this other state, it should be considered non-determinate as well. It is only on the overlap of the two light cones that proposition, for instance, that combine with the binary operation, the two statements become determinate. So what we conclude is that uh, quant uh, sorry, uh, special relativity is completely um, compatible with fundamental randomness, with true indeterminism, as long as one takes indeterminism itself to be a relativistic quantity. So a relative property of um, relative to the light cones of when the event triggers. Uh, let, me, let me conclude with a, with a final example in, in, that including, includes quantum mechanics in the picture. Um, so consider the following example. Now we, starting with an entangled quantum state, the singlet state. And assume that Alice is measuring in um, is measuring the state in the x basis, and she finds the outcome zero. For her, the state will collapse, so it will be updated on this part of the of the original state. So the, this this part goes away, and she will update in her future light cone the state to be zero one along x. However, consider that now Bob, at the same time, in their shared reference frame, is choosing to do another measurement, for instance, along Y, so mutual and biased basis, and it will find that he also finds zero, therefore attributing this part of the original wave function to this region. When the two light cone meet, they will find that the final state is actually zero, zero. Our conclusion is that there's, therefore that Quantum states are also relative to different regions of space time if one considers um, quantum measurements in, um, for, for observers uh, in, uh, in space like separation. So, the regions of space time in which the global states are assigned by different, by distant space like separated observers are. So, Object, giving an objective state, even not thinking of the state as, an, as a subjective, if, 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 if it, even if one thinks of quantum state as objective properties, there are regions of space-time where the two states, the two global states, are may differ, but as long as they, when they meet, and this will become back to be operationally verifiable, they will always agree.
And this can be seen also with another example, taking a uh, take one particle in superposition of three location written in second quantization. If Alice and Bob both measure that they don't have the particle, they will update. So here Alice will, will factor out with a zero because she updates to didn't find the particle. And here Bob will factor out with a zero because he doesn't he didn't find the particle. And so there are two, two regions of space time where you have two attributions of states in their perspective reference frame. However, when they meet again in the in the future light cone, they will agree that the state is zero, zero, one. So I come to the conclusions. Classical physics, I've shown it admits an alternative deterministic, indeterministic interpretation. Uh, I've shown that under the assumption of infinite density uh, of information, physics should should comply, or I mean, we are hinted at, comply, uh, at thinking that it complies with indeterminism and relativity. Contrarily to what is, is thought for a long time, both in the physical and the philosophical literature, this can be made com these two concepts can be made compatible if one takes uh, determinacy and indeterminacy as relational properties and these different regions of space time may two different regions of space time may pertain different probabilities propensities and also quantum states thanks very much Thank Dr. Santo for his beautiful talk, and also in the in this session, both the talks were uh, very different kind. Uh, so now it's open, and now the session is open for uh, question and comment. So, Professor uh, Leonstein, coming. Yeah. I try to open this. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you very much, Flavio, for a very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to comment about is not related to what you have been doing, but still it's an important aspect. Um, in the um, classical determinist uh, of Laplace or anybody else, uh, what you assume is that if you know the initial conditions, which is the positions and velocities, and if you know the forces, then you can predict the future or even the past. But mathematically, this requires certain conditions. And the condition is, of course, uh, roughly speaking, that the forces cannot fluctuate, cannot vary too strongly. This is a Lifshitz condition in the standard way that the va variation or, or of the forces is somehow limited by the, uh, by the dependence on the positions. And this thing has been actually discussed if you don't have this assumption, then the solution of the second order differential equations of the type of Newton is not unique. It doesn't have to be unique. And this has been discussed in the literature on classical um, physics, uh, classical mechanics and classical um, hydrodynamics in particular, since the 19th century. Buzinesque is one of the pioneers and many others. In the contemporary theory of actually turbulence by my unfortunately late friend who died a few weeks ago, Krzysztof Gawenski, is based on this fact that you don't have this lifted condition and therefore in the hydrodynamics, in the turbulence, you don't have really single particle trajectories. You cannot define them really because there is no this kind of thing. So. Uh, there is this other, so to say, indeterminism in classical physics, which is very important. And in fact, in the philosophy, I, I have sent you on the chat the review on randomness in quantum mechanics, in which we talk also about randomness in classical mechanics. There are some very simple examples like the so-called cathedral model in which mm -hmm. you have a, potential like one of uh, inverse square root, you put the particle at the top and then the solution is not unique. Yeah. So you wanna have this classical mechanics, you have to add to it in a sense measurement theory or something like, uh, uh, like uh, quantum mechanical things. 
it's important to know that this thing is, of course, mathematical, but it's practical in a sense also. It's just a comment. And I recommend this review of ours because it's related to what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you very much. I, I, I quickly comment on this. Uh, and I, yeah, your, your comment is, is precious, totally. So there is another, of course, of course you have two main elements in, in mechanics, which is the initial conditions and the dynamics. Of course, what we have done here, what I've presented is we were tinkering with the initial conditions. So our assumption was to keep Absolutely. the same standard equation of motion in the in the um, Lipschitz condition and uh, removing uh, and putting all the indeterminacy back into the initial condition. Mm -hmm. But of course, a totally legit and explored, as you said, way of doing it is mm -hmm. to is to change a bit the dynamics or not not respect the fundamental assumption of of this. Uh, um, no, no. As I'm saying, you were talking about different things, but this yeah, is yeah, yeah. important no, no, aspect no, that people should totally. remember also. Totally. That totally. mechanics. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't have to fulfill to lift its condition in principle. Uh, absolutely. Thanks very much for the comment. It's very important. There are some more questions, I think. Uh, who is the next? Uh, Stanislav. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I had a comment slash question about uh, the modifications that are more of uh, Nicolas' work about uh, modifying the mathematics. Uh, don't you feel like you are entering the opening the Pandora's box because uh, uh, like uh, my question is in what sort of directions are you moving because when you are trying to ma modify the mathematics uh, most likely you will end up modifying uh, the mathematical logics and then after <coughs> mathematical logics you will have to define uh, you will have to modify the language because uh, most likely you cannot have uh, like precise act. What is a precise? Uh, what is an infinitely precise axiom? And then uh, this sort of problem propagates through the levels of description and the levels of logics and mathematics and all of the science. Do you see a uh, mm -hmm. end to it? Is there like a final assumption we can make and uh, build on top There's of it, or we have to create a theory without an assumptions or something like that? Uh, well, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by, by a fundamental assumption. So I, I think that that uh, constructive mathematics, in particular intuitionism, is a is a fully developed theory of mathematics that doesn't have. A, uh, it it has, of course, is not equivalent in every in every single form. There are theorems that that hold in standard mathematics that do not hold in. Um, in the intuitionistic mathematics, because for instance, as I told you, there is no law of excluded middle. So certain theorems, uh, um, there is currently a, a program of a mathematician and philosopher of mathematics, Carl Posey, uh, the University of Jerusalem, who's trying to, so he's an expert, he has a book on, on in mathematical intuitionism and he's trying to, to, to research with physicists, what would happen to the to the main theorems of physics, Gleason's theorem, for instance, uh, in, 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 in quantum mechanics, or Poincaré's uh, uh, um, theorem, <laughs> theorem in classical, in, in, uh, in standard Hamiltonian mechanics. So what would happen if you substitute classical mathematics with intuition in mathematics? Will, will this theorem still hold? Or not? So I, I, I don't have a concrete answer for you, but I think it's a worth is an interesting way of, of trying to pursue. Um, yeah, so I think I think the main thing should should the starting point would be really to understand what theorems of on which some of our mathematical um, physical theories oh, yeah. rely on can be can be proven in in within uh, uh, constructive mathematics. Ah, Arvin. Uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, thanks to you for a wonderful yeah. talk. Yeah. I, I have. Uh, oh, hello. Yeah, I have one. Um, uh, actually, uh, one question, and uh, I think it is related to what Professor Levenstein was talking. Uh, so the thing is that in the quantum mechanics, the indeterminism is uh, uh, arises as an empirical necessity. 
whereas uh, in the classical mechanics the way you have introduced is there any motivation in the sense that why do we need that that is a one uh, question um well you're right is it doesn't seem to be a necessity but on the other hand the determinism doesn't seem to be a necessity either hmm. what i what i think is that we physicists have been blinded a bit by the great success of the of the two system we are able to solve which is basically the harmonic oscillator and, and a free particle and, and thinking that these two things are, uh, are applicable to every other. So the vast majority of the real physics problems are chaotic and they exhibit these uh, to all possible means in determinacy. So we are not able to predict. Mm. Uh, we are not able to predict with, with a, a good amount of accuracy what will be the weather tomorrow. Uh, there is a... Um, I think we we have hyped a bit too much on the power of our physical theories based on on few examples that are integrable systems, whereas chaotic systems are just something that only quite recently, only in the in the last century, had been explored in detail. So I think that um, is not probably. Uh, as necessary as in quantum mechanics, as you were saying, to introduce it, but also from, from practical purposes, we live in an uncertain world. Our, our physicists in the lab know that you, you know stuff with a lot of uncertainty always, also in classical physics. Of course, you can improve these measurements, uh, but they think that it's totally intuitive for me to start thinking that the world might not be indeterminate since we have so, so little certainty also on, on, on on our uh, on our very supposed to be very controlled physical experiments. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I mean, at least intuitively, I think it makes sense. Okay, one technical question: in the yeah. um, uh, see in the non-locality or other in quantum mechanical scenarios, the violation of uh, one of the assumptions like locality or other thing, uh, no signaling condition, will also implies the violation. Uh, I mean, we strongly demand that no signaling condition should not be violated. So, in the two assumptions, the one assumption which you claim that it violates, I mean, what motivation I would take that it should? Can you go to that uh, two assumptions? I'm mixing the words. Sorry. This one here. Yeah, exactly. So the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, the what would happen uh, if the present reality is violated in the sense that. Do you think any other features in the other branches of physics uh, will be affected because of the violation of the assumption two? Prince, why do you? Yeah, I am trying to. Well, at the operational level, present reality doesn't make sense, right? So you. If you think that that uh, anchor that space-like separated regions cannot anyhow uh, influence each other directly so you, as long as you have no signaling but it, it, it is the most most basic assumption I, uh, I I don't mind preserving this assumption it is a very simple assumption uh, in that it sense seems, is what I'm thinking it seems intuitive of course because uh, you I mean in a classical world is what exactly you think like something that gets gets realized I bake a cake here and the cake is baked everywhere else in the universe. I mean, everybody can say, Flavio, bake a cake. Mm. If, however, if somebody is in a space like separation region from, from me, the claim is that there is no way that he, only when I send him uh, uh, a radio wave or uh, some, some signal that travels with the speed of light and he reaches him, this claim can be actually be realized for him as well. So that's that's the way you. If you think relativistically, this makes sense. Everything else that happens in space-like separation regions. So if you would start in in elementary school with the special relativity, you would think, I guess, in terms of light rays and not in terms of intuitively something happens and is it for, and this is for everybody. Okay. That is on my. Aim. So I think I think it's intuitive, but is is an intuition built on our classical world. 
And if you start with, with special relativity, this intuition should be abandoned. That's the claim. Oh, thank you. Question yeah. from Mani. Yeah, Mani? For, for your uh, thoughtful talk. So as you have beautifully pointed out, so in quantum scenario, if we have a, some seed randomness, then Bell's theorem allows us to amplify this randomness. On the other hand, in uh, uh, computer science, in classical computer science, there is a very uh, seminal result by Miklos Santa and Bhajirani, Umesh Bhajirani, that in a classical random sequence, so such randomness amplification is not possible. Mm -hmm. So two fundamental operational distinction are there, classical randomness and quantum randomness. So doesn't it mean that at ontological level, these two randomness, some distinction should be there, which is, which is, more, 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 more important question that quantum randomness that is ontologically in some sense in a different, different category that what is observed we are observing in classical world because it, it can be amplified in quantum world whereas in classical world it can cannot be amplified. Uh, thanks, that's a very interesting question and I, I didn't think about it so far. Um, I have to say, yeah. So looking at Bell's inequalities, it seems that. Quantum mechanics is more powerful tool to amplify randomness. On the other hand, if you look at chaotic systems again, you have these very complex dynamics that allows you to have, uh, um, you have these systems that really saturate all the configuration of, of phase space pretty quickly, starting from any arbitrary small uncertainty in classical physics, which you, which you don't really have in quantum mechanics, in the sense that the the form of the unitary evolution. So, if you imagine you take imagine you take a state vector that is not fully determined. Okay, imagine you have a state vector which which has a, a, a small a small uncertainty on the angle. It could be between two different angles. If you evolve it unitarily, since the angles are always preserved by unitaries you cannot spread this vector too much. You can rotate it around, but it will, the uncertainty on the vector itself will not be amplified. So you don't have ge genuinely, uh, genuinely chaotic uh, um, system in, in quantum mechanics. I mean, there is, there is quantum chaotic, uh, there is theory of quantum chaotic systems, but it's usually done by adding some perturb perturbance to the Hamiltonian and having like some terms that, yeah. But but the unitar the unitarity of quantum mechanics uh, does not allow to have the same spread of uncertainty directly on the on the um, on the state vector, whereas you can have a, a spread of uncertainty as large as you want, starting from a, from a classical state in phase space. So it 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 seems a bit a trade off. I don't know what to what to say exactly. No, but, so but 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 you are bringing here now. You are bringing the dynamics part because your aim was. I'm bringing the dynamics part in, yes. Yeah, sure. Because your aim was to trick, uh, tweak the <laughs> initial conditions on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But also also with the standard, uh, uh, with the standard mm, uh, dynamical evolution of classical physics and standard dynamical evolution of, of quantum physics, you reach different results without, <laughs> without modifi modifying them, I mean, like using the standard ones. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting comment, the one that you cannot amplify randomness in a in a classical scenario. I, I, I should think about more about this. Thanks. Yeah. Thank okay. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. We, have to, we, we have to complete this session because we have to start the next session. So only one more question we will take. It is by Shivashish. Oh, this is thank you for your uh, you know thoughtful talk. And uh, this is not a question. You know, I know some physicists who think that, uh, who consider, you know, our physical world to be discrete one. So even the space time is also discrete. And for them, you know, basically, because you cannot have infinite resolution measurement, whatever measurement you would like to do, therefore, we should discretize everything. And uh, uh, we can only have the finite precision of any data. And uh, so even, you know, they basically built up a, uh, general theory of relativity, field theory, etc., on the based upon these, uh, uh, you know, discrete space-time structure. Yeah, thanks. I'm aware of this, but our our proposal tries to. I mean, 
is one way to to introduce an uncertainty is coarse graining, like putting fundamental uh, lattice, for instance, that you cannot have continuity. But what what we show here is that even if you have a concept of continuity, because these propensities, are, they have uh, infinite tails, just they don't contain. Uh, so you can you can find uh, infinitely small, arbitrarily small um, regions. You don't have to really go to to discretization, but the only thing we impose is finiteness of of, of uh, information. So there are two two legit uh, possibilities, but we are not exploring the the discretization, not not necessarily as a fundamental feature. But thanks for the comment. Thank you. Multiple talk as well as so many questions he has uh, interacted with, and with this we. In this session, next session we will start at uh, at six ten p.m. Thank you very much uh, again, and for the nice discussion. Thank you. And the next session will be chaired by uh, Dr. Alok Kumar Pan from NIT Partner, and it will start at six ten p.m. Tata Ah, what's that? Ah, I'm here. Yeah. So, so hey, look, you have joined already. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah. Ah, I am the Ah, I am Okay. Okay. So, we should start at 16 and... Ah, 16 and uh, you keep in mind that uh, 18 plus 2 maximum, 17 plus 3 is the uh, basic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take care of that, yes. <laughs> ah, okay. So all our, my uh, video is working. I cannot see my video. Right? It's no, no, no. I, 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 I am, I am not opening my video. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. My yeah. video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your video, video is okay. Okay, all okay. okay. Good. Good. Your video is okay. Absolutely good? fine. Your, your video yeah, is okay. okay. Am I looking good? <laughs> that, that <laughs> you have to ask another person. I am not the right person to answer. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> So, okay, so <laughs> see you then in 65. Okay, see you. Let me let me come back from something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. We are happy here. So, <laughs> if you like, you can join. Or we can teleport your tea. See you, see you. Hi, Lokda. How are you? Hi, Aminda. How are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. So, Lokda, they are having tea. You can have something, you know, cold something, you know. <laughs> hey, money. <laughs> I also. I was also going for that. Aravinda, <laughs> <laughs> hi. Hi, Manik. Hi, hi. Hi, Ramita. I actually got mine. Hi. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I will go home and then. So we, have, we, have, we have arranged very beautiful lunch here. So yeah. if anyone comes, so it will be. Teleport. <laughs> you just teleport. Yeah, we are trying to. <laughs> <laughs> what a painful situation. Eh? <laughs> uh, Bolchi, Tomat Dushan Obvoyjan, Naki Tinsu Ponjajan, but ten percent of Thakchana. That's happened actually. Yeah, I have experience with this piece online culture. Uro Lokera Sunche, Prora Sundevachan. I mean, Richard Warner is a Buseache. Abner Shop organizer Lache, Balagan Dekani. Sita is a question.
কালো করে ছিল ছেলেটা কাজকর্ম করত ভালোনেস <laughs> 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 গায়ে হাত পায়ে দেখলে বুঝতে পারবে এখন আমরা একটা বাংলা ইংরেজিতে বলতে পারবো না তার গায়ে গলায় গালে মাথায় কোথায় না দাগ থাকবেই প্রতি মার খাইছে আমি দি না অনেক কান মা দেয় সো পপুলেশন ইজ ইনক্রিজিং অর ডিক্রিজিং ইনক্রিজিং এন্ড ডিক্রিজিং 16 না 16 Should I start? No. Devasilda, you will tell me when to start.
অলোক কুমার পাম ফ্রম এন আই টি পাটনা হি উইল চেয়ার দিস সেশন হি ইস ডুইং ইন বেসিক্যালি ইন কোয়ান্টাম ফাউন্ডেশন ফর এ লং টাইম হি হ্যাজ ডান হিজ পিএইচডি ফ্রম ক্যালকাটা দেন হি ভিজিটেড অ্যাব্রড মেনি মেনি ইয়ার্স অ্যান্ড দেন হি হি জয়েন্ট এন আই টি এজ এ এজ এ প্রফেসর দেয়া ফ্যাকাল্টি দেয়া সো আই ইনভাইট অলোক টু চেয়ার দিস সেশন thank you thank you devas sir and for this uh, nice words and also for thank you thank you thank you very much for promoting me i am still an assistant professor okay so good evening and welcome to this late evening sessions and in this session we have five speakers uh, i hope the most of the speaker he have already joined if not all so i would request you all to conclude your talk in time because there are some covid restrictions in the institutes and also in the city so organizers have to go home and they have to close the institute so i shall remind you just 5 minutes before the time so all of you have the 20 minutes uh, allotted time so if you try to finish within 17 or 18 minutes so there will be two or three minutes for the discussion so today i have uh, the, we have the first speaker of this session it is dr ali ahnaj who is from khayam university iran and actually he has done his phd i if i am correct then from university of pune with professor pramod jog and also he visited quite some, quite a few times at uh, isi kolkata also i think i have also met some uh, once with him so today he will be talking about this uh, use barrett uh, rudolph's theorem as you know that this is a very this created a buzz in around 2014 that actually rules out the Psi epistemic ontological models. So she will be talking about the three spin system and the Puse Barrett Ludolf theorem. Dr. Ali, are you there? Yeah, I think so. You may please start. I saw you just. Hello. You guys can hear me? Hello. Yeah, I think Dr. Ali, you are muted. You have to unmute, unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. I can I start? Can I start? Do you have my hair? Yeah, please, please share your screen first. Oh, okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I would like to thank the old the, uh, Indian, my friend, the Congress, Rami Sopan, and the other people, the organizer, Professor Archan, Gurpra Sarkar, and Preeti, and Devasis, and others, my friend, Indian, my friend. Thank you very much for allowing me to present this talk. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, this, uh, this time I got the second time uh, uh, coronavirus virus and so Is it my problem or his connection is lost? No, no, I think it is at his end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor, I, we cannot hear you. Ali, I cannot hear you. connection is lost organizers what to do 
Yeah, please go ahead. Microphone, microphone. Yeah, please unmute yourself first. reality. Ontology is the observation independent. Uh, you, everybody knows that the ontology derives from the Greek word for being and refer to branch of metaphysics that answer the character of things that exist. In the present context, an antique state referred to something that objectively exists in the world independently of any observer or agent. In this talk, uh, yeah. I think you 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 uh, switch off yeah. your your video. Okay, maybe you can okay. save some bandwidth. Yeah, otherwise we cannot hear you actually properly. Your voice is not. <coughs> Sorry. Here we define realism as follow. Uh, this uh, this uh, define is. Uh, Everybody knows a physical quantity have value at any time. So the state of system is determined independent of any observer. Observer can get the real value of the quantities of the physical system. Doctor Ali, can you yeah. Yeah. can you off your video? Yeah. Yeah. Some problem? No, you if you switch up your video, then maybe it will be better. Because voice is not coming, your voice is not coming actually. It was stuck actually at some place. We couldn't hear anything. Uh, uh, just now, everybody is, uh, everything is okay. I... Yeah, okay. now it's working, yes. They are objective properties of the particle that exists independent of us. And we show that by one point in the phase space, P and X. But in the epistemic state is uh, like this. 
uh, the probability distribution over an antique set in the classical physics because we have not exact information about that. An epistemic state does not contain exact In the epistemic state, you have not exact information about the antique state. Okay. A probability distribution over the antique phase space can include several possible antique state, and therefore it is not possible to determine which specific antique state is the real one. This is important that. It's possible that two epistemic states fit one antique state of the system. See, two epistemic states sometimes share uh, uh, some area shared between two epistemic states and one antique state in this area. This area, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, in this area belong to, to two different epistemic set in this area, orange color. This, this is the uh, important question from the 100 before, from the startup quantum mechanic. And this question is very important that, is the quantum wave function a real property of nature or is it only the knowledge we have gained from nature? This is the very important question, and I think nobody knows every that. Three interpretation of the wave function. There are three interpretation. The first interpretation is the classical realism. The wave function, the wave function would be merely a And the second interpretation is the wave function as a practical tool to predict solution without worrying about the nature of realism, reality. We call this interpretation instrumentalist uh, or shut up and calculate. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you have my hair, no problem. Now there is uh, many interruptions, okay. so we can hear okay. you okay. sometimes, sorry. yes. Sorry, sorry. Uh, realistic, uh, we can, realistic epistemic, we call equal classical realism in this uh, interpretation, wave function are epistemic, but there is an underlying reality. Second, realistic antique equal quantum realistic. There is an underlying reality and the wave function correspond to the states of reality. And the third, anti-realistic epistemic. We are, the function are epistemic and there is not any deeper reality behind them. Oops, uh, the psi antique and psi epistemic, we call them uh, the antique character of wave
to incomplete knowledge, uh, knowledge about reality. Inside complete, uh, a pure quantum set provides a complete description of reality. And in the side incomplete, a pure quantum set provides only an incomplete description of reality. So, uh, so um, summarize is that classical realism implies psi epistemic, quantum realism implies psi antique, and psi antique is or psi complete or psi supplemented, psi supplemented like Bohmian mechanic. And instrumentalist implies psi epistemic. <clears throat> We can see that Einstein and Niels Bohr advocated psi epistemicities, and Professor Penrose, we can tell that advocated psi ontologies. This is not important. Okay. Ontological model we see here, uh, we call here ontological model are built on the assumption that physical system described by the model are antique. This is the new name. Ali, we just uh, we can hardly hear you. The notion of an ontological model will consist of the description of some preparation and measurement procedure with respect of the antique set space. See, preparation procedure. <coughs> Prepare a system with certain properties, and the measurement procedure reveals something about those properties. See, in here, in this uh, picture, first you, uh, so, see, for every system, first, you must be preparation and second, measurement. Preparation and measurement we call PM. In the preparation, a preparation P is associated to a trace one positive operator row, known as the density operator acting on Hilbert space. So in the quantum mechanic preparation, it means that we have a density matrix. Second, we have measurement. A measurement M is associated with trace. One positive operator value measurement, POVM. The set of POVM operator M, such that uh, summation M equal, uh, uh, equal I. So preparation and the measurement. And second rule is the Bohr rule. M rule is the probability M given, probability conclusion M given preparation P and measurement M equal trace row operator M. This is the Bohr rule. This is connection between preparation and measurement and conclusion. Okay. In 2007, Harrigan, Harrigan and Spikens purpose ontological model framework, OMF, aiming to provide the most general formalist for realistic interpretation of quantum system. They, <coughs> they, they introduce the basic idea of OMF is to associate an antique state space, lambda with each physical system. So for every physical system, we associate an antique state a space.
and second, uh, third, sorry. Distribution over the different outcome of measurement and for every antique state lambda is this summation probability m given lambda and m equal one and an integral probability lambda given p probability m given lambda m d lambda equal con, uh, probability m given p and m equal trace rho operator m. The last equation from quantum mechanics and the first equation uh, in the ontological model. Every ontological model, it must be equal the quantum mechanic. M is conclusion, P is preparation, and M is the measurement operator. Here, is, this is important. An ontological model, <laughs> is psi antique if for any pair, pair of preparation procedure, PFE and PSI, associated with distant quantum state psi and phi. So we have two quantum state psi and phi, and psi and phi is not equal, is not equal, okay? Preparation for uh, produce phi and preparation for um, produce psi. P, lambda given PSI, probability, P is probability, lambda given PSI, uh, times probability, lambda given PFE equals zero for all lambda. Or by using uh, bias rules, uh, we can call P, uh, probability, uh, preparation side given lambda into probability, Preparation phi given lambda is equal zero, psi not equal phi. This equation tells us for every lambda there exists some psi such that uh, probability PSI uh, preparation psi given lambda is equal one and P and probability PFE given lambda is equal zero. So if the one probability is one, uh, so must be the other probability must be zero for all psi non equal phi. Okay, um, here we can see that uh, all uh, for the psi on the case, all mu phi or lan. Ali, you have to conclude now in two minutes. Uh, you're, 20, you're 20 minutes almost exhausted, so you have to conclude in two minutes, please. <coughs> In the uh, epistemic model, exists PSI and PFE lambda such that probability for produced psi given lambda into probability preparation field given lambda non equal zero. Okay. Uh, sorry, we have no time. Okay. We have. Uh, there is a, there are a very important postulation. It means the preparation independent postulate is that uh, if we combine these two system, uh, if we have two system A and B, uh, psi A and psi B, psi A belong to A and psi B belong to B, that probability lambda a b given p a b equal probability lambda a given p a probability lambda a b given p a b this uh, postulate the preparation independent postulate uh, sorry uh, no, i have i have no time the pbr
And M1 is uh, perpendicular to 0, 0, M2 is perpendicular to 0 plus, M3 is perpendicular plus 0, and uh, again, um, it's at all, okay? We can see that uh, it's not possible. Uh, for example, if the uh, 0, 0 is the, the first uh, preparation, it's not possible you get, um, uh, give the uh, M1 is one, and uh, if the first uh, preparation is zero and plus, and uh, this probability is zero and third and four. Um, so, uh, by using some calculations, we get uh, we get that uh, this means that the, for every any value i, the, it come. MIAB never occurs when the system is prepared in quantum state psi i. For example, if the system in the prepare in the X1, you, uh, you can get MAA. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> because you are already exhausted 25 minutes. Ah, so it is... Okay, yeah, cool. You guys have to take care of these things. No, I can't continue. Can I continue? Uh, actually, you have exhausted your allotted time, so uh, it is. Okay. I mean, we have to give the chance to the other speaker. Maybe we, if you post it in the archive, you show us the references, so we can read it. Or he can show his final result, conclusion. Uh, so or, final uh, result. Okay, uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, okay, uh, in the, my paper, I uh, um, I can uh, introduce uh, ex experimental three, uh, triple quantum dot for. Uh, Testing PBR theorem by using the three particle system. And uh, uh, we show that for the three particle system, I introduced a Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian has an agent valuable and, and introduced uh, Alice and Bob and Charlie for testing the PBR theorem and show that the PBR theorem is, uh, is, is still here is proof. The last, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm, uh, only um, we can tell that my, to uh, I, I could. Um... So Dr. Ali, we thank you very much for this talk. And actually we, hardly listen to you because of the uh, poor connections. Maybe. Sam have an objective physical state preparation independent plus quantum theory is psi anti state. Thank you very much for, uh, I'm so sorry for the, um, I cannot complete. Yeah, the, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, okay. thank you. So there's a question and you can read it uh, from John, uh, I mean, John T. Hans. I mean, he asked a question, you may contact him and can he's also provided references, so you may take a look, okay? So you, we will quickly move to the next speaker. So please uh, uh, unshare your screen. So our next speaker is Martin Plavhala. I think he's here. Yes, hi. Yeah, hi, hi. So he's from the University of Siegen from Germany, and he will be talking about the operational theories in phase space, the toy model for the harmonic oscillator. So please share your screen and start. Of course. 
as i already told you uh, you are all allotted 20 minutes so 17 minutes or 18 minutes for the talk and presentations and 2 3 minutes for the discussion yes so okay thank you can you hear me and see me and everything clear yeah, i can hear you and see you and also you can watch your uh, presentation i mean powerpoint as well please continue very good yeah very good thank you so hi everyone my name is martin and i'll tell you something about uh, our latest uh, research with uh, matthias kleinman So actually, this uh, paper was uh, less than a month ago published in Physical Review Letters. So if you want to know more details or if you're interested, you can just uh, Google the title of the talk and you will find the paper uh, in PRL, but also on archive. So what, what we actually did. Uh, in classical and quantum theory, we have these two aspects of the theories that we sometimes uh, think about, but we not always uh, see them as different aspects and that uh, is that we have the finite dimensional information theory so this is the theory where we do steering and bell inequalities and quantum computers and all of this finite dimensional stuff and then we have the physical theory so this is what we usually teach students in quantum theory 101 this is the position and momentum uh, stuff and potential energy and hamiltonians and diagonalization of hamiltonians to obtain the energies and transition probabilities and all of these things And uh, then uh, in order to study these theories, uh, what people developed and uh, is in the current most modern incarnation was started uh, in the early 2000s by Lucien Hardy's derivation of quantum theory is uh, called GPTs. So GPTs are a huge class of theories that generalize both classical and quantum. Because the idea is that if you want to compare classical and quantum theory, you somehow have to have a common ground to compare them on. You know, we cannot compare Uh, just classical theory to pure quantum because then it will some it's like since quantum theory contains classical it's not fair comparison so you somehow have to have a fair comparison and this is what uh, the framework of gpts uh, allows us to do because it just sees classical and quantum as two instances of possible theories and in gpts for a very long time people were investigating finite dimensional information theories so one of the most famous is the box world theory which contains pr boxes so This is a well-defined theory where you have a tensor product such that you obtain PR boxes and you get the algebraic violation of CHSH inequality. Of course, this theory does not exist. This is just like a uh, this is like a foundational research on hypothetical theories that we do not observe in a lab. And our contribution is that uh, we have formulated harmonic oscillator. So one of these uh, second second class of theories with position and momentum as uh, this GPT. So what we did is that we generalized harmonic oscillator in such a way that both classical harmonic oscillator and quantum harmonic oscillator can be seen as uh, just two different in instances of possible huge class of potential theories of harmonic oscillator. So this is what we did. And we also present a toy theory which uh, we term the sawtooth oscillator, which is a, a theory which is a different from classical and different from quantum. So it's like a third different theory, uh, different from both of them. And uh, so before I uh, get into the stuff, let me first explain the main idea behind GPTs. So I already somehow touched on this, but the main idea here is that we want to uh, generalize classical and quantum theory to obtain this huge class of theories. And we do this by modifying the state space. Because here, what we see on the left here, this is a block sphere. Everybody recognizes this picture. But now a valid question would be, so, okay, what if block sphere wouldn't be a sphere, but a cube? And this, and this is a valid question because like, what are properties of this theory? Would it have computational power stronger or weaker than what? Would it contain or not contain entanglement or steering or VB84 protocol? And these are the questions we ask in GPTs. And uh, this is quite interesting because it leads us to find the different properties of quantum theory that are responsible for different uh, features of quantum theory. So then we can say that, okay, if you have a theory in a lab that, uh, for example, has entanglement, then it must contain this kind of features, or th this is the geometric uh, aspect of the theory responsible for entanglement. So this is what people do in GPTs, or at least what I like to do in GPTs. And now how to do this on, uh, Oh, actually, if you are more interested in these GPTs, there are some nice reviews, review papers on the archive that you can find if you just uh, uh, Google for general probabilistic theories, then uh, I think you can find at least two or three of them, two quite recent. 
So how to do this with face space? Well, uh, it's not actually as hard as one as, as it seems. So what one does is that, okay, we take uh, a face space with only one position Q and one momentum P. Of course, we can generalize this to several position momentum and it would be the same except for, except for we would have to keep track of some kind of index. And uh, in order to define a, a GPT, a theory, we have to define two things. We have to define states and we have to define observables. So we start by states. A state of a theory is a pseudo probability density, which means uh, that uh, leaving all potential mathematical problems aside, a state of a theory is a function on the phase space such that the integral over all of the phase space of the function is equal to one. This means that it's uh, uh, th this is the probability part that it integrates to one. And this pseudo part means that the function does not have to be positive everywhere. It can also be somewhere negative. But soon we will start restrict restricting the potential negativities, but it can still be somewhere negative. So, okay, now that we have a state of a theory, we want to start compute stuff. And the first things that we can compute are probabilities of observing the particle that is described by the state somewhere. So we can compute this probability, which is a probability in the state row of observing the particle in some kind of interval i. So for example, you can imagine this to be minus one, one. So what is the probability that the particle is somewhere around the center in this interval minus one, one? And how we do this is that we integrate over all momenta, but only over positions from the interval. And this is how we can compute probabilities of position. We can do the same for momenta. Moreover, given a Hamiltonian, we can compute the mean value of energy just by uh, integrating the Hamiltonian against the state. Okay, at this point I should backtrack because it seems that I'm pulling uh, rules out of thin air, but I'm not. I will soon explain to you that this description that I'm just presenting, this also applies to quantum theory using the Wigner functions. I will get there on the next slide, okay? But before that, uh, so what we can now do is that we can compute this probability of observing position momenta from some interval. We can predict the mean value of energy, but the big problem of this theory of what we have so far is that we cannot predict the probabilities of observing energy from some interval. This is quite bad because if you cannot predict the energy distribution, you cannot say that something is an eigenstate. Uh, you cannot uh, say that the energy is sharp and you cannot predict the spectrum of your Hamiltonians and all of this stuff that we want to do in quantum theory or in general in any theory. So this we have to somehow address how to uh, compute these probabilities of energy from some interval. But before that, let me uh, first uh, tell you that this all applies also to quantum theory. So, but it also applies to classical theory. And in classical theory, this essentially is just the Hamiltonian picture for classical mechanics. You have to replace points on the phase space by Dirac uh, distributions. Uh, and then everything that we have here works in classical theory, except for we don't use this description because it's too complicated with very little gain. In uh, quantum theory, we can obtain this same description using the Wigner picture and Wigner functions. Okay, so for those that uh, don't know what are Wigner functions, now they are these. These formulas look horrible and you don't really need to read them there. It's not very important for the content of the talk what's in these formulas. The only important thing is that given an operator a hat, we can represent it by a real valued function on a phase space. And given density matrix rho, we can uh, represent it by a real valued function on the phase space, such that if we want to compute the mean value of the operator, we just integrate the function against the operator. Uh, we just integrate the state function against the operator function. So we just integrate the state against the observable. So as you see, this is exactly the same as we had here, just one slide uh, before. So yes, quantum theory is belongs to this class of theories that we are uh, discussing here and that we are formulating. And moreover, this is a up to some point mathematical equivalence. So anything you do uh, in Hilbert space, you can also do in this Wigner picture, except for we don't do this because the Wigner picture is not very practical for real calculations, but it can in principle be done. And this is uh, what's somehow sufficient for us. So now how to solve this problem? The problem at hand is that we want to, in any general theory, we want to be able to predict uh, 
uh, somehow the energy, uh, the probability distribution of energy given some kind of state. Well, let me first tell you that what doesn't work. The first idea that we had is that, okay, maybe we can just compute the higher moments of this uh, distribution. These higher moments are just mean values of the energy to the power of n by uh, putting the function inside to the power of n. But this is not a very good idea because this does not even work in quantum theory. In quantum theory, this is, this is not how you compute the, the mean value of energy squared in the Wigner uh, representation. Moreover, one can see that somehow if you would postulate this rule, then this rule would uh, uniquely lead you to classical theory in the case of harmon uh, harmonic oscillator. The second try was that, okay, we know how to compute the probabilities for position and momentum because this was just this uh, integral over the interval. So let's add energy as a third variable. But this is not very physical because we, what we want to do is that we want to have energy uh, to be represented by the Hamiltonian, which will be something like p, p squared p plus q squared. And if we would introduce energy as independent variable, then it doesn't depend on position and momentum anymore. So this is this approach, although applicable, is not very physical. And now the approach that actually works is what we term the phase space spectral measure. So uh, the solution is to basically uh, replace operator spectral measures that we use in quantum theory by function spectral measures that we can use on phase space, then we can realize that this actually also happens in classical theory, except for we don't think about it because it's somehow trivial. And uh, in this way, we can actually predict these probabilities uh, that we want. So let me show you. So given a state rho, uh, we, we say that this GH is a phase space projector, which means that for any, for some interval, I from which we want to observe the energy, we postulate that this is how we compute the probability of observing the energy from the interval I. As you can see, this is something like a mean value of the phase space projector. This is also true in quantum theory, because if you want to, for example, compute what is the probability that given a state row, uh, I observe the energy of the first excited state. So then you just uh, compute this as a mean value of the corresponding spectral projector except for we do not call this mean value in, term, in, cases, in case of projectors, but the formula is a formula for a mean value. So that's what we postulate here, that in order to compute uh, these probabilities in any theory, you just have to choose some appropriate functions and you just integrate against these functions. But they cannot be chosen at random, of course. They have to satisfy to uh, to this kind of requirements. The first one is that uh, somehow the projector for all of the all possible energies is equal to one. This is a normalization uh, so, so that uh, all of your probabilities sum up to one, because you can see that if you would put instead of I, you would put R, then this would just become integral over rho. And since rho is a pseudo probability uh, density, then uh, this would be equal to one. The second requirement is that the epsilon times uh, uh, the pr corresponding projector sums up to the Hamiltonian. Now this requirement just says that the spectral measure we have here at hand is actually a spectral measure of this Hamiltonian here. And uh, this is this we also know from the spectral resolutions of operators because there we also have the condition that the sum of the uh, uh, eigenvalue times projector must give you the back the original operator. These conditions become a little bit simpler for discrete spectrum because then we can define the spec uh, phase space projector for interval i simply by summing over the respective energies. And then these two conditions, the normalization becomes that the sum of all of these projectors has to be equal to one. And the weighted sum of all of these uh, uh, projectors have to be equal to the Hamiltonian. So uh, in this way, we can uh, construct uh, these phase space projectors and phase space spectral measure for the Hamiltonian. And we can use this to build a theory of harmonic oscillator that is neither quantum, neither classical. And in order to demonstrate this, uh, I will present you now the toy theory, but uh, this is just one of possible theories. And we can, in principle, build many other theories uh, with many other different properties. So. This is the toy model of the harmonic oscillator. And uh, 
there are many functions on this graph and essentially uh, all of the toy model is some, somewhat uh, well characterized by these functions. And I will now walk you through them one by one. But first, let me explain the axis. The X axis is uh, the radial coordinate in phase space because all of these functions depend only on the radial coordinate on the on of phase space. They do not depend on the angle. This is for a good reason, and uh, it is because the time evolution. And of course, uh, our theory does have a well-defined time evolution. But if you're interested in how to get the time evolution and what we get from the time evolution, you have to go and read the paper because uh, this talk is too short to also uh, walk you through that. But let's now go through these functions one by one. This first one, this is the phase space projector corresponding to energy equal zero. Well, this already shows you a thing. The toy model we are constructing here has a ground state energy equal to zero and the corresponding eigenstate is just the delta function, which is uh, sitting at the middle of phase space. So this looks very classical because the ground state of classical harmonic oscillator is also a particle sitting at the lowest point of the potential doing nothing. Now, the orange function is the phase space projector corresponding to the energy h bar omega divided divided by two. And this is the projector for the first excited state. And this already sh this shows you that uh, the constructed uh, toy theory has a discrete energy spectrum. So somehow it has the low, the ground state energy is zero, like in classical theory, but the energy spectrum is discrete, like in quantum theory. So we already see that this, like it doesn't fit, uh, it's neither classical nor quantum. It doesn't fit uh, into any of them. It, it's somewhere, it's something different. The green function here, this is the phase space projector to the second excited state. And so we can, this is corresponding to energy h bar omega. Now this uh, brown function, this is not a phase space projector, but this is actually a uh, pseudo probability density corresponding to a state. And this is an eigenstate of the sort of oscillator. But as you can see here, the corresponding function is negative. Now, people that already heard some, heard about uh, Wigner functions before know that when you have a negative Wigner function, this somehow hints at non-classicality. And here we have eigenstate, which is negative somewhere. So this already shows that our theory is not some strange subset of a classical theory because we do have here a negative uh, a state with a negative uh, function. So then again, this just shows that the theory is non-classical non because uh, we also have these negative Wigner functions in quantum theory. And the last state uh, looks very classical, but it is not classical at all because this state has what we term tunneling properties. Uh, tunneling properties means that this state is somehow spreading into the potential more than one would classically expect. This is very hard to explain uh, just to, by hand waving, but uh, this is something like a prerequisite to quantum tunneling, except for you cannot have a tunnel, quantum tunneling in harmonic oscillator because the particle, there is no barrier to tunnel through. But still, you can have this thing that the particle can somehow push against the potential more than classical intuition would allow you. And this purple state is doing exactly that. It's tunneling into the potential walls and it's spreading itself a little bit more than, than classically it should. So as we can see that the, the, our toy model also allows us to give physical predictions like observing tunneling behavior, which uh, is important because this is still a hypothetical theory that is invented, that was just invented, yet we can uh, give physical predictions about its behavior. And so this is the whole uh, toy model. And uh, if you are interested, uh, either you can ask questions and or send me an email. But also, as I said, the this is all published in physical review letters, so you can go and read the paper. It's not very long, and I hope you find it interesting. And with that, I would like to thank you for attention. And please, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. Thank you, Martin, for finishing in time. So we uh, we can take uh, one or two questions. Any question? I think there's a question in the chat box. Could you please yes. read it? Uh, yes, let's see. one moment. Let me see. 
Ah, yes, chat box here. Uh, it's the uh, of Atlam's proposal of operational theories of, as a novel. Is it a view? Yeah. I don't know because this is about interpretations of. Okay, I think it's a different I, one. I mean, it's may maybe for the previous talk. Maybe the previous speaker, but it came late. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, is there any question? No. Can I it's ask not... a question? Sure, sure. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yep. Uh, so, I have mainly two questions. Uh, first one is. Uh, Usually in classical theory, uh, the phase space is embedded in a symplectic manifold, uh, similarly in quantum theory as well. So the theory that in the toy model of Hartman consider, so uh, what is the interpretation of state space? Uh, um, so uh, in classical theory, the state space is somehow um, coincides with points of the symplectic manifold. Okay. But we have to take a step back and say like, no, 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 it's not the points. It's the direct delta distributions corresponding to those points. And then you get that the state space is embedded in uh, some kind of vector space of finite measures on uh, the state, on the phase space. You get okay. the same in, in quantum theory and you get the same in our theory. Okay, so I have a second question that uh, in the, both the classical theory as well as the quantum theory can be seen as a particular version of sister algebraic approach. That is in uh, classical case, the sister algebra is commutative and for quantum case, obviously it's non-commutative. So can we think about something in case of GPT as well, some sister algebraic or some generalized formalism of this GPT? No, that's actually the trick. In GPTs, there is no product, so it's not algebra. Oh, so the topological vector space is the good candidate for that. Yes, I mean it depends which, uh, topo like what, you know, what what do you want to to use it for? But uh, in principle, in GPTs in general, there is no product, and this is the main uh, difference. And one can also formulate the question of deriving uh, quantum theory within the framework of GPTs as finding the product, because once you have okay. a suitable product, you can get Euclidean Jordan algebras, and you're there. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. So thank you, Martin, for this nice talk. So, and there's one more comment from this Janti Hans. It's actually the, the previous comment was for you, actually. So you may take a look at the chat box. Yeah. Ah, okay. Of operational theory. So you I may respond to him uh, 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 in other means. So maybe we can move forward. Of okay. course, of course. But thank you. <laughs> So our next speaker is Tanmay Singhal. Tanmay, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please share your screen. Sure, thanks. Yeah. So, so Tanmay, yeah, let me just introduce you. That Tanmay is from Nicholas Copernicus University. I know that is he is from IMSC. He did his PhD from with Professor Sibasi's course. And now he's in Poland. Okay. So we'll be talking about this approximate three designs and partial decompositions of the Clifford group representations using trans transvexons. So yeah, Tanmay, you. please start. Yeah. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so I've already been introduced and the title has already been mentioned, so I won't spend too much time on this. This work has been done mostly last year and this uh, a little bit of this year with uh, my collaborator, Minshu Shi, who's in uh, Hunhai in uh, yeah, Taipei. Right, so firstly, I'll talk about what is our quantum system. Our quantum system is an m qubit system with dimension two power little m. Now, big N will denote this dimension. Now, we are not interested in a single copy of this m qubit system. We're generally interested in t copies of this m qubit system with dimension n power little t. Let's define the Haar measure first. Now, consider for defining the Haar measure, I'll first consider a general you know, n by n matrix. It's a complex matrix. Okay, and let f be some complex function on this uh, the space of matrices. Okay, how do we define the Haar average f on this unitary subgroup? Well, the expression is written down over here. Okay, so you just take this function f and you integrate it with respect to some measure, that is the Haar measure, on the unitary group. Now you can realize this similarly in, I mean, in another fashion. So what you do is instead of taking this expression, you integrate you know, the real and complex parts of any uh, in, uh, matrix elements of this A all independently and such that 
uh, with a measure such that it has uh, uh, non-zero, uh, it has support only when A is a unitary. Okay, and then you integrate the function like uh, on this. This is actually a left and right translation invariant uh, measure. It's also inverse invariant. So it gives rise to something that is proportional to the harm measure. You have to normalize it to get the harm measure. So this is the harm measure for the function f. Now using this measure, so we denote this measure by this d mu. Now using this measure d mu, we define a quantum channel on this t copies of m qubit systems. So you take a matrix x and you rotate it with some unitary u. Okay, which is chosen from the Haar measure. Okay, this gives rise to a quantum channel, which we call G of H. So our job will be in this talk will be to simulate G of H using finite ensemble. So in the previous slide, we saw this definition of G of H. What we do is we consider a special ensemble of unitaries. Okay, so that is given by this ensemble. And instead of twirling with the Haar, with the random unitary with the Haar measure, we twirl using this special ensemble. Now, what is special about this ensemble? Well, the speciality of this ensemble is that both, uh, both twirlings give you precisely the same. So twirling by this finite ensemble precisely gives you this hard average. Okay, right. This is a unitary T design. Next. Now, why are we interested in unitary T designs? We are interested in unitary T designs for many different reasons. There is noise characterization, this quantum control, data hiding, and for other reasons as well. Now, I'll define an approximate T design. An approximate T design is something that is, uh, an epsilon approximate T design is something that is not exactly a unitary T design, but it is epsilon close to being a unitary T design. So you have an ensemble, you twirl with it, and you get some quantum channel that is close to the exact unitary T design. Now, what is the measure, the metric over here? The metric over here is the diamond norm distance. That is the maximum possible distinguishability between two quantum channels. Right. Now, just like I define an approximate design, I'll define an asymptotic defined. You take an ensemble, you twirl with it, you get a quantum channel. Okay. Instead of applying this quantum channel once, you apply it many number of times. In the limit k tends to infinity, this quantum channel becomes your hard channel. Okay, suppose equation seven is true, then you're interested in the convergence rate of this of this twirling to this hard channel. That is, for a given m, so that is the number of qubits and a given epsilon, you're interested to know what is the number of times you're supposed to compose this channel with itself to give rise to this hard channel. Uh, with the uh, epsilon approximate distance. This is an asymptote. So if, uh, so if equation seven is satisfied, you say that your epsilon is an approximate uh, T design, and uh, then you're interested in this convergence rate function. Now of interest to this work is the case where this number of copies is two and three. That is, we're interested in two designs and three designs. The Pauli group is a well-known unitary one design. The Clifford group is a well-known unitary three design. We'll be introducing the Pauli group and the Clifford group in the next slides. The Pauli group is well known. A single qubit Pauli group is generated by x and z and uh, square root of minus one times the identity. That's given in equation nine. An m copy, uh, m, uh, the m qubit Pauli Clifford group is just, you know, the m fold tensor product of the single Pauli uh, group. Okay, we will denote Pauli is by big E and big F. So this is the Pauli group. Now the Clifford group is defined in this way. What you do is, um, you consider those special unitaries in the unitary group such that when you take any Pauli, E, any Pauli, and you conjugate this Pauli by the unitary, the unitary is so that it will rotate this E to some other element, which is also a Pauli. So normally, you know, if U is arbitrary, U, E, U dagger will not be a Pauli, but you consider U to be special so that this rotation gives rise to a Pauli. Collect all such unitaries in a set these sets, this set forms a group, and this is known as the Clifford group. The Pauli is easily seen to be, the Pauli group is easily seen to be a subgroup of the Clifford group, but what's more, it's actually a normal subgroup of the Clifford group. Okay, so Paulis are contained within Clifford. Now I will define transfections. I will not spend too much time in that. Transfections are a type of Clifford, so you, you can, which you can construct using some Pauli. So if, if you take a Pauli and um, you construct this operator, UE, you find that this is, uh, this is a unitary and what's more, 
it actually is a Clifford. It has a very simple conjugation action. Okay, so we are interested in these transfections particularly. These have some interesting properties. For example, the number of transfections is n squared. Okay, transfections Pauli's, they generate the Clifford group and they also form a conjugacy class. Okay, so these two properties that they form generators of the Clifford group and they form a conscious club that will be important for us. They have been used earlier in earlier works, but I will not delve too much into that because of uh, brevity of time. One particular work that me and Minshu, she uh, looked at last year uh, was this work by, um, uh, uh, this works on approximate three designs from transfection Markov chains. So what they do is they consider the uniform ensemble of Pauli's, okay, and define a 12 uh, with respect to these Pauli's. And then they consider a uniform ensemble of what is known as the special linear subgroup of the Clifford group. Okay, so this is a subgroup of the Clifford group and they consider a uniform ensemble of that. Um, it turns out that this ensemble, when you also attach the ensemble of the Pauli's with it, it is a two design, but not a three design. Now, what do I mean by that? I'll come on the next slide. That is what you do is you consider a quantum channel where you first implement a uniform 12 by the Pauli's, okay? And then you implement this uniform 12 by this subgroup, the SL subgroup, okay? That is you acted on your input. So you see that over here, first the Pauli acts and then you have the special linear subgroup acting. The result of this, then the number of copies is equal to two. That is this T is equal to two over here is this hard channel, this T fold 12 by the hard group. On the other hand, suppose you're actually dealing with three copies of n qubit systems, okay? And you do the same action, that is you first implement Pauli's and then you implement these transfection, sorry, these, uh, the special linear subgroup, okay? Then you don't get this hard channel. So it falls short of that. There is some finite distance between the action of this channel and just, you know, the target, that is this G of H. There is some finite distance between them. So in their work, um, what they considered is you interpolate the distance between this G of SL and G of H using another quantum channel. That is this quantum channel made of, made of transfections. So how do you do that? Well, you consider uniform ensemble of all transfections. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this, and then you define a channel uh, with uh, using this uniform uh, ensemble of transfections in this fashion. Okay. So what you do is you first implement Pauli's. Okay. and um, yeah, so, so you implement the Pauli's, you implement this special linear subgroup and whatever distance remains between the HAR group and the, the HAR channel and this, whatever you've already acted upon, you, inter you try to interpolate that distance using only transvection. So you implement these transvections K times to see if you can implement, you know, the HAR channel, that is your target channel. So first and first, uh, you've realized that as K tends to infinity, you know, this limit is obtained. Okay, so you find that they actually managed to um, get to the limit. What's more, uh, what is the convergence rate? The convergence rate they discovered for the, uh, like when they did the convergence rate, the calculations, then they discovered that the convergence rate is given by this. If you are interested in obtaining an epsilon approximate um, design, okay, then what you do is you implement this G subscript, uh, you know, you implement this transvection twirl k times where k is of the order 5m plus log of one by epsilon. Okay, so this 5m is, you know, it is something that, you know, you have to do to converge. Like, you know, if, if, you, if you fall short of this 5m, then, you know, you're not going to converge at all. You'll be within some a good amount of finite distance within. The convergence really starts after you have implemented this 5m and then, you know, you want to sort of get to this epsilon approximation. Depending upon what epsilon is, you know, you have to implement it, this log of one by epsilon times. This is the work that they did in their work. Now, what we wanted to ask is, look, we know that, so their idea was that like, you know, you try to interpolate the distance between a two design and a three design using transvections. But now we noted the fact that transvections, they give rise, you know, they're generators of the Clifford group. So what we wanted to do is implement, you know, this one design using uniform ensemble of Pauli's. And uh, instead of interpolating the distance between a two design, which is implemented using, you know, the special linear group, uh, we wanted to see if you can just directly interpolate that distance using transvections. Okay, so can you just do that? Okay, if so, what is the convergence rate? 
So what we implement instead, instead of implementing the like you know GP G SL and G like you know transfections, we implement just like Pauli's and transfections. We don't implement the special linear subgroup that is you know what they have implemented over here. Okay, right. Actually, they should have read uh, GP G SL and then you have this. Okay, so there is actually one piece missing over here. Similarly, you know this G S L is missing here and G S L is missing here. So what do we find? Now I'll come to the main results. So we find that we actually implement, okay, so do we implement a two design in this way? The answer is yes, we do implement a two design. So that limit is attained. And uh, what is the convergence rate of a two design? Well, we find that um, for epsilon being greater than zero, the number of times that you have to implement, you have to sample these transfections is K, where K is just log, log of one by epsilon. Okay, so this is very decent. This is, I think, uh, which is uh, sort of fairly, this is, uh, it compares favorably with, I mean, it compares as, as the optimal rates for known for a, approximate uh, two designs. Okay, so this is how much you need to, this is generally what is expected for two designs. But then what about three designs? Well, firstly, we find that yes, it does also, if you just take transfections, uh, just implement transfections, that will also give rise to a unitary three design. Okay, but how many times do you need to implement this unitary three design? We find that the convergence rate is given by this expression over here. So instead of implementing k five m plus you know log of one by epsilon times, we find that the coefficient over here is three by two m. Sorry, this is three by two m. Okay, so this is then what we get. Now in the course of doing this, these two works, particularly in work like in for the work in unitary three designs. We also managed to give a partial decomposition of the adjoint representation of the Clifford group on three copies of n qubit systems. Okay, so to just to compare, so this work is, uh, we found it pretty hard because uh, you don't have access to uh, some of the important quantities, for instance, like the, the characters of, uh, you know, you don't actually have uh, access to, you know, the, the, what do you say, the, 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 the character theory for uh, the Clifford group for three copies of n-qubit systems. You do have them for two copies of n-qubit systems. And um, for two copies of n-qubit systems using, you know, this character theory for the Clifford group, okay, they, uh, uh, Jonas Felsen, Joel Wallman, and Stephanie Werner, in 2018, they you know gave a full decomposition of two copies of the Clifford group. But since we don't have access to that machinery, okay, it was not specified in the same work that they used, uh, we had to rely on other methods and uh, we gave just a partial decomposition of the adjoint representation of the Clifford group. Now, I'll just give a brief outline of the um, sketch of the methods. So, you know, we the, it turns out that this, this uh, GH is a projector uh, with eigenvalues plus, plus one and zero. And uh, we show that, you know, the Pauli, you know, this Pauli channel and the, the transvection channel, they commute. And what's more that, uh, the eigenspaces uh, of this, um, you know, the eigenspaces of this channel, that is the composition of the Pauli's and transvections, you know, due to the fact that transvections, they form a conjugacy class, they are, you know, invariant representations of the three copy adjoint representation of the Clifford group. So, you know, basically eigenspaces are, uh, you know, the eigenspaces are um, sub representations of the, this adjoint representation of the Clifford group. So, we then like, uh, so we had to basically firstly see that like, you know, the plus one eigenspace of this. So this guy, this channel has a plus one eigenspace. So what we need to ensure is that the plus one eigenspace of this guy and the plus one eigenspace of our target, they match. Okay. If they match, then, you know, you are sure that, uh, you know, uh, this guy will necessarily converge to this guy. Okay. What you, so if, you know, they match, if these eigenspaces match, then you are sure that, you know, convergence is guaranteed. So you get the limit. The convergence rate is decided by the second largest eigenvalue of this channel. And we found that this is approximately one by two. Okay. It is in the course of finding the eigenspace decomposition of this expression that we managed to find some uh, sub representations of the tree copy adjoint representation of the Clifford group. Right. Now I will, this is my last slide. I, I'm, I see that I'm well within time. So what would be future works that would, we would be interested in? Well, we would firstly like to um, 
Okay, so one thing that we would be interested in is like um, the decomposition of Clifford's using only single qubit and two qubit transfections. Now, transfections are a very, what you say, desirable um, set of uh, Clifford elements, okay, because, um, you know, they're easy to implement and uh, their action is, I mean, it's also their action on, you know, their conjugating action is fairly simplistic, okay. I did not go too much into length in that in this talk because there was not enough time, but their conjugating action is fairly simple. Okay, and they can be designed, they can be used like for designing Clifford circuits. Some of the previous uh, work that have been done on uh, transfections is in this direction. Another work that we would like to be doing in the future is uh, completing the decomposition of this Clifford group representation that I showed in the previous slide. And another thing that we would be interested in doing for other purposes, for instance, randomized benchmarking, etc., is obtaining, um, you know, a full decomposition of the two copy a joint representation of other important groups in quantum computation. Notably, there is a special linear subgroup of, you know, the Clifford group. So we would also be interested in that. So with that, I finished my talk and thank you for your attention. So I would be happy to take questions. Thank you, Tanmay. So we open for the questions. Any questions, comments? No? Can I ask one question? Sure, sure. 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 Please go ahead. Uh, so this is, of course, not perhaps not related to what you have done. Uh, you know, there is something called asymptotic Birkhoff's theorem. Okay. okay. So, uh, so basically, uh, if you take a unital uh, qubit channel, it can You're be right. realized as random unitary, right? Okay. Uh, now, if you go to higher dimension, um, uh, 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 there are unital channels, namely channels which takes identity to identity. It You're cannot right. be realized by random unitary. There are examples. Okay. Now, uh, the question is, uh, if I take such a channel, which is unital in higher dimension, but not random unitary. And let us take uh, several copies of that channel. Right. Uh, uh, so in the limit of large number of copies of that channel, can it be realized as random unitary? Okay, so, okay, so I, what you need to do, I mean, to answer this question is, Firstly, like, uh, so, I mean, sure. I mean, a, unit, a unital channel is a linear operator on, you know, a larger space. Okay. It is, a, right. it's a linear operator on the set of matrices, right? Now it is likely to have, I mean, assuming that it is, um, if it is unit, okay. So it is likely to have an eigen decomposition. I mean, I don't know if it, it may have some sort of non-trivial Jordan, you know, canonical form, but let's assume that it has an eigen decomposition. If the eigen decomposition, I mean, if it has a plus one eigen space it will have a plus one eigenspace because identity is sitting in the plus one eigenspace okay but apart from the identity if whatever else whatever the plus one eigenspace of this guy is if that matches the plus one eigenspace of the hard channel okay then you can be assured that you will see this limit okay that if you implement it over and over again you will definitely converge to this limit if not then you won't converge okay because the plus one eigenspaces need to match the reason for that is the eigenvalues of a quantum channel, they will be either, you know, plus one and lower than plus one or yeah. and positive. Okay. Mm -hmm. They will not be, of course, negative. They'll be either one or lower than one. If the plus one eigenspaces match, then you'll definitely see convergence. The convergence rate will be decided by the second largest eigenvalue. Yeah. So uh, actually there are some counter examples. Uh, I think it was uh, first, uh, it was given by uh, some mathematician called Hagerup. He is no more. So he and his uh, collaborators, they came up with some counter example where this asymptotic Birkhoff's theorem does not hold good. So oh, really? Should... Okay, so, uh, uh, but the question is, uh, 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 as you said that this, but this may be characterized, at least the, the unital channels for which this asymptotic Birkhoff's theorem holds good, uh, uh, perhaps it, it can be characterized, right? Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Yeah, thank okay, you very so much. Actually, the question is pretty interesting. I, if you could, we could discuss it later on perhaps as well. Yeah, okay. so you can discuss with your PhD boss later on. So this is the, you may continue yeah. as we have to move forward. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, sure. thank okay. you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. So our next speaker, uh, John T. Hans from University of Bristol. 
Chetty, are you here? Uh, yep. Uh, can you can you see and hear me? Yes. Please share your screen. Okay, there we go. This should work now. Uh, okay, and you can see my screen. Yeah. So Jantu will be talking about the weak trace and the past of a quantum particle. Yep. Okay. So. Thank you, uh, Professor Pan. Right, uh, I'm here to speak uh, about the whether the weak trace shows the past of a quantum particle. So based on some assertions made by Lev Weidman and collaborators, um, this is work that I've done with my two supervisors, John Rarity and James Ladyman. Uh, currently, the paper based on this is out review, but it's available in the archive uh, if you want to look at it afterwards. Um, so first off, uh, we're going to be going through the two state vector formalism and weak values, specifically looking at the derivation of weak values um, before applying this to Weidmann's nested interferometer, uh, where we have an outer interferometer with a separate inner interferometer along one of the arms. This gives two very different results, depending on whether you're considering it using common sense approaches to the past of a quantum particle and Weidmann's uh, weak trace based approach. Uh, we then decide to analyze what is present using some classical intuitions with some caveats um, before then showing cases where there is weak trace, but without this sort of presence. Finally, we conclude by analyzing whether the weak trace is a useful metric for the past of a quantum particle. Um, first off, I'm sure a lot of you will probably have seen this uh, given as the theoretical definition for the weak value of an operator here, OHA. Um, however, a lot of treatments I've seen just go straight in with this rather than necessarily actually showing the origin of this term, uh, which means it's easy to skip over the necessity of a perturbation. Um, so initially to, to, to take a weak value, you need an initial weak measurement to couple the system that you're considering with a probe system. So here we have a Hamiltonian allowing that coupling uh, where the, the system we're considering is here, this uh, psi i initial system. Uh, and the probe system is uh, phi of x. Uh, we assume that the probe system is a Gaussian system. This just makes it easier to consider. Um, and as you can see, when we apply the Hamiltonian, uh, we couple between the two systems with this, this weak coupling parameterized by the weak coupling constant lambda uh, to give our psi w our weakly coupled state. Um, we then apply a strong measurement. Um, this strong measurement here is effectively a post-selection, as you can see, into psi f. Um, giving identity across onto the probe system. Um, now, this does rely, or the, the taking of a, a weak value in general does rely on a first order approximation, which again is something that's not normally shown in the literature, but to me seems fairly necessary um, that effectively when you're moving between the exponentiation of an operator and just applying it linearly, um, you're given this, this higher order term in lambda. As I said, lambda is a very small coupling constant. That's why it's a weak value rather than a strong value. However, it's notable to remember that this higher order term does still exist. So we can make this approximation, but remember it is just an approximation. So taking this all together, applying our final strong measurement to our initially weak measured state, um, we're given this term here. Uh, as you can see, we get OW, the weak value, appearing where we'd expect normally if we'd strongly measured something, um, the, the eigenvalue of that strong measurement to appear. So it effectively is acting as an effective operator, identity minus I lambda, OW, PD of H, where PD is the initial distribution um, of our Gaussian um, pointer state variable, uh, our probe variable. Um, as mentioned, this, this perturbs x to x minus a. Now, a has a wide distribution of the, the values because of this very wide initially distributed Gaussian. However, if you take the average of that, the distribution will give a Gaussian centered on the real part of OW. I mean, if we were to look at the imaginary part, that would give the, the conjugate variable to OW, but we don't necessarily need to consider that. We're just looking at the, the real part of the weak value here is where this, this pointer measure goes. Now, the weird thing, and as I'm sure those of you who've seen weak values before will know, this OW can be very far from any of the eigenvalues of O. This is what led in a, in a paper back in, I want to say the, the 80s or 90s, uh, Haranov and Weidman to claim that the value, that the spin value of a spin half particle can be 100 because they were able to get a weak value of 100 for something where the eigenvalues are normally plus or minus a half. 
Um, and it's led to the belief, just based on the position in the term back here, that the weak value represents some fundamental value of the operator between measurements. Um, taking this and applying this to the path of a quantum particle, um, if the operator O is instead our spatial projection operator along a certain path, uh, and this weak value is non-zero, Weidman argued we should interpret it as the particle being on that path and leaving a weak trace along it. As you know, if it was a strong measurement, a, the spatial projection operator having a non-zero eigenvalue would say that it is present there. Um, now, a case, as I mentioned, where this can be applied to give counterintuitive effects is Weibman's nested interferometer. Um, as you can see here, uh, we, we can trace the forward and backwards paths, which is a way of applying this two-state vector formalism where we take the forward traveling path and the backwards traveling path and can interpret where we get non-zero weak values, where they overlap. And we can see that there is overlap as expected on path A of this interferometer, but there's also overlap on paths B and C, but not on D and E. This means according to this, this approach, this weak trace approach, where we're saying a non-zero weak value is the presence of a quantum particle, the quantum particle, as well as traveling on A, has jumped over path D, traveled via path B and C, and then jumped over path E again to reach detector D2, which we're post-selected on. Now, again, we can render this mathematically just to prove that this isn't just a relic of a graphical format for displaying this. If we take our forward traveling state and our backward traveling state, where we are evaluating them in terms of which paths A, B, and C they, they travel via in this nested interferometer, um, we can obtain weak values. Uh, and as you can see, the weak value for A is one, the weak value for B is a half, and the weak value for C is minus a half. They're all non-zero. So according to the weak trace approach, they're all paths the photon traveled. However, we're able to take the, the weak value across path BC uh, due to the linearity of quantum mechanics. Weidman actually specifically says that we're able to sum weak values in order to get the weak value of the sum of an operator. And taking this weak value across BC, so the weak value of whether the photon was in the inner interferometer at all, we see that has a zero weak value. This seems counterintuitive, having a non-zero weak value for each of the two paths, but a weak value for the overall interferometer they form. It was on path B and on path C, but not on path B and C. To try and resolve this and try and bring some sense back into the idea of what is present in a quantum context, we first start by looking at what classically we need for the presence of a particle at a location at a given time. Now, the first way that we can think about this is that it is only at that location at that time. It cannot be at more than one location simultaneously. Again, as we'll come to, that can be doubted in the quantum context. It's traveled to that location via a continuous path, has continuous evolution, and then travels from that location also via continuous path. We expect quantum particles and classical particles to evolve continuously. We also expect that it will interact with objects and fields local to that location based on its properties. For instance, if it is a charged particle, it will interact with other charged particles in that and fields in that location. And finally, if its location is within some region, then the particle is also in that region. So, I mean, that could be worded better. Effectively, if the particle is on path B, then it'll also be on the union of path B and path C. As I said, we have some caveats. Firstly, we're not saying that there's always some location for every time where these criteria are satisfied. Um, not nor are we saying there's always some matter of fact about where the particle is present. Again, quantum mechanics is weird. We know some properties of systems are undefined. So to say that there's always a matter of fact about where the particle is would be equivalent to effectively proposing a local hidden variable theory, which we're not necessarily doing. Here. All we're saying is these criteria must be satisfied to say a particle is present at a location at a given point. Now, condition one, as I touched on, is debatable. We expect quantum particles to be able to exist in superpositions of positions. Again, that's how we came to the definition of what the initial and final states were. They were superpositions. However, condition two seems more valid. Um, as various lecturers of mine teaching quantum mechanics used to quote verbatim repeatedly, the evolution of a superposition is simply the superposition of its evolutions. 
Um, and all these evolutions must obey special relativity. So none can include discontinuous particle trajectories. None include sort of teleportive jumping uh, of any sort or form. Um, we now look at a fifth condition we can give for a particle being present, that it leaves a weak trace at that location. This, this is the criterion effect of your condition that Weidmann is proposing. Now we note that whenever a particle satisfies condition two, that it has continuous path going to a location and continuous path from a location, it also satisfies this condition, as the forwards and backwards traveling states will always overlap. However, we can find weak trace without presence. Uh, we've, we've seen examples or can show examples where a particle has non-zero weak trace at a location, but no continuous path to or from this location. We just need to look back at that nested interferometer setup. Uh, to see an example where there's no continuous path on path D or E, but supposedly a weak trace, and so supposedly a location on path B and C. Um, we can also say that we're not entirely sure the extent to which the particle would interact with other objects and fields at that location on paths B and C, specifically because it would disturb the post-selection. By having it so that it's able to interact at path B or C, it would cause the interference on the beam splitters um, conjoining path B and C to form path E um, to be disrupted and therefore cause the photon to travel down path E. This isn't the situation we're considering. So therefore we can't necessarily say that the particle would interact with other objects and fields at that location. Finally, we've shown an example where a particle has a non-zero weak trace at a location, say B or C, but a zero weak trace at a coarse graining of that location. So the union of paths B and C. That, that, that seems to go against our ideas of what presence is. Now, point two, uh, point two here, um, could be challenged by Peleg and Weidmann's claim that quantum objects always leave ubiquitous weak traces wherever they travel, um, which has an effect on the environment. This actually was part of the motivation for coming up with the weak trace approach, that there's always going to be some decoherence into the environment. Now, this is a more valid uh, point when it comes to larger quantum objects, which are constantly absorbing and emitting thermal photons, but still to some degree applies to photons, uh, which do interact with elements of the environment, mirrors, for instance, when they're traveling. However, Ziwa et al. Uh, showed that the effect caused by an object leaving a non-zero weak trace is not necessarily the same as the effect a localized particle would cause if it were classically present or present as a trajectory. Even it's not even necessarily the same as if it were a, super, a weighted superposition. Um, it seems to leave something entirely different, um, which reinforces the idea that there is a difference between a non-zero weak trace and the presence of a quantum particle. This difference, in some cases, there can be a mathematical weak trace, but no physically detectable weak trace. In other cases, there can be some small proportion of what we're expecting to be in a weak trace. There, there's a wide variety of different things. It can be leveraged, as uh, Zeri or et al. do, uh, for aligning interferometers. But if anything, the fact it can be used to align interferometers shows it's more a relic of bad interference changing the situation from what we're actually considering to something different, rather than necessarily being a representation of a weak trace in the system we think we're looking at. Um, finally, is the weak trace useful? Now. A key motivation for the weak trace was that it provides more interpretational information about what's going on than standard quantum mechanics. I mean, this, this is something that Weidmann in the passive quantum particle claims is an issue with Wheeler's common sense approach to the passive quantum particle, saying it's entirely operational, doesn't tell us about the underlying mechanism, just the final result. Similarly, Weidmann claims the von Neumann description of a particle alone is not sufficient to explain the weak trace. Again, this is a debatable point, considering in a lot of the weak trace experiments, it can be shown that the results are derivable from Maxwell's equations if you're just taking a first order approximation. But again, it kind of gets to the point here that Weidmann was looking at the weak trace as motivated by showing something more fundamental than standard quantum mechanics. However, we're going to turn this back on support of the weak trace, that it doesn't tell us anything about the underlying system either beyond quantum mechanics. Um, now, again, another example of a reason the weak trace was postulated was to try and explain spooky quantum phenomena, again, like Wheeler's delayed choice experiment or counterfactual communication, where supposedly we have nothing crossing a channel but information traveling between two parties. However, 
Saleh et al. and Harold Alban Weidman have given protocols for counterfactual communication where there is no weak trace. Therefore, the weak trace doesn't explain this phenomenon, meaning we can have it so that there, is, there are these spooky phenomena still, even without a weak trace. The weak trace does nothing to abate this quantum spookiness. Um, while suggesting some sort of time symmetry to quantum processes by considering the initial state traveling forward and the final state traveling backwards, the weak trace approach just doesn't imply any new physics beyond quantum mechanics. It simply assumes the particle was present wherever these traces exist, which is a, is a confusing label that oversimplifies a very complex concept. What it means for a specific particle to be sequentially present at two specific places, or for a particle to be present at a location at a given time, or multiple locations at a given time. It also causes paradoxes itself, the, the jumping photon in the nested interferometer, which could far more easily be considered simply to be the photon traveling via path A, and any supposed um, patterns coming from parts B or C being due to faulty interference. In conclusion, not only does the weak trace approach give incoherent results, it also rests on the faulty assumption that weak coupling is equivalent to no coupling. And regardless of this disturbance, it, there is insufficient evidence that the non-zero weak trace of a spatial projection operator, it gives particle presence, especially when other criteria that seem valid for a particle being present aren't met. Finally, I'd like to thank my two supervisors, uh, John Rarity and James Ladyman, uh, and leave this slide up here showing some of the other work that we've been undertaking and leave my email at the bottom in case you're interested and we run out of time for questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pat. Thank you, thank you very much for finishing in time. And we're open for, uh, for questions and some comments. Okay, if not, let me ask one. So you are considering the weak trace and what happens if you uh, change your coupling? For example, if you consider the strong measurement and the strong projective measurement, for example, in the path B, path C, and maybe the together path B, what happens to that? Okay. So, uh, if you take uh, the, a, instead of trust, a weak measurement, if you take, take the strong measurement, what happens? Yeah, so that's a very good question, actually. Yeah. So if we were to take a strong measurement here in path B, as you say, uh, as we'd expect, just based on the nature of the beam splitter, um, because there wouldn't be the destructive interference coming from path C, we would expect some element of the photon, effectively 50-50, uh, half of the state that was on path B to leak through onto path E. This would be very different to the state, uh, to, to, to what Weidman is proposing here, where because of the fact that the interferometer is considered to be balanced um, when path B and path C do not have this projective measurement applied, um, it, it, it would allow effectively a leaking through. I mean, we can see this even as we go from taking that sort of full projective measurement on path B um, down to progressively weaker measurements, but still distinguishing measurements. Um, I mean, this potentially is where the uh, dis visibility distinguishability metric comes in, um, whereby the, the more you distinguish between two paths that are interfering, uh, the less the visibility of interference becomes. Uh, and so effectively, the, the less you can have um, negative interference or cancelling interference, ensuring that your beam splitter is or ensuring that your interferometer is balanced, um, considering it's designed to be balance based on beam, uh, path B and C being indistinguishable. And so anything that goes into path B and C ending up in D3, um, any, anything that disturbs this, anything that causes some distinguishability between path B and path C, of which a projector on path B is kind of the, the maximal extent of, um, would by definition cause some of the state to leak down path E. So in, in summary, uh, that you, you will not have any weak trace in such a case, right? Any trace of the particle, you cannot, you cannot make any conclusion from there, right? The which uh, it, yeah. Yes, that you wouldn't be able to make any conclusions. You'd still observe, effectively you'd observe um, as expected, uh, something coming through from path B. I mean, for instance, in weak trace experiments, you sometimes have it so the mirrors, MA, MB, MC, MD and ME are vibrating very slightly. Uh, in order to effectively allow you to uh, observe a weak trace, the, the, the vibration being your kind of initial weak coupling, and then the final post-selection being looking just at D2. Um, and yeah, if you were to apply a, a, a stronger um, projective measurement on path B, uh, a non-destructive projective measurement, obviously, yeah. um, because if it, if it was a destructive projective measurement, then you wouldn't get anything at any of the detectors because you'd be 
you know, detecting on path B itself. But if you were to put a non-destructive uh, projector measurement on path B, you would very much observe this, this wobbling from mirror MB at D2, but it wouldn't be telling you that something had jumped into B and C and then out in uh, over E into D2. It would be telling you that something went via D, B, and then E. Also, go to the next slide, I think. Just I have sure. a question. Let's say one question from Martin as well. Uh, no, yeah. next, no, next one. Yeah, next one. Yeah. So you're oh, saying that, one. yeah, this one. You're saying that uh, <clears throat> if we take the weak trace in the path, path B, weak trace in the path C, they're different. But if you take the both join path jointly, that's coming zero. So yeah. this is nothing surprising because you know the uh, the initial state. If you, if you if you think like a sequential measurements of the weak values, for example, if you start with the initial state that this electric state, this I I you take. And then you mm -hmm. measure the uh, the uh, B and B and B, I mean pi B and then pi C. So in such a case, separately, that's a different state reduction than the, if you do it a pi B plus pi C. So it's a completely different state reduction you will have. And if you postulate on that state, so you will get a different result. So it is nothing to do with the weak value or something. It is in, in, the, in the general von Neumann measurement, this is also true. So why this is surprising to you? You said um, this is surprising, yeah. You say that, I, I would say it's more down to the fact that the, the reason it seems surprising to me, or I mean, surprising is a strong word. The reason it seems interesting to me is because it effectively okay. is showing the effect that me, that applying a measurement, even a weak measurement on mm -hmm. E and C separately gives. Um, yeah. it, it's showing the, the effect of that distinguishability, even when you're weakly distinguishing between the two, as opposed to when you're not distinguishing between the two at all and yeah. therefore get no weak trace. Um, I mean, it also potentially is showing the effect of a uh, negative value uh, when it comes to a weak value or a weak trace, especially when we're expecting to see eigenvalues that are positive. For a projective operator, we're expecting to see positive eigenvalues and PC, as you can see here, is negative. Um, but yeah, to me, it's that, again, when you're interpreting it, if you interpret this, taking the, the, uh, the weak value of the presence across the entire inner interferometer, we're saying, that the particle has not traveled through that interferometer. That is the interpretation based on the weak okay. trace approach, if you're considering yes, based back that interpretation, that's problem. OK, there's another question, uh, one question from Martin. Martin, please go ahead, Martin, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I, I, maybe this is widely known, but I just wanted to ask about this post-selection, because uh, we, for example, know that in Bell scenarios, post-selection is something we should not do, because then you can get algebraic violations even in classical theory. So. How is it justified that here one can do post selections without getting results which are obviously not wrong? Uh, I mean, again, that that to be honest is another open question about um, about obtaining weak values as to whether some of these more ridiculous results you get. Again, the uh, Haranov. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, please mute. Please, please, please. Any of you? Uh, Ajit Iqbal Singh, please, please mute. Can I mute it? No. I think I think they're muted now. Uh, yeah. Again, the fact that we can get the um, value of the the spin of a spin half particle supposedly being a hundred just based on this post selection uh, again leads to to questions about whether post selection really is a, a valid procedure that we can apply here. Um, again, that's why I prefer the idea of starting from the basics of considering what we're actually meaning by presence and then comparing that to the weak trace approach. Um, but again, it's that Weidman and, well, Haranov and Weidman more broadly have proposed that weak values are saying something fundamental uh, about the value operator between measurements. Uh, yeah, and that Heisman, Heisman used to argue that this is weak value is actually the part of it's a real real value. It's nothing to I mean it's a real. I mean it is I mean the, it's only the hidden variable. There's a real values. Mm -hmm. Heisman uh, argue sometimes. But uh, what about the uh, question about the post selection? Post selection is a completely it's, it's a strong measurement procedure because you know in any 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 strong Neumann measurement also we do the same post selection. Post selection is always there. So what's the problem with the post selection? Um, Potential. Well, um, we we I guess we strongly select on a, a final state, but sure. I mean, uh, in a simple one single measurement, for example, you want to measure an observable A, you actually calculate the bond rule. This is a kind of post selection because you particular probability for a particular outcome you select. So this is a post selection is everywhere. So what's the problem um, with the post selections? Potentially, but then again, That's you're the not difference. dividing over the um, the final states uh, bracketed with the initial state though. 
Uh, and that seems to be what causes these massive magnitudes in anomalous weak values when you get an initial state and a final state that are almost orthogonal to each other. Yeah, the um, cost, cost is huge because they say almost oscillation probability will be very, very small in such a case. Hmm. Okay, yeah, we can continue you're... discussion, but we have to move forward. And thank you, Jandi, very much for your nice talk. No worries. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we move to now the final speaker of this session. And Ritojit Mojumdar. Ritojit, are you here? Yes. Yeah, please share your screen. Yeah. So Ritoji is, uh, is our own people because he is from ISI Kolkata, the organizing institute. And he'll be talking about this optimizing and such design in a QAOA for Max card. Okay, please, Ritoji. Yeah. Okay, Go is ahead. it visible? Yes, visible and audible. Yeah, everything is fine. Thank please you. start. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, all of the gave a nice introduction. I am from ISI and uh, doing my PhD. And this will be a bit more oriented towards computer science. And the work is in collaboration with my supervisor, Professor Shushmita Shulkole, and with my friend and colleagues, Deboshmita Dhiraj, Shesha, and Dinakaran. Uh, so the motivation for this work is that we have these uh, near-term quantum computers that don't have a lots of qubits, a small number of qubits. The qubits are noisy. And incorporating error correction is a bit difficult. So researchers are already looking for directions where they can actually show potential uh, quantum advantage over classical systems. And one of those directions is combinatorial optimization. And QAOA is the type of algorithm designed for studying combinatorial optimization. And it has been studied most widely for this max cut problem. I'll come into what it is. And what I'll discuss here is some possible ways to optimize the circuit of this max cut problem so that the noise is further reduced in the system. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's start with the max cut problem. So the problem is simple. It simply says that given a graph, you need to separate all the vertices into two sets, say set black and set white. But the separation should be such that the number of edges crossing from one set to another is maximized. Now, why this problem was chosen when Farhi and others studied? First is it is an NP hard problem. So there doesn't exist any polynomial time algorithm classically to solve this. Uh, but more interestingly, interestingly is that this is an APX hard problem. So what it means is that neither can you solve it unless P equal to NP, nor can you find a very good approximation of this approximate solution to this problem unless P is equal to NP. So it is not only difficult to solve, it is difficult to solve even approximately. And the best classical algorithm is this Bowman Williamson algorithm that is point uh, eight point. Uh, 0.878 and this criteria is hold and there is also a weaker uh, conjecture that says that you cannot go any better than 0.878. So the question was that can QAOA or some quantum algorithm do better? But that is not what we'll focus on because there is still no proof that quantum algorithm will do better than classical algorithm. But the idea of this QAOA or any near-term algorithms is that we separate the algorithms into a quantum part and the classical part. So we do what is required for a, in a quantum computer, otherwise we do things classically. So here what we do is that we initialize some parameters. If we have a P layer uh, algorithm, we initialize two P parameters, beta and gamma. And ideally we don't know in the starting whether each vertex should be in black or white. So they are equally likely to be in black and equally likely to be in white. So we create an equal superposition of the state. And now we define a problem Hamiltonian HP and a mixer Hamiltonian HB and create some unitary operators and evolve the state accordingly. So this is the circuit realization of the uh, problem Hamiltonian and this is the circuit realization of a mixer Hamiltonian. This is for a very simple example graph. So what happens, this is called the answers. Now the initialization state has a depth of one. This um, mixer Hamiltonian, it also has a depth of one, but this problem Hamiltonian, its realization, this C naught RZ C naught, it scales with the number of edges in the graph. So more the more dense the graph is, more it will be, uh, the more will be the depth and the more will be the number of C naught gates. So the question is, can we, reduce a few C naught gates of this. 
And why do we want to reduce? So here is one assumption that I am making. This is not a perfect assumption, but this is not really something just hand waving as well. We are considering that gate error is very important in these noisy systems. And most importantly, these C0 gate errors, because C0 are much more noisy than single qubit gates in today's quantum computers, and they will propagate. So if we have an error here, only one error here and a C0 like this, it will create two errors and things become difficult. And the other thing is some kind of thermal relaxation where if I create a state in one, it will slowly uh, just relax itself and go to the state zero. So we cannot have a very deep circuit. So these are the limitations that we have and we want to actually address those limitations. First is that can we reduce a few C0 gates? So it has two implications. If I can reduce a few C0 gates, the depth is anyway a bit lower here due to the reduction of C0 gates and the noise will definitely be uh, reduced because one C0 gate is eliminated. Now, the question is that when can we reduce such a C0 gate? We cannot just arbitrarily take away C0 gates. And when can we do this? And is there a very systematic way to do so? So let's dive into that. We will talk about three methods. And the first one is the edge coloring method. So when can we remove a C0 gate? So if it is an equal superposition, you can check that this and these circuits give the same result, only if it's an equal superposition. So in such a scenario, we can remove this C0 gate. We do not need this C0 gate. But ideally, if we just randomly create a circuit and then we cannot maybe hope that many of these uh, these RZZ rotation gates, many of them actually um, is oh, suitable to uh, remove one of the C0 gates. So we need some algorithmic uh, structure for this. So what we can do is do an edge coloring type of thing. Consider this as a example graph. We do an edge coloring. So now what we do, we take the largest color class. So here, red is the largest color class and we have the circuit, the RZZ rotations corresponding to these red edges in the first layer. So although this uh, picture doesn't really show it, but you can understand that these are actually occurring parallelly because they are on disjoint qubits. That is why edge coloring is done. And the others just do it in any order. Now, when for each of these cases, this equal superposition thing holds. So we can just simply remove the first C0 gates, right? So this is a very simple edge coloring optimization and uh, without going into too much details, if delta is the uh, maximum degree of the graph, it can be easily shown that M is the number of edges, N is the number of vertices, that this is the average number of C0 gates that can be reduced. And in, the, in a very best case scenario, up to N by two C0 gates can be reduced. So the question that we ask next is that, uh, can we do any better? So the best case scenario, n by two, can we do any better? Yes, we can do that using this depth first search method. Now let's go into this. So this is again the same example graph and uh, this is the same graph, but when I uh, actually went to um, color the edges, somehow the orientation changed in network X. So what we do in depth first search, we start from a vertex and keep going as far as we can when there is no other edges or a new vertex to discover, we trace back and continue again. So this creates a tree. So n minus one edges will be there. And suppose we started with zero and this is the depth first search tree. The colored edges belong to the DFS tree. The black edges do not belong to the DFS tree. So now we follow this ordering. So it is zero to three, three to four, four to two, Similarly, 0 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 2, and so on. So we follow this ordering of the DFS edge here, and whatever the remaining things are, we do this in any way you want. So you can also apply an edge coloring here to reduce the depth here in this portion, but that is different. So in each of these cases, we have shown that it is possible to reduce the first C0 gate for each of these cases. So from this circuit, we are down to this circuit. Now, how many C0 gates are reduced? N minus one, because there are N minus one edges in the tree, right? So we have also mathematically shown that it is not possible to reduce more than N minus one gates using any method. Any method you use, this is the optimum that we can have. So now we have a circuit which is functionally equivalent to the QAOA circuit with 
n minus one C naught gets reduced. And we just plotted the fidelity of the circuit. And this is what we get that if we uh, use, if we do not use anything, the original QAOA circuit, this is the fidelity. And if we use the edge coloring method, so at most n by two uh, number of uh, C naught gates reduced, this is the fidelity and DFS gives the best one. That is very obvious. Now we have another thing to ask ourselves that why do we want to go for another greedy algorithm for depth minimization? We already said that depth first search n minus one, it is the optimal. So the reason here is that, as you can see that I am forcing an ordering of the edges. And maybe if I didn't force this ordering, what I showed earlier, many of these edges could have been actually simultaneously operated on. But I am forcing an ordering and therefore I'm increasing the depth of the circuit in some way. So this is an example that if we just use edge coloring based optimization, three C0 gates are reduced and the depth of the circuit is nine. But here we have been able to reduce more C0 gates, but the depth of the circuit has increased. So the question is that, is it even helpful? So we showed mathematically that taking the current hardware uh, values into consideration of IBM quantum systems, we actually came up with, a, with an inequality when it is acceptable that given K C0 gates are reduced and N depth of the circuit is increased, when this is even acceptable that the error will still be reduced although the depth is increased. And we showed that this inequality is satisfied by all IBM quantum devices nowadays. And we also argued that as the devices will get better, we can only hope that the C0 error will reduce the T1 time will increase. So uh, it will keep on following this. But the question that we are asking next is that, can we kind of like have this good reduction, but not so much increase in the depth? And that is where we have this last portion. So suppose this is a circuit. So we said that we want a depth first search tree. So why a DFS tree? We can have a different spanning tree. So one can argue that we can have a breadth first search tree. So we show here, the example is that this is, a, uh, this is an example spanning tree. This is another example spanning tree. The corresponding circuit to this has a depth of 14. The corresponding circuit to this has a depth of 12. Both of them reduces the same number of C0 gates. So this one is definitely better. But th this example gives a false indication that the lower the height of the spanning tree is, the better it is. So I give an example here. So the height of this tree is three, the height of this tree is two, but still they will lead to the same circuit. Why? Because these two C0 gates cannot be done simultaneously. They have one qubit in common. So they must be done sequentially one after another. So just simply saying that reduce the height of the tree is not sufficient. So here is uh, one more example. Here I show that they are of the same height, height two, but this will have a depth of three, this will have a depth of two, because say this is in depth one and these two are done parallelly. So it is not straightforward that you just do maybe a breadth first search, have a small height tree and just do it. So we go for a cost function, heuristic cost function based approach to find the spanning tree. So what are the motivations for this? The motivation is that we say that a branching factor of a vertex is the number of other vertices found in the tree from this vertex. So it's very obvious that more is the branching factor of a vertex, the height will be smaller, but that doesn't lead to a, a low depth circuit because ultimately these all these edges will have to be performed sequentially one after another. They have a qubit in common. So we do not want a very high branching factor. The second thing is we do not want a very low branching factor because then this is the one having the lowest branching factor one. So it's just a straight line. We do not want that. So we want something in between. So branching is necessary, but where should we branch? The motivation here is that branch as close to the root as possible. Why? Because the closer you are to the root, the argument still remains that you cannot do these two simultaneously, but maybe there are some later edges and you have some probability that this edge can be done in parallel with this edge here that we couldn't do here. So taking these motivations into consideration, we have this greedy algorithm where we say that 
instead of doing a DFS, BFS, do something in between. Choose that vertex locally. This is a local greedy algorithm. So choose that vertex locally from a vertex U. Suppose from a vertex U, we have V1, V2 up to VK, many choices. We will choose that one which maximizes this cost function for that vertex. So N is the number of qubits and LU is the level. So level is simple. The level of root is zero and the more you go down, the level increases by one. So you see this value is always positive or at least at most zero, I think. So, but this value is always positive. And the more you are towards the root, the higher is this value. And similarly, we fix a branching factor B. This is prefixed what B can be. And UBF is the branching factor, current branching factor of the vertex U. So the more you are going towards the maximum branching factor, the smaller this value starts getting. And if you actually cross it, this will be minus, right? So this is the notion that we have. Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is the notion that we have. We want to have a tree for which this is maximized. Now this is a local heuristic, so it doesn't require a global optima and therefore it's a heuristic, we do not have a proof, but this algorithm will run in time order of delta n square where delta is the maximum degree. So this can actually range from n square if delta is pretty small order of one or up to n cube for a very dense graph where delta is almost order of n. So what we find here is that if we use this, there is a significant drop in the error. So this was for our traditional QAOA. This is basically uh, this one minus fidelity. So it's basically the noise in the system or the infidelity of the system. So this one grows. This is the traditional. The DFS method is slightly better. And this is so much better than the DFS method because we have N minus one CNOT reduction. And at the same time, we have been able to reduce the depth as well, or at least restricted the increase in depth. So we show for different type of graphs, but initially it seems that uh, changing the value of B, this maximum branching factor doesn't seem to have a much more much effect, but that is because we couldn't really do too much simulation of the entire thing beyond a number of qubit values. So we just uh, tested it out how um, the depth of the spanning tree will grow with increasing B. And we showed that as the number of vertices increases, choosing uh, higher value of b is bit better so this is also not very non intuitive so the advantages is that any error mitigation technique any other betterment of qaoa that has already been suggested in the literature they will all go hand in hand with this particular method that we have proposed so this is kind of a pre processing step that itself lowers the error in the system and then if you want to include further other methods most welcome it will give even better result so the limitation only is that it requires equal superposition. So this can only hold for P equal to one because beyond P equal to one, we, as we go to higher depth, the equal superposition changes and the probability distribution changes. So we are looking whether it is possible to scale this or at least modify this to scale this for higher P. So we have higher reduction in C naught gates. And this optimization technique is for max cut problem only, but it will also hold for uh, problems that clearly start with an equal superposition, but there are many other problems as well that don't start with an equal superposition. So is it possible to like straight away take this to that problem, those problems, or we need a really different method for that? Yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Atajit, for finishing in time. Yeah. And we are open for questions or comments. Is there any? Uh, there are some questions from Ajit Iqbal Singh. Can you read it? Uh, Rudeet, can you read uh, in the chat box? Yes, yes. I put my rumblings in the chat because there is a, the second one I will say first because there is idea of quantum Latin squares by Jamie Vakari of Oxford and his students Ben Musto and David Reuters. So will that be of any help? If you put that vertices at the edges are orthogonal. That is one question. Okay. And secondly, the moment he drew the graph, he took all the edges to be red. So he asked the question, if you respect the edge coloring possibility, then will it be easier? But then later he came to edge coloring by himself. 
okay yeah so the first question okay, was the edge yeah. coloring will be a technique yeah edge coloring is a technique definitely but what we had to use is some sort of approximate edge coloring because edge coloring optimal edge coloring itself is an np complete problem and we cannot have an exponential time pre processing for a polynomial time algorithm uh, for quantum latin squares i am not really i haven't read about this so i will definitely try to read about this and see if this is of any help here Uh, you type Ben Musto, Jamie Vekari, David Reuters, and their papers are in journals but available on archive also. Okay, thank you. I, I'll definitely uh, look into this quantum Latin squares. Thank you. All the best. Good talk. Thank you. Thank you. Two more questions. <clears throat> so if not. let us thank ritajit for this nice talk and also i'd like to thank the all the five speaker of this session so thank you all very much thank ah. you alok yeah hello okay. thanks hello yeah i can hear you urda please yeah. go ahead uh, maybe uh, professor singh was uh, telling something okay no no nothing 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 okay. nothing urda okay devaji alok did a good job at this very late uh, evening yeah. uh so let us co uh, conclude today's program yeah. uh, tomorrow we will start possibly at 11 sure ha uh, 11 11 okay uh, professor usha devi will speak first okay, okay. who has to chair ajan ajan ah tabish tabish kureshi tabish okay i will start that thing with tabish okay okay, okay. Okay. okay so let's okay. see you tomorrow everyone ah see you tomorrow okay, okay. thank you all of okay yeah. okay bye <clears throat>